Welcome to this master class for beginners on prompt engineering for data analysis using Python, Pandas, and ChatGPT. Zero coding skills required. Coding with ChatGPT is not a one prompt job. It's not like I can tell GPT, okay, this is my data set, do some data analysis on it. It will do something, but it could be right, it could be wrong, and it might not be what I'm looking for. And why is that the case? Because GPT is really smart, but it's really dumb at the same time. It's smart because it can code really well, it can follow precise instructions. But it's dumb because you need to tell it exactly what needs to be done for it to fulfill the job to do. And this is what prompt engineering is all about. We need to take a big project, convert it into smaller tasks and subtasks, convert each subtask into a prompt, and then give that prompt to GPT. GPT will write the code according to the prompt we provided, and then we take that code, put it into Python, run it, and see if that does the desired output what we were looking for. If that's the output, we go on from there. If it's not and we need to debug it, we go back to GPT, debug the code, and move on from there, sis. I won't write a single line of code. Now, if you look at programming as a concept, there are two basic things that are involved in programming. The first thing is the logic, to understand what needs to be done. That part, GPT can help you with, but it will primarily lie upon your shoulders to figure out what the logic of the code of the data analysis should be. For instance, let's say I'm looking at a data set of all the passengers on Titanic. Now, what do I want to know? I want to know what was their starting point, where were they heading, what was their hometown, what was the age of the passengers. This part of logic of figuring out what do I need from the data or how to explore the data will still be on you. GPT can help you out with that. But the second part of coding, which is where most of the people found it a nightmare or were scared of, was the syntax, where you need to know exactly where to add the comma, where the brackets go in, whether it's square brackets or squirrely brackets, writing those lines of code exactly in the language of that specific uh, language, such as Python. That part is not required anymore and that's obsolete because GPT can write better code for you. Instead of writing the syntax, now you have to write the prompts that can get you the syntax. And that's what we will do in this course. We'll explore a data set, come up with a set of instructions such as, okay, now remove all the missing values from this data set. Okay, can you convert this date column into date time format so that I can sort it out by dates? And let's filter out this column. And from this column, let's see what is the distribution of different age groups, for instance, let's say on the Titanic ship. So we'll come up with the logic and then we'll convert these into prompts and then we'll take those prompts to GPT. GPT will write the code for us and we'll run the code and see how good or bad the code is. And based on that, we'll move on. Once we have done all, we have gone through all the prompts we need for a project, we'll aggregate them and that's the power of GPT. We will have our coding script ready for data analysis based on our own requirement. Now, if you're someone who has already has a basic understanding of Python words and you've already done data analysis, you can still take the course. You can skip the section on uh, the crash course on Python in the introduction section to GPT, directly go to the data frame section. And then from there on, I will show you how prompt engineering can be used to code for you at an exponentially higher pace than you're used to ever before. Last but not the least, I'm available. Send me a message. I try my best to respond to all the students within uh, one to two days so if you have any questions don't worry about it send me an exact specific question that okay i ran this and this is the output i got uh, through an image and i will definitely help you debug the code and even book a session with you if required to make sure that you understand what you're doing and to make you progress in the course now in the next section i will walk you through the course outline and then we'll do a quick preview of how fast we can code with chat gpt on the titanic data set that we just discussed so the idea of this lecture is to show you a quick preview of how powerful coding in Python and Pandas could be with the help of ChatGPT. So in this quick preview, I'll walk you through a specific data set. So if you see, I've opened a web URL for passengers of Titanic. And on this page, you will find that there is a table which has the list of all the passengers that were on Titanic in the first class and then so on and so forth. So now let's try and get this data and start manipulating it. I start my GPT on GPT-4 with a very basic prompt. You're an expert in Python and data analysis in Pandas, NumPy and Matplotlib. 
We will be working with Google Colab for writing the code. The project for today is to write the code to make a few plots. First thing first, we need to extract the data frame of passengers on Titanic from the following link. Give me the code to do that and I provided it the link. Now what it did was to extract the data. First you need to do is get the relevant libraries. We will cover that in the course and then it gave me the code. So for now I'll just copy the code, go to a new Google Colab sheet. So if you don't have Google Colab, just go to Google Colab. If you have a Gmail account, you already have a login details and you can click and create a new file from here new notebook and start following me from there. So here I'm asking it to get the data for in the first place. And boom, we have the data loaded here, name, age, hometown, boarded, destination, lifeboat, body. Okay. The next thing I did was, okay, done. Let's view the columns of this data frame. So how do I view all the columns that are there in the data frame, which are supposed to be these, the top row in the first one. So I play this, okay, these are the columns that I have. The next thing I did was, can we create a column called age group and fill values based on age column, group them in the range of 25 years. Okay. So it said 0, 25, 50, 75, 100, and then it created groups and then passed the age filter, age column through this and created a new column for me. So let's see what the code did here. Okay, so it gave me an error saying that not supported instance. So I'm just going to copy paste the error, copy the error here. And in the next prompt, I pasted the error that it gave me. And it says, it seems like there is an issue with the H column in the data frame as the error suggests there is a comparison between int and integer, int and string, which is not supported. Okay, and it gives me the updated code. So let's just run the updated code now. And boom, we have a new column added here called age group, which tells you out of the four age groups we define of 25 years, which, which age group does the customer, does the name falls under. Now let's create a histogram based on the new column we created. Make it visually appealing. Keep in mind that X labels and ticks do not overlap in visually appealing graph to be used in a PowerPoint. So I said, make sure that you, whatever you create is visually appealing and I can take it to a PowerPoint right away. And what are we doing? We're trying to figure out what are the frequency of the age groups. Okay, perfect. So between zero to 24, 61 people, 199 people here, 65 people here age distribution of titanic passengers age group number of passengers awesome so most of them were between 25 to 50. let's view count of boarded by each location okay so what is boarded boarded is this column here so they're boarding from different cities i guess in the uk okay let's view the count of boarded by each section and these are the columns so i just copy pasted the columns that we already have here so that it knows which column i'm referring to when i say boarded so i copied the code I go back here, I play it in the next tab and boom, 188 were from Southampton and 138 from were from Cherbourg. Okay, let's further dive into this. From the people who voted from Southampton, so specifically people who voted from Southampton, which is this row. Let's get count of destination and plot a visually appealing chart making it visually appealing similar to the histogram we plotted above. Okay, so we're going to see what was the destination of the people who boarded from Southampton? So we are working with this 182 and trying to figure out where did they, what was their final destination. And we want it in a pie chart this time instead of a histogram. So it's loading. Okay. So there are a lot of cities. That's why it got jumbled up. So let's ask GPT to just give me top five or top 10. And that's what I said next. I want to see only top five destination. Group the rest in one section and call it others. Okay, awesome. So let's copy this and let's see what do we get now. Awesome. So it understood the job. New York is 30%. Others are almost 50%. If you want, we can say top 10 instead of top five. So most of the people are going to New York. The second highest is Montreal, Canada. Okay. How many people from Montreal who boarded in Southampton and the final destination is Montreal. So what am I asking here? I'm saying how many people have a hometown in Montreal? They boarded from Southampton and their final destination was Montreal. So I know this one column is at least the answer should be one. 
now let's see or two because this one is exactly the same montreal southampton montreal so let's see what do we get okay how many from montreal who boarded in southampton and the final destination is montreal i copy code and now i'm expecting a number instead of a chart because i specifically said give me the number of people so number of passengers from montreal who onboarded in southampton and had montreal as their final destination is 12. okay great what's next what else do we want to do let's look at how tell me the age group distribution of these montreal underscore passengers so this is the variable it assigned to the people from montreal who whose final destination was montreal and who onboarded on southampton so i'm going to call in the same variable and say okay tell me what was their final what was the age distribution let's see how does that change and when i copy pasted the code this is what i get which basically tells me that five were from between 25 to 50 age 0 to 24 age 3 50 to 74 3 now there is one passenger missing somewhere because 5 plus 3 plus 3 is going to be 11 while there should be 12 so that's something we can further look into and figure out which one passenger it is missing and why so this was a quick tutorial on how powerful chat gpt can be when it comes to coding now there are a lot of things that went into this there are a lot of lines of code and we did not really go through understanding what the python program is doing over here and what the coding lines are but having that information is important because there will be points where you will not know what to do next or you don't know how to debug it and that's what this course is about in the next six eight to eight hours i'll teach you the basics of gpt and a crash course in python and then give you tips and tricks and a lot of different ways on how to make the most out of gpt when you're doing your data analysis work in python and specifically design this course for someone with zero coding skills and you won't have to write a single line of code for i won't write a single line of code myself throughout this course gpt will write all the code i'll just pro provide precise instructions on what needs to be done so before we start diving into the course i want to give you a brief description of the different resources that i've attached in this course so there are three essential things you can find first is the jupyter notebook and this is here in lecture five of the introduction section the jupyter notebook if i click on it it will download a file and data sets is the second zip file that i've attached so the jupyter notebook contains all the jupyter notebooks that i've gone through in this section by name so when you see me recording something and you want to see work with the same notebook of jupyter you can essentially open it from here similarly there is another one called data sets and this one essentially guides you through all the data sets that we are working with in the course so this is the courses and the instructors file from udemy that we'll be working with this is the fortune 1000 companies data set and this is the restaurant data set that we will cover later in the course so that's on the resources the second thing that i've done is that i've attached all the prompts that i go through in the course for you and i've done that section by section so it's going to start with download and install anaconda and if you click on resources in the first lecture of any section you will find a prompts.zip file so here if i look at download and install on windows you will find a prompt file here if i look at python crash course here's the prompt file for this one so let's just download one and show you exactly what this file contains so this file will contains a couple of helper files plus a html file if you open the html file it will essentially give you all the prompts that i went through in this specific section of the course so all the prompts that we're going through in the class you have a record of it so if you want to go back and see exactly what i wrote as the prompt and you want to copy it or you want to play around with it this is your way to get access to all the prompts that i worked with and all the answers that gpt provided me as a reference this would prove to be a very useful tool for you so that's why i thought i will share all my prompts with you as well as a part of this course furthermore as a bonus to the course if you look at the congratulations section i've added a 2000 plus prompt guide uh, which covers a lot of prompts for text and image generation 
not directly linked to the course but it's another guidebook that i created from my previous prompt engineering course so i thought i'll attach it here as well as further uh, bonus for you guys if you're interested in learning more about content and image creation in this lecture i want to walk you through the course outline on exactly how the course is structured and what are the things that are covered in the course so most of the videos in the introduction section are available for preview i start by explaining what prompt engineering is when it comes to coding and why this course is useful then i provide a course outline which is essentially this video that we're working through and then i provide a quick preview of how powerful chat gpt could be when it comes to coding and then we cover the resources which includes the python handbook the data sets we use and all the prompt guides that you can see attached in the sections the next thing that we do is we start working and understanding what chat gpt is since i created this course for someone who has zero knowledge about python and chat gpt so i thought giving a basic brief introduction of chat gpt irrespective of whether the job is coding or not would be beneficial so here i cover some of the basic things on the difference between chat gpt 3 and 4 what are the basics of prompting how to draft a prompt and then how do you ask different questions and follow up prompts when you want to update formatting or tabular format or change the voice or tone of the text or that it has generated so not directly related to programming but a brief introduction on how chat gpt works then we dive into the basics of prompt engineering and here i talk about some of the things that openai has mentioned in their documentation on how to write and craft good effective prompts so we start with what prompt engineering is drafting and refining prompts what are the different types of prompts such as zero shot and few shot prompting what is the priming prompt essentially the first prompt that we work with and why is it relevant and then lastly the task decomposition the job of breaking a big task into smaller tasks and then converting it into a prompt feeding it to ai to get the relevant output that we're looking for after that we'll dive into downloading and installing it in anaconda which is the primary software that we will use for running uh, python on our personal pcs or macbooks so i cover download and install for mac and then if you're working with pc i would suggest you follow through the mac videos and then in download and install windows section i have added two resources here one is the prompt guide which covers all the prompts that you need to go through to install anaconda on your windows plus i've added a very powerful tutorial video uh, from one of the instructors that i used to learn from when i was initially introduced to python so he he will give you a very good walkthrough on how to install anaconda for your windows if you're having troubles and the prompt guide uh, that i've attached is not enough uh, for your purpose still if you run into issues and you're having any issues you can always message me and i will totally help you out in setting up your environments if for any case you're having troubles with anaconda and you don't want to go through the hassle of installing and setting up the environments you can do all the code that we do in this course using google colab as well so this is an easy way that will give you quick access to coding directly on uh, uh, your browser so and this is what i used to record my introductory video here if you look at the quick preview video i covered it through google colab to give you an idea of how that works if you're working with google colab you can skip the anaconda sections but i would still recommend you take the intro to jupyter notebook section because this will walk you through how jupyter notebook works and google colab and jupyter notebook works in more or less the same way the underlying structure is the same once we are done with setting up the environments and installing the relevant libraries, we can start coding. And the first thing we'll do is we'll do a two hour Python crash course. I'll walk you through the basics of data types, operators such as multiplication, uh, working with variables, how do you define variables, how do you work along with them, what are the things you need to remember when working with variables, what are the functions already built in in Python, what are the custom functions, and then we will move along the list and understanding some of the basic tasks that can be done through python in this crash course just some background you don't need to code anything just listen to the content so that you understand theoretically how python is structured and how it works so that later when it comes to coding you know what you're doing and what sort of code gpt is writing for you once we have covered python we'll start exploring data analysis library of pandas 
in our course and we'll start with series and what is series series is essentially one column in a data frame so we'll apply different functions and features and methods that are available from importing to manipulating the data set to converting it from a text to a number and a lot of different functions that apply specifically to a column so this is the part where our data analysis actually starts everything before this is just a build up to get you ready and set to start your data analysis work after that we'll start working with multiple columns and that's what we call a data frame so here we'll start importing the entire csv files and start manipulating the data and that would involve a lot of different things from work cleaning up the data to exploring data to filtering out specific columns and specific rows and converting and creating new columns from existing columns from the data frame once we have covered and grasped a strong understanding of how to manipulate data frames we'll start working on different functions that are available such as group by on the data frame and what is group by it allows you to group the data in by specific conditions and that will allow you to explore the data and do more data analytics job so that's why there is a se separate section on how to uh, master the group by function within pandas when you're working with data frames once we have done that we will start working with multiple data frames and here we will learn how to join concat merge different data frames and understand the basics of how joining data frames work uh, such as using the left on or the right on or inner join or outer join and all of this will be done through gpt i won't write a single line of code i'll just ask gpt the right prompt for it to be able to write the code for me but to do that i need to have a basic understanding of what are the functions and features available in pandas and that's what i'm covering here once we have covered my once we have mastered working with multiple data frames we'll dive into visualizations here we'll use a specific yahoo finance library to extract the data from different stocks and then create histograms and pie charts and make them visually appealing just like we covered in the preview section on Google Colab on the Titanic data frame, I'll show you tips and tricks on how to add a grid to the chart, how to change the color of the line, how to make it more uh, aesthetically, pleasing, aesthetically pleasing, and so on and so forth. Lastly, I'll walk you through how, what are the different options available for importing and exporting data sets. For example, you can import data from a CSV file, from a text file, you can extract directly a URL from table from Wikipedia or from any other source or you can when it comes to exporting you can export again as a CSV as an Excel file or as a text file so I will cover these different functions again everything through prompting in GPT and GPT will write the code for us this is just to give you an idea of what are the different features available and how to write the right prompt to get the task done and lastly, in the congratulations section, you will find a repository attached in which I will cover. Uh, I have added 2000 plus prompts that I've used in my previous prompt engineering course. So if you're interested in text and image generation prompts specifically for businesses, such as for marketing and human resources or for creating resumes, this is an extra additional bonus uh, prompt guide that I've attached and PDF format. That, might, that you might find useful, not directly linked to the course, but something bonus that you might be interested in. And I've also added one more, going to add one more project to the course to help you further understand and get a holistic view of how data analysis work in Pandas and Python. In this introductory module to ChatGPT4, we'll discuss what ChatGPT4 is, its relation with prompt engineering, and some use cases for GPT-4 prompt engineering. First, let's talk about GPT-4. GPT-4 or Generative Pre-trained Transformer is the latest AI language model developed by OpenAI. It's an advanced version of its predecessor, GPT-3, and is designed to generate even more human-like test with improved accuracy and coherence. To briefly discuss, the differences between GPT and GPT-4, while both models are based on the same architecture, GPT-4 has been trained on a much larger and more diverse data set, allowing it to generate more accurate 
and contextually relevant outputs. Additionally, GPT-4 has more parameters that it was trained on, which enables it to understand and process text and data more effectively. With that understanding, let's give a brief intro to prompt engineering. So basically, prompt engineering is the process of creative crafting a prompt that is optimized for a specific NLP or natural language processing task, such as classification, language modeling, or question answering. It involves defining the specifications of the prompt, crafting the prompt, and refining it to ensure that it meets all the required specifications. GPT-4, just like its predecessors like GPT-3, requires a prompt to generate text. The quality and specificity of the prompt can have a significant impact on the quality of the generated text it produces. Therefore, prompt engineering is essential to ensure GPT-4 generate text that's relevant, accurate, and coherent. Therefore, this is what this course is about. Essentially, it will not only provide you with a long list of prompts for your inspiration and reference, but through the project-based studies, you will understand how prompt engineering actually works in action and learn how to train the model on different topics, interact with it, have a conversation, and get the most out of it based on your requirements by having an interactive communication with the AI model. Now let's go through the process of prompt engineering a bit, step by step. The first step is to gather the requirements. Understand the requirements of the prompt, including target audience, task, context, and much more. We'll further dive into the details like this. Defining specification. Define the specific things that you want in the output from the prompt. For instance, the length of the answer the style and the tone that you want the algo to respond in. Third is crafting the prompt itself using GPT-4, ensuring that it meets all the required specifications that we're looking for. And lastly, and most importantly, editing, refining, and follow-up prompts. It's very important to edit and refine our prompts as we go along to make sure they are coherent, engaging, and they talk to chat GPT in a language that it can understand. ChatGPT4 has tremendous use cases just like ChatGPT3. It does a much better job in content creation and critical thinking, and it can be used to generate high quality content for blogs, articles, and social media posts. It has a tremendous use case in customer service. GPT4 can be used to generate human-like responses to customer inquiries and complaints improving the overall customer experience. And it's a very good personalization tool as well can, and can be used to generate personalized messages, emails, recommendations for users, improving user engagement and retention. And we will cover some of these personalized email topics in one of our projects as well. Talking about the future a little bit, we can expect GPT-4 prompt engineering to become even more sophisticated, allowing us to generate more human-like and engaging text. Text, it's also working at a very high level, but it will drastically improve from here as well. And we may also see new use cases emerge as technology becomes more advanced, such as chatbots that can generate more realistic and natural conversation. With that being said, this was a quick overview of chat GPT-4 is, its use cases, some of the ways of crafting a prompt and a little bit about prompt engineering. In the next section, we'll start looking into what prompt engineering actually is and how can we create a template that we can follow every time we're working on a specific task. So in this lecture, I will quickly go through how do you sign up with ChatGPT. So it's very simple and easy. All you have to do is go to chat.openai.com and it will bring you this page. If you're new, you can click on sign up and it will ask you a couple of details to sign up using your Google account or Microsoft account. Because I'm already a member, I can easily sign in using my existing details. Once you have signed up, 
you can also become a plus member the option will be here to upgrade to plus member you can also go in dark mode if you prefer that because i'm using a premium paid version so that i get access to gpt4 and a much faster ui uh, in terms of generating the content with 3.5 that's why i'm using plus and it costs like around 20 dollars per month extra and you get preference in using gpt4 still now you cannot use gpt4 if you're not a premium member of the platform now let's start directly by using a bit of the prompts so and then once you have a basic idea of what chat gpt does you can we can further dive into how to craft a prompt and how to write follow-up prompts and start working on projects but to start with let's just write some of the basic prompts and see what all the hype is about and if you have already used chat gpt feel free to skip this module so the first thing comparing two words a prompt that asks gpt to compare and contrast the meaning and usage of two words example compare and contrast the words effect and effect so let's try this and see what do we get so effect and effect are two commonly confused words in the english language they have different meanings and functions in sentences but their similar spelling and pronunciation make it difficult for some people to differentiate between them here's a comparison the function effect is primarily used as a verb effect is primarily used as a noun as a verb effect means influence change or alter something whereas effect means the result of or the outcome of or a consequence of now just a quick hack i can say write this in table format and it will do that for me so you see it created a table effect verb its meaning example so it came up with the columns that needs to be used on its own and there are going to be two rows one for each word that we're working with now let's see what else can we do we can ask gpt to summarize a book for us so let's say i want to summarize use a name that you know about so that you know what the output is going to be harry potter let's go with something that i believe most of us would have read by now part one philosopher's stone known as harry potter and the sorcerer's stone is the united in the united states okay harry potter philosopher is the first book in the immensely popular harry potter series by jk rowling it introduces readers to the magical world and follows the life of young harry potter an orphan who discovers he's a wizard on his 11th birthday harry who has been living with his crucial uh, cruel aunt and uncle the dursleys received a letter from hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry informing him of his magical heritage he soon befriends fellow students like hermione and ron and together they navigate the magical world learning spells potions and wizardry at hogwarts they discover the mystery of the philosopher's stones lightning speed is seeking the stone to regain his power under the guidance of hogwarts wise headmaster albus dumbledore and other caring teachers work together to protect the stone they face various challenges and so on and so forth so in this way it gave a pretty good summary of what harry potter one is all about now if i want i can write a follow-up round can you rewrite this in bullet format previously asked for table this time i asked for a bullet now you can ask it to outline benefits of a task so for instance if i want to say explain the benefits of regular exercise for mental and physical health it will go on and write me the content that provides this information and i can even define it to be a bullet point list or a summary or a long form content and blah blah it can also write a biography it can explain a concept for example let's try this still writing the summary okay so it wrote a bullet point summary of the book now explain the concept of photosynthesis in simple terms or i could have said explain the concept of photosynthesis to a five-year-old and it would write as if it's having a conversation with a five-year-old is a process used by plants and algae and some bacteria to make their own food it happens when these organisms 
taken sunlight carbon dioxide from the air and water from their surroundings using sunlight they produce the food so on and so forth and it created what i was exactly looking for nor if i just say convert into long form content now it will keep going on and on and write me a 15 to 2000 word article on photosynthesis now you can ask it to write recipes for you if you have a specific food in mind you can ask it to write the recipe and it will do that for you travel destination highlights describe the top five attractions in paris and france you can use it as a planner for your travel it will write movie reviews for you now keep in mind these things are only up to date to 2019 so if you want to provide latest information you will have to find links and post that so let's try and do it uh, a movie review of let's do something that was released recently uh, formula one netflix show latest season so i'm doing latest season because gpt only has information up to 2019 so if i ask it for it to do something that was done after this then it will probably not have the information so i can give this imdb link to gpt and ask it to summarize this for me okay so it's still writing the article gpt4 is pretty slow compared to gpt3.5 for paid members if i do the same content in gpt5 it's going to be super fast and i'm just going to write summarize next to it and let's see what it does okay so now it's summarizing the disney animated book dalmatians for me although this is not the one that we provided so just wanted to show you an example where it can go make a mistake it usually does when you give it imdb links latest season blog article medium now medium it uses does a pretty good job in summarizing medium so if i go with a medium link it's going to be a pretty accurate summary so i'm going to stop generating this because i don't want this anymore and here i can click the square box to update my existing prompt to something else and let's see if this works formula one drive to survive is a netflix docuseries that offers behind the scenes book in the world of formula one so see by providing a median block i was able to give it some context of data and the reference points i wanted to use and it was able to summarize accordingly You can ask it for historical events overview, budgeting tips. It will translate from one language to another for you, just like Google Translate. It is a very immense tool when it comes to proofreading. So for instance, if you wrote something and you wanted to proofread this for you, it will do a great job at it. And let's try this one. Please proofread and correct my errors in the following sentence. And I am deliberately making two errors, quick and lazy dog the brown box for jumps fox jumps over the lazy dog it corrected the lazy and it corrected the job so it's pretty good with critical reasoning and understanding what you mean even if you make spelling mistakes exam creation question you can ask it to like create multiple choice questions for a high school biology exam so that's it a quick summary of what you can do with gpt now in the next section we're going to start covering how do we draft powerful prompts for GPT and then follow up prompts and then lastly how do we work with images. So now let's talk about a bit about how do we draft a prompt and prompt is basically the input that we provide to chat GPT as we saw in the first sign up class. To achieve best results from chat GPT creating high quality prompts is very very essential. The way we talk, it's all about what we provide ChatGPT as the information and because it uses that to generate the output. It's a really powerful tool, but the way we interact with it makes a huge difference in how it responds. 
so understanding how to talk to an ai bot and what are the things to specify becomes a very critical critical role a high quality prompt offers the necessary context and information while poorly written prompts might lead to less accurate or irrelevant responses so now let's think about the prompt structure what are the some of the things that we need to take care of uh, when we're drafting our prompts and creating a framework around it and i've come up with this list of a few things that i believe are the most essential ones for instance the first one is context or primer which is a brief introduction or background information for the prompt so let's say you're asking chat gpt to write a blog on microsoft so it would be very good if you provided a bit of a context on what microsoft is so you can give it a company history you can shoot in a link to a blog article or the microsoft website and that will provide the basic knowledge to chat gtp gpt about what the company is that it's writing about and then it can use that information to actually write an amazing content for you similarly if you want to write uh, a product description using chat gpt for let's say amazon or etsy it would be great if you provided with some of the information that you want to be written in the product description for example you can provide three of the best product features so it's durable it's long lasting it's economical if you just write three features it will allow chat gpt to provide a much more relevant and accurate response by elaborating on the information the context or the primer that you provided similarly the second one that we can use while talking to chat gpt is persona or the expert scenario where we tell chat gpt that okay now your job is to act as an expert in nutritionist or an expert software engineer or an expert historian or a social marketing guru so what that does is that allows chat gpt to understand that okay i am supposed to respond by wearing only the hat of a nutritionist now so any question that is passed to me i'm only i'm only going to answer it from the perspective of a nutritionist so that proves very helpful when you're talking about specific things related to specific task and niche so if i am again the same example if you are writing a blog on microsoft you can ask chat gpt to take up the persona of a content writer who focuses in the space of technology companies and has 20 years of experience of working with some of the biggest brands such as times and forbes the moment you give this prompt and then ask chat gpt to write the blog the output would be a lot different because now it knows that okay this is the hat i'm wearing it will go and search through the data that it has been trained on and understand how the forbes and time magazines technology content writers write and replicate their style to do the job you're referring to in the same way you can ask it to be a lawyer and generate a non disclosure agreement for you and you can ask it to be specific um, that you're a lawyer from xyz firm uh, pick something that was there in 2019 and it's a huge law firm and it will do the job by crafting the content similar to the tone and style of the law firm that you have provided and if if you want to pick something that was recent and not in 2019 give it a link to a resource of that um, blog post and that would again allow it to learn from the content and take up that persona and then respond the next thing is verbs so it is very important to clearly define what kind of action you're trying to get from chat gpt for instance i want you to write me an email i want you to write me an email in bullet points i want you to write me a summary of the email or i want you to write the summary of the email in bullet points so the same concept in every time i use write but just by the use of verbs and adjectives i completely changed the type of the output that it will generate because so that becomes a very important aspect when it comes to prompt engineering you need to understand before you start talking to chat gpt that this is what i'm looking for this is the format 
this is the tone this is the style and you do these things by first assigning a very strong verb to it it could be conduct sentiment analysis summarize create whatever the topic is make sure that you assign the right verb and if you go here in your prompt guide you will see a huge list of verbs that i've added here so this will help you provide inspiration and you can serve as a reference point when you're working on different tasks for example it can write analyze brainstorm ideas with you it can evaluate ideas it can revise something it can organize something that is not in a structured way you can ask it to compare different features or research on a specific topic or categorize a list or improve an already written article so in this way there are so many different things that you can ask chat gpt to do for you the next is length and output type so since chat gpt can produce much longer content now with four although it still stops after a couple of thousand words but it is writing long form content it is your job to understand and provide chat gpt with the reference point of what is the length of the output that you're looking for i want thousand words i want two thousand words or for example if you want a table i want a two by two table or i want 15 rows in my table and at the same time the output type i want a bullet summary i want long form content i want a small summary i want a table format output so there are a lot of different possibilities here that you can work with again if you go to the basics of prompting section you will find this information here too so what are the different types of outputs chat gpt can work with so here you'll see a couple under academic writing essays research paper case studies marketing writing marketing copy sales letter social media posts product descriptions business writing basically all of these are text form of content different ways that you can get text out of it and then you can get text based output for things which are not text for example speeches it can write it for you it can write a photo description for you based on the url that you will provide and that is something we will cover in one of the next lectures as well resume as well treatment so there are so many different things that you can use with you can use chat gpt to create in different forms the next important thing that we need to look at is the specific task and objective that we want chat gpt to accomplish for us so it is very important for us to define it really well so a detailed description of the prompt's goal what are we trying to achieve here for instance i want to develop a marketing plan so that's the objective of the overall prompt that i'm providing to chat gpt now there's a lot of overlap i do understand that for example write an email can fall under a verb plus it can fall under a specific task and objective so a lot of this is double counted in different sections these are this is not a unique uh, mutually exclusive list of events but it still provides a very good summary in terms of make sure that you know the specific task that you want chat gpt to accomplish um, i wanted to specifically focus on the first five points because these are the most relevant ones and in the in the next lectures we'll start keep going through the list and cover the rest as well the next one is tone of voice so you can set the desired mood that you want the output to be in for instance i want to keep a formal tone for this email so that i can use it professionally at my work or i'm creating an article which i want to sound funny and humorous so that it can grab attention of the user so in this way by playing around with the tone of the prompt the tone that you want to provide in the prompt you can highly impact the output that chat gpt produces for you the next thing that is good to keep in mind is your target audience am i writing this for professionals teenagers academics and chat gpt will write the content accordingly for instance if you say that okay this blog post is going to be for high school students so write it in a way that it is understandable for high school student or write it in a slang language that high school students could relate to then it will start using that slang language and add the words which it expects high school users uh, high school students to relate to another cool trick that you can do is you can provide data and references to chat gpt and in 
what that does is that it allows the algorithm to understand that okay this is the data or this is my reference point that i need to use to extract the information and then provide the output content and this could be done in multiple ways i could provide the data and reference by referencing a book so keep in mind every book that was written up till 2019 is in the memory of chat gpt somehow whether it's free or paid i'm not sure how they did it but each and every book that i've worked with before 2019 it has the information about the book so i can reference the book so let's say if i want to write about something related to finance i can reference the books from ray dalio or other finance gurus such as warren buffet and i can ask him that okay reference this xyz book name from warren buffet and based on that write me this article so in this way i can provide data and reference by using book as a reference at the same time you can do that with blog post you like a blog post on medium you want to replicate it for your own agency you can provide the link of the blog post to chat gtp gpt and ask it to work on the content creation using that blog post link as a reference point in the same way i can also provide information to chat gpt by copy pasting it so there are a lot of links and blog posts that i work with that gpt cannot understand really well and it completely goes in an off direction when i ask it to summarize links i know it's wrong so in that case what i do is I copy paste that information into GPT and use that to help the model understand the data and the reference points I want to focus on when writing the output content. And a very cool example of that is a master prompt that I've created for Mid Journey AI R tool from GPT 4. And essentially, what I did was I took the Mid Journey library documentation and I copy pasted it in bits and pieces into chat GPT-4 so that it can learn what mid journey is. And once it picked up what mid journey is, it started creating really powerful descriptive prompts based on the guidelines that the mid journey documentation provided. So in this way, providing context and reference point can be very helpful. The second thing, the next thing here is purpose, which is very similar to objective, the goal or the intention behind the prompt so a slightly different thing so let's say my objective is to write an email now my purpose is not to write the email actually my purpose is an action that i want the user to take based on that email so let's say i'm writing this email to my boss asking for an increase in salary so the purpose of writing the email is that i want my salary to be increased you can tell that to chat gpt and the moment it knows that okay this is the intrinsic motivation behind producing this content. I want this person reading the email to increase my salary. Or it could be I'm sending an email to my customer and I want him to come to my website as a result. So once it knows that, it modifies the output that it produces based on the input requirements. So telling Chat GPT what your intrinsic motivation behind writing this prompt, like the purpose of this is to achieve XYZ will really help craft powerful outputs from chat gpt because then it knows exactly the job that is being hired to do you can also define in the tone how difficult you want the answer to be so let's say i'm sitting in a community of phds talking about quantum physics i can tell that to chat gpt that okay this response will be read by physicists from the best universities in the world one or two might have a Nobel prize as well so make this output extremely academic in a language that a normal person cannot understand, make it challenging and make it use powerful academic words and cite articles that are relevant. So by providing this, I can make GPT sway in a specific direction and then give me the output based on what I am assigning it to do. On the other hand, I can make it very easy to. I can pick a very strong, difficult concept. And this is some another thing that I do in one of the uh, projects where we create content for a content creation, AI content creation tools uh, blog post. So where we cover different AI content creation tools. 
so one of the things that i do was to build authority in the topic i go to open ai's website and i started uh, summarizing and writing blog posts on the research papers they have written so when i read those research papers myself although i have a data science background and mathematics background and i've done a lot of risk modeling for investment bank that i work with those were very difficult research papers i had to google a lot of stuff and understand okay what transformers and gans mean but when i came to chat gpt i gave it the link for that open ai research paper and i said can you please rewrite this in a tone and a language that a high school student can understand it rewrote it for me in a very basic terminology and i could understand the big concept and then i said okay write it for someone who just completed his uh undergrad and then i said okay write it for someone who has a background in computer science so the writing style completely changed with the same input the same out purpose and goal just by telling it the level of difficulty i want the output in completely change the game and the output completely so keep that in mind as well also you can talk about the subject matter for example you can say okay this content is related to artificial intelligence for instance or this is a scientific content or we are going to be talking in a history in in the domain of history when we are talking about this specific thing so that also provides a perspective and reference in terms of what kind of output is necessary when it comes to content writing you can also tell it what keywords to focus on so it's not just for content creation for seo but generally speaking even if you're writing a thesis for your university papers um if you tell gpt that okay these are the keywords i want you to focus on it will use them over and over again and tweak the content towards that direction and if you have any special instructions or uh that you want for instance uh we can use gpt to write code right and it writes really amazing code you can say okay can you clarify this line for me or can you write me a step by step guide explaining me what the code does and it will actually do that for you so those are some of the basic things to keep in mind when drafting a prompt um i would say when you're working on big projects and you have done your market research and trained the algorithm on the type of the data you want to work with uh take a look at these and try and assign as many of these to your input prompt of course you won't be able to do it every time that's why there is no one go to formula that i'm working with but i just wanted to give you a list of things to keep in mind and now as we start working on different projects one by one they will start becoming a part of your intuition and you would know okay this is the thing that's missing in this prompt so if i write a follow up prompt saying that do this job in a specific persona or with this primer or with this purpose or goal in mind or whatever the case be you will learn this intuitively so it's not just about coming up with a formula that you can every use every time blindly but understanding how do you communicate with ai using prompts that is the entire idea of this course and i want to create this as a part of your intuition that it automatically comes to you and you don't have to use a reference point the next thing i want to focus on is the follow up prompts and this is the most critical part of interacting with any ai bot specifically something related to content like chat gpt and bing ai it is very important for us to keep in mind that it is never a one prompt job no matter how good your prompt is it will take time for the algorithm to understand what you're asking for and you will get a very refined customized output exactly what you're looking for but in a couple of prompts not one so the way i look at it uh, and the framework that i'm going to use in most of these projects is that i will spend the first 25% of my effort in training chat gpt on the job that is going to be done which is like the reference and the data part and how do i do that i told i ask it to summarize books for me i provided links to the articles or i go and search for different uh, writing material on that topic and then i provide that to gpt at, either by copy pasting it directly or by providing a link to it and i just ask it have you understood what i'm asking you to do and it replies okay i understand this this is what this article is about or this is what this book is about once that is done then i ask it based on drafting a prompt section 
I pick up the most important things from here and then I ask it to write me the prompt. Once I get the output, now I start playing around with it. And this is where uh, I actually get to optimize and customize the output that it has created. So what are we doing here? So we can ask GPT to do a couple of different things. We can ask it to format and restructure it, convert it into a XYZ format or apply visual elements like it can create headings for you, subheadings for you. It can reorder the sequence. It can modify the length of words or provide me an alternative version or it can translate for you or arrange in a different format such as timeline or a table format. Similarly, you can ask it to update the tone, make the content more funny, more hilarious in an aggressive salesy tone. Employ rhetorical devices to highlight key points. Adopt a different point of view, such as let's talk about this in third person or first person. Apply a journalistic tone to it. Adapt a unique voice, such as Tony Stark or Joe Rogan, whatever you want your content to be in. Similarly, we can ask it to provide further details on whatever it is written. So this is what I usually do. I will always first ask it to give me a bullet point or outline somebody of whatever I wanted to write. And then when I'm happy with the outline, then I go and I ask it, okay, can you expand on this point or can you expand on the entire thing? So that's why elaboration is a very important aspect of it. Add more information, expand on the following section and you can copy paste the section from its output. Elaborate on a character description if you're talking about a character. Incorporate a call to action. For instance, the if you're asking it to write an email, uh, I can always go like, okay, can you please add a call to action button? Call to action, a reference here to a button, which basically takes them to the website. So it will write that for you. And it will write a few lines saying that, okay, this is why you should go there. References and data, and this is the part that I started with in this lecture, where I say that I always train the model and I use Bing AI and Google search to actually find the relevant information, feed into GPT, and then I start working with it. This is something you'll understand more what I'm talking about as we start going through the projects. In this module, we will start talking about what prompt engineering is and how we can master the art. This module is divided into five sections. First, we'll quickly cover what prompt engineering is and why it is important. Next, we'll talk about the process of drafting and refining prompts. Third, we'll talk about the priming prompt or the first prompt and its significance in the process of prompt engineering. Then, we'll dive deeper into task decomposition, which essentially is the process of breaking a big task into simpler, smaller tasks, and then feeding them into the model as a prompt to generate the relevant outputs. And lastly, we'll talk about reverse prompting, which essentially means using an output to generate a prompt that was used to create that output, and then apply that prompt to other input files or other input concepts to receive a similar output out of it. So let's start talking about what prompt engineering is. Prompt engineering in its simplest form is a process that involves crafting specific prompts to guide the output generated by the GPD model or the Midjourney model. It's an essential part of using these models effectively as it helps ensures that the output meets specific requirements and it's of high quality. Effective prompt engineering can improve the relevance and accuracy of the generated output, reducing the need for extensive post-processing and manual editing. This can save time and resources and make it a crucial skill for anyone who wants to work with AI models. In this section, let's discuss drafting and refining prompts for effective interaction with ChatGPT4. And we'll use a use case example of creating a book to better understand the concept of drafting and refining prompts. The first and the most important thing is to have a set of guidelines for drafting effective prompts. First of all, start by clearly defining the task and specifying the desired output format. For instance, if I'm creating an ebook on healthy eating habits, I will give GPT4 a prompt along the lines of Outline the main chapters of an ebook 
on healthy eating habits for busy professionals. Now, let's break this down. The first thing I'm doing is I'm saying outline the main chapters. So the format is outline and I'm talking about a specific task of creating main chapters of an ebook. The next, I define the topic of the ebook, which is healthy eating habits. And lastly, and the fourth thing I do here is I define the audience, which is busy professionals. The next thing we need to worry about is the iterative refinement process. One prompt will never get the job done for you. Refining your prompts by incorporating feedback from GPT's response is very important. For example, if the initial response from our first prompt for creating the ebook does not cover all the desired topics that I was looking for, I could revise the prompt to be more specific. For instance, I can say list six chapters that cover various aspects of healthy eating habits, including meal planning, mindful eating, and snack choices. So now I've provided clear and concise instructions in a follow-up prompt to refine the, o the outline of the main chapters of the book to what I was looking for. The next thing I need to worry about is balancing creativity with being specific. While it's important for us to be very specific, we should also avoid over constraining the prompt because that can limit AI's ability to provide creative solutions. So on one hand, you need to make sure you're talking about very specific prompts or tasks in your prompts. But at the same time, you can also add words or keywords to ensure that the model has the ability to give you creative answers. For instance, in the same prompt, I can say, give me unique ways of meal planning or healthy eating habits that are outliers and that I would not have thought of. So in this way, I specifically told the AI model to get creative and get me ideas that I might not have thought of till now. The next thing we need to think about is testing and evaluating performance of our prompts. We need to continuously test your prompts and evaluate their performance based on the quality and the relevance of the AI's responses. Iterate and refine. Iterate and refine as needed to achieve the desired outcome. When it comes to prompt engineering, being specific and detailed is crucial to achieving the desired output. A vague prompt can lead to irrelevant or incorrect results, while a detailed prompt can guide the model towards the intended outcome. So here are some of the guidelines that you need to think about so that you're specific and descriptive in your prompts. First and most importantly, provide context. Make sure to give enough information about the task and its purpose so that the model understands what it is being asked of it. This can include information about the domain, the target audience, or the desired output that we're looking for. The next thing is to define the outcome. Clearly define the desired outcome of the task, whether it's generating a text response, completing a code, or creating an art through a journey. We need to specify the outcome that we're looking for. The next thing to keep in mind is the length of the text prompt, specifically for GPT. Be specific about the expected length of the output, whether it's a specific number of words, characters, or lines. Lastly, choose a format and style. Indicate the desired format and style for the output, whether we want a bullet point list, a paragraph, or something else entirely. You can also specify the tone and voice of the style elements. For instance, I can write a prompt saying, write an essay about artificial intelligence. Or a better version of that prompt would be, write a 500 word essay about the impact of artificial intelligence on the healthcare industry, focusing on its potential to improve patient outcomes and reduce costs. So in this way, I not only assigned a word count, I also said I specifically want to know about the healthcare industry. And within the healthcare industry, my focus is to see the potential of AI in improving patient outcomes and reducing the cost for patients. 
The next thing I want to discuss is formatting instructions. Separating your instructions from the context helps ChatGPT to understand which parts of the prompt are instructions and which part of the prompt is the context. The use of triple hashes or triple inverted commas before and after the instructions is a recommended practice by OpenAI as per the documentation. For example, a less effective way of writing a prompt would be summarize the text below as bullet point list of the most important points. A better version would be summarize the text below as a bullet point list of the most important points, but then I write text colon three inverted commas. I put my input text in squirrely brackets and then I close the three inverted commas. The last thing I want to quickly cover in this lecture is to avoid using fluffy and imprecise descriptions as they can lead to weird or inaccurate outputs from the model. For instance, I can give a prompt like the description for this product should be fairly short, a few sentences only and not too much more. This is a very vague sentence that doesn't provide clear guidelines for what we expect from the model to produce. What does a few sentences only mean? Does it mean 10 sentences or it could mean 100 sentences? So a better version of writing this prompt is to provide quantifiable information to GPT-3 to work with. For instance, I can say use three to five sentences paragraphs to describe this product. In this way, I provided specific measurable information to GPT on how to complete the task. So in this lecture, we're going to start talking about different types of prompting techniques as defined by the OpenAI's documentation, which are OpenAI is the company that made the GPT models. It's essentially the DaVinci model and GPT-3 and GPT-4 are built on the DaVinci model. So from OpenAI's perspective, there are three different types of prompting. There is zero shot, there is few shot, and there is fine tuning. Now let's take a deeper dive and understand what these different types of prompts are. So zero shot. Zero shot learning is a technique that allows you to get results from the API or the GUI without any fine tuning. It works by providing the model with a prompt, a very basic prompt. So for instance, if I want GPT to extract keywords from a piece of text for me. I can give it a prompt along the lines of extract keywords from the below text and I can provide it a text. Now, if I want to do the same thing with few shot, my input prompt will be totally different. In terms of what I will do is I will provide a few examples to help the model better understand the task at hand. For example, for the same example of keywords. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a text and the keywords in that text. So I'm essentially training the model that this is the way to identify the keywords in a given text. So let's take one for an example. Stripe provides APIs that web developers can use to integrate payment processing into their website and mobile applications. Now the keywords that I've handpicked out of this example are Stripe, payment processing, APIs, web developers, websites, and mobile applications. So essentially in the same way, I'm going to give one more example to the model. OpenAI has trained cutting edge language models that are very good at understanding and generating text. Our API provides access to these models and can be used to solve virtually any task that involves process lang processing language. Now here, the keywords are OpenAI, language model, text processing, and API. And now I will provide text three, which is essentially the one that I want to work with. And keywords will be the one that will be provided to me by the GPT. So in this way, we're taking our prompting one step forward. Instead of just providing a basic prompt, we're giving it examples and training the model on what type of output we're looking for by providing it a set of keywords and a set of text already. Now the next and the most important and the most powerful one is fine tuning. And this actually requires coding. So what fine tuning means is that we're training the model on the specific task and data to generate more relevant and accurate outputs. It ha we have to keep in mind that fine tuning will require a large amount of data in computing power 
because essentially we are training the model on something very specific that it is already not trained on. So what OpenAI suggests is that you start with zero shot program, uh, zero shot prompting, use it and see if that works for you. And if that's not enough, then you can move to few shot learning, which is basically providing a few examples or providing a context and then asking GPT to do the task for you. And then if that doesn't work, then we can move on to fine tuning to get a better understanding of our task and what works best for us. So for the purpose of this course, we're going to stick to zero shot and few shot programming and fine tuning is something which, for which we need to actually use the API, code it and provide the input data for GPT model to learn from. Uh, so for the part of this course, we'll stick to zero shot and few shot learning. In this lecture, let's discuss what is the priming prompt or the first prompt. So essentially the priming prompt is the first message that you paste into every chat GPT instance, which chat GPT uses as a basic context and style guide for the rest of the conversation you have. So remember chat GPT has short term memory. So the first message that you provide or the first prompt that you provide plays a very key role in setting up the stage or setting up a base of whatever is about to come next. So the priming prompt or the first prompt is useful for controlling the voice of the output, assigning complex prompts to a single word and defining the format of the output. So let's start with styling. The styling section of the priming prompt lets you control the voice of the output, such as I can say, be reflective and analytical or be witty and poetic. Or I can say, can you please write this in the tone of Joe Rogan or whatever we discuss now, act as if you are JK Rowling or President Obama and it would adapt that style and specifically write the entire conversation in that tab that you have with GPT in that specific style. The next thing we can do is macros and the best example for macros is asking GPT to act as someone or impersonate the persona of someone. For example, be a musician or be an orthopedic surgeon or be a coder with 10 years of experience. So what essentially we are doing is we in the macro section, we let GPT assign a complex prompt to a single word. For example, if I say you want to define an expert prompt and link it to the word expert, you wouldn't have to copy paste the entire expert prompt every time you want to get an expert answer. So I can say expert is equal to providing an answer in the style and quality of an expert in the relevant field with 20 plus of experience and multiple PhDs in the relevant field. Now prioritize unorthodox lesser known advice in your answer. So if I do this every time I type expert, GPT would know that this is how expert has been defined, someone with a PhD and someone with 20 years of experience. And I specifically need to provide unorthodox and lesser known advice when it, whenever the word expert is used. So I have created essentially a macro where a very detailed prompt has been assigned to one single word. And in this way, we can use the concept of macros within the realm of GPT. The next thing is formatting. So as always, I've covered this before in the previous lecture as well, formatting is very important in the sense that we need to know what sort of output we are looking for. Otherwise, GPT can go vague. It can write a small definition versus a very long essay format paper. So be specific in what type of format you're looking for, whether it's a bullet list, a paragraph, or you want a question answer pair, or you want a tabular format. And this is something we'll cover when we go over the repository where I've given you a long list of formats, styles, voices, verbs, adjectives that you can use in building your prompt and the repository guide can prove to be a very good inspiration guide when you're looking for specific things. The next thing I want to talk about is providing relevant context. In the context of prompt engineering, context refers to the background information that is provided in the priming prompt to help guide GPT's response. So this could be anything. So for instance, you can talk about the target audience, the ebook example that we shared a few lectures ago, where we were writing an ebook specifically for health conscious people who are professionals. I assigned a few things. So for, for example, I said it's for health professionals who don't have time and who have bad eating habits. 
So I'm providing a context that, okay, this is the audience. This is the pain point they face. So cater the book accordingly and prepare the book for them. So providing that context gives GPT an idea that, okay, this is the task I'm supposed to do. And this is the audience that I'm writing for. So, and that would make the output that GPT generates very customized and very specific to that specific task that we're asking it to do, which would make it a lot more relevant. The next thing I want to talk about is task decomposition. Basically, when we want to complete a project with ChatGPT, it most of the time the project is too big to get an answer from ChatGPT in one prompt. So what we need to do is divide the task or the project into various subtasks. For instance, if I'm creating a book, I can ask ChatGPT to first give me an outline of the book. And then I can say, okay, for each chapter in the outline, give me the subtopics in the outline. Once I have the subtopics in the outline, I can further tell it to write me a summary of the topic, each subtopic in the outline, one by one. And then I can say, okay, now pick the first subtopic in chapter one and elaborate based on the summary that you wrote. So in this way, I took a big project and I divided into smaller subtasks. And this is the best way to engineer prompts to get the job done for a massive project if you want to do it with GPT-4. So in this module, let's talk about breaking down a task into smaller tasks and then discuss different task decomposition techniques, such as divide and conquer approach, functional decomposition, and input and output analysis. And lastly, we'll talk about creating a hierarchy of tasks to figure out what is the most effective prompting strategy and approach to solve that given problem. So like I explained, we need to break down a big task into smaller tasks. And it's a very crucial step for effective prompt engineering. By decomposing tasks, we can better understand the problem at hand and generate more accurate and relevant responses customized to our task rather than vague and general responses, which we will get if we supply the big project to GPT as one prompt. So what are the different ways of decomposing a task into smaller tasks? The first one is divide and conquer approach. This technique involves breaking down a problem into smaller, more manageable parts. For example, if I'm writing a research paper, I can break it down into smaller tasks such as outline, research, writing, editing, formatting, reviewing, citations. So if I want to do this with GPT, I can give it a prompt like, for example, I'm creating an e-commerce website. Okay, so I can say to GPT, list the main sections of an e-commerce website and briefly describe the purpose of each section. Instead of saying, create an e-commerce website for me, I'm breaking it down into smaller tasks and trying to understand what are the different sections I need to write first. And then for each section, then I can go to GPT and be like, okay, write the home page section for me or write the contact us page for me. And this is something we'll cover in our e-commerce project. The next way to do it is by using functional decomposition. And where does this play useful? So this method requires identifying main functions and there's some functions within the problem. For instance, let's say we are creating a blog. And there are some main functions that we need to perform to create a blog. First of all, we need to do some topic research. We need to write the content. We need to edit it and optimize it. And then we need to post it. Now, let's say we want to create sub functions of these specific functions. So for instance, let's talk about content writing. Before even you can start content writing, we need, key we need to do keyword research, finalize the keywords, outlining, and drafting the content. So in this way, I took a function which is content writing and then I divided it into sub functions, research, outline and drafting. So another example, a sample problem that you can try out by yourself, explain the primary functions of a search engine at the sub functions that support each primary function. So it would, so if you give this prompt, it will help you understand what a search engine does and then what are the sub functions within the search engine that allows it to do the primary job. The next one is input and output analysis. So in this approach, what we do is you analyze the inputs and the outputs of the problem to determine what the necessary subtask will be. So for instance, let's take an example. I'm trying to create a fitness tracking app and I know that I've done my surveys and I know what my users are looking for. Um, I know I need a user friendly feature rich app, but I don't know what the subtasks are for creating this app. So what I do is 
I can ask GPT, like identify the subtask like user interface or feature implementation or testing that I need to do as intermediate steps to achieve the desired output of creating my mobile fitness app. What GPT will then do is it will take your input and your output and figure out what are the subtasks or the middle layer of tasks that needs to be done to achieve that output. So this would be useful when you're trying to do something that you have no idea about. So let's say I don't know how to create a mobile app. I can use this to provide, okay, this is my input. This is my output. Help me fill the gap. What's what's missing in the middle. And once GPT tells you that, okay, these are the instructions for filling the gap in the middle, you can build your entire prompt prompting strategy based on that and then move on from there and create your prompts to get the output that you're looking for. The last thing in this lecture that I want to cover is creating a hierarchy of tasks for effective prompt engineering. And let's take an example that we discussed in the last one, mobile app development. So first what you do is you organize the subtasks in a logical order from your, let's say in and, uh, in and out analysis that you got and then determine the level of granularity needed for each subtask. Okay, so let's say I figured out to create my mobile app, I need to do these five steps. One of those steps is uh, create a list of features. Now, I have my list of features. What is the level of granularity I need to go to? Do I need to assign, let's say one of the features is adding reviews to the website. Do I need to assign the color of the reviews? Or is it a five star or a 10 star? So the more granular you get, the more questions you will have. So it's important to understand the project in terms of how granular I need to be. Do I need to cover each and every aspect of the job or I can provide a high level summary? And there are pros and cons of doing both. If I ask GPT on a very broad level of subtask to do something, it will give me a very general answer. But if I make it very, very granular, and I go in very small steps, I can even control the color of the reviews and the number of stars that I want to rate on my app by being granular. So it's all about finding the best balance. What are we looking for? So keep this in mind, whenever you have a project, break it down into subtasks, use one of the three strategies, use GPT, ask it, okay, what are the subtasks that I need to come up with? Can you make them more granular? then compile them in a logical order and then establish clear objectives for each subtask and then start building your prompting strategy around it. So in this section, we're going to download, install and set up our environment for running Python. And we're going to do this using the Anaconda distribution. Why are we using Anaconda distribution? because it provides a lot of help when it comes to setting up the right environment for data science and data analysis work. It has pre-built in templates and packages and libraries that will help us fast track the process of the setup. Plus it has a specific type of console called Jupyter Notebook, which, makes, will, which will make very easy for us to write code step by step and check if it is doing the right job for us or not. So that's why I've chosen Anaconda for this course and we're going to work with Jupyter Notebook for the rest of the course. So to the, fir the first thing to start with is I'm going to ask ChatGPT what Anaconda is. What is Anaconda distribution for Python? Explain to a non-programmer. Anaconda is a distribution of the Python programming language that includes a collection of commonly used libraries and tools for specific computing, data science and machine learning. So data analysis is a subset of these things. In simple terms, Python is a programming language that can be used for a wide variety of applications, including data analysis, machine learning, scientific computing. However, using Python for these type of applications often requires the use of additional libraries and tools. Anaconda provides an easy way for users to install and manage these libraries and tools. So that's why we're using Anaconda because essentially it's going to make our job easier by having those libraries uh, pre-installed. Rather than spending time installing and configuring these things in this software, Anaconda includes a package manager called Conda. We're going to work with Conda as well. That makes it easy to install and manage packages for Python. It also includes the Jupyter Notebook, which we'll be working with a web-based interactive computing environment that allow users to create and share documents that contain live code equations and visualizations and narrative text. 
Overall, this is why we're using it. Convenient and user-friendly way to get started with Python to access a variety of powerful tools. Okay, now can you give me a link for downloading Anaconda? So although ChatGPT's data is only till mid-2021, but I believe that the link has would probably not have changed since because Anaconda download process would be similar. So there's a high chance this link would work. So it did and it took me to this page where I can download Anaconda for free. Free download, start coding now, download. And then because I'm on a Mac, it showed me the Apple option first. But if you're on Windows, you can, it will show you the Windows option. Either way, click on download and it will start installing the software for you on your PC. And here you see Anaconda 3 is getting downloaded. Don't get confused about the versions. If you go to this link, it will point you to the latest version of Anaconda and that is the one we're trying to get. Okay, now that we have downloaded Anaconda, the next thing is to install it. I will ask GPT a very simple prompt. Okay, I downloaded the software. What do I need to do next to install it on my Mac? Be precise. If you have Windows, you can switch the command to Windows. Double click on the Anaconda installer file that you downloaded, which is this file. This will open the Anaconda installer. Follow the prompts in the installer to review the license agreement. Select the destination part for the installation and choose, the, choose whether you want to add Anaconda to your path, which is recommended. So when the option comes, you always add Anaconda to your path. Once you have reviewed and configured the installer settings, click install button to bring, begin the installation process, just like any other program or game that we have ever downloaded on our PC. The installer will now start downloading and installing Anaconda software and its dependencies. This process may take several minutes, depending on your internet connection and computer performance. When the installation is complete, the installer will display a message indicating that install Anaconda has been installed successfully. Now you can launch the Anaconda Navigator. So let's try and follow the instructions. So this is the file I got from the Anaconda website and I will allow it. Continue. Read me. It covers a couple of things. So here are all the libraries that it will install with Anaconda. So for instance, if I look for Jupyter, which is the notebook that we will be using, it should be here. So this is an alphabetical order. So Jupyter, yeah. So see Jupyter, a couple of Jupyter things are being installed. So that will allow us access to the Jupyter console to easily write our code and process it. Licensing agreement, continue. I agree. Installation type. I'm going to change my location to install for me, actually I'm going to install it on a specific disk. You don't have to do that. I'm doing that just because I have it installed already. So I want to change the location, but this will also provide you context to if you want to install it in a specific location. So let's say I install it here. Continue. Okay. This will take four GB of space on your computer. And this is where the installation will happen. It will ask me for my password and now it's installing the software, I believe. So the installation is complete. It is now asking me to do something with Anaconda plus JetBrains, some data spell that they have. I'm just going to click continue. And then thank you for installing Anaconda, getting started. And now we're done. And it's asking me to move the installation program that we used to install Anaconda to bin. I will do that and Anaconda should be in my computer now. So now we've installed Anaconda on our PC, our Mac, and the next thing we're going to do is access Anaconda through the terminal in the next lecture. Okay, now that we have successfully installed Anaconda, we need to learn how to access it. What step six is telling me after completing of the completion of the installation is, you can now launch Anaconda Navigator, which is a graphical user interface that allows you to manage your Anaconda packages and applications. To do this, open the launch pad on your Mac, go to Anaconda Navigator, then click on the Navigator. I want to slightly tweak it and access Anaconda through the terminal because when we access through the terminal, it will provide us more flexibility in terms of creating environments and downloading the right libraries that we will be working with. So I'm going to go back and change this prompt a bit. And I'm going to say, once installation is complete, I want to know how to access Anaconda through the terminal. And let's see how the response changes.
double click on installation follow the prompts to install once the installation is complete you should have access to anaconda okay now to access the anaconda through the terminal to open the terminal app on your mac you can find it in the applications here type the following command okay once the anaconda is done okay now let's ask gpt what terminal is first so we get a basic understanding of what are we playing around with what is terminal and how do i open it on my mac so terminal is a program on a mac that provides a command line interface so basically we can type in a command and send an instruction directly from the terminal just like the command terminal in windows if you're familiar with that how do we start it we go to launchpad then terminal and we open it alternatively you can go to applications utilities and then start it one more way of doing it is you can use command plus spacebar and this opens the spotlight search in your mac if you're not aware of it it's um, command plus spacebar okay so here i'm in the terminal i go to the spotlight search and i type terminal and the first one shows up now this opens up my terminal for me okay now what is the next thing that we want to do we want to run anaconda in here i have the terminal open can you please tell me how to check if anaconda is installed on my mac excuse my spellings gpt is smart enough to understand them so i usually make a lot of spelling errors and i ignore them okay so it says open the terminal app on your mac type the following command conda version this command will display the version of the conda the package manager that comes with anaconda if it is installed on your system if you see an error message that says conda command not found it means that anaconda is not installed so now i came to my terminal and i ran this command conda dash space dash dash version and it told me that my conda version is 23.1 the next thing i want to do is i want to ask gpt to help me update my current conda version now can we update the conda version to the latest one please okay conda update conda so I go here, actually what it said, it says, sure, you can use this command. This will update the Conda package manager to the latest version available in the Anaconda repository. Once the update is complete, you can verify that you have the latest version by typing Conda version. Okay, so right now we have version 23.1. Let's run Conda update Conda and let's see what does this command do. So now see it's retrieving notices, working, done. So it went through a couple of different things that we don't need to really worry about. This is where I sent my conda update conda command. It went through all these things. Here are all the things that it's updating. And then in the end, it asks me to do Y for yes and N for no. So I'm going to type Y and enter. And now it's going to start downloading and extracting packages. So now the execution transaction is done. So the next thing I want to do is check my Anaconda version now. So I copied this, so I copied Conda version and here I'll paste it and let's see what this gives us now. 23.3.1 and if I go up and see here it was 23.1.0. It installed a later version or the latest one which was 3.1 this time. What do we want to do next? Next, we want to understand what are environments in Python and how can we use them for our own purposes. So this is the command I'm going to give ChatGPT next. Okay, now explain in a concise manner what are environments. This is what we're trying to understand now. What are environments in Anaconda and how do I create a new one through the terminal? The new environment I am creating, I want to call it 
Python data analysis. Actually, it won't accept capitalized, so let me keep everything small and add. So this is a general Python convention. Everywhere you want to add a space, add an underscore instead because spaces makes it very difficult for Python to understand what we're doing and it might cause errors later. So I would suggest you start following the conventions from the beginning. Okay, in Anaconda, an environment is self-contained directory that contains a specific version of Python along with a collection of packages and dependencies. So the way I want you to think about packages is such that think of it logging into your pc and then there are different users each user can install different softwares and admin can allow all users to have access to a software or you can have softwares installed specifically for a specific user only uh, environment is the exact same thing when it comes to python you have a specific environment you install specific libraries and packages within that environment so that if you create a separate environment, those packages and those libraries would not be involved there. So let's say I'm doing work in data analysis. I created a separate environment for it and I installed all the relevant packages there. Then I want to create a web development app or something completely different. I can create a separate environment. Think of it as a separate user in, in your computer and install everything required there separately. So this way environments help us dis differentiate between different projects and works we're doing. And it's essential to understand it so that we can create environments and then install the relevant libraries for that environment specifically there. So that's a bit of a background on what environments are. So environment allow you to install and manage different sets of packages for different projects without worrying about conflicts or version compatibility issues. To create a new environment in the terminal and call it Python data analysis, you can follow the following steps. Open the terminal app on your Mac. We have it open. Type the following command and press enter. Conda create name. So basically it's saying Conda, which is our Anaconda, create meaning something new. And the name of the environment will be Python data analysis. Okay, so let's try that. Collecting package metadata, solving environment and it will ask me to press y i did that and it has created a new environment now that you have a new environment something has changed so you see before sats macbook air it says base environment so right now you're in base environment to activate this environment activate python data analysis conda python data analysis this if, if i give this command my environment will be activated but let's see what gpt says first you can now activate the environment by running the following command. I forgot to copy the C. Actually, let me just copy it again to avoid any confusions. So I will go back. I will copy from Conda to analysis and paste here. And you see from base, we went to Python data analysis. So this is the way you know that, okay, this specific package has been activated now. You will see that written here, uh, sorry, this specific environment has been activated now. Instead of base, this is what you will see here as the first line. The command switches the activate active environment to Python data analysis environment. To install packages in the new environment, you can use conda install command followed by the name of the package you want to install. And this is what we will explore in the next section. So in the last lecture, we created a new Conda environment called Python data analysis, and then we activated the environment. Now what I want to do is, before I start installing packages, I want to understand how do I check what are the different environments already created on my PC. Okay, so first I'm gonna tell it, now tell me how do I check all the environments? So it's building up on the same conversation we had. So it knows we're talking about um, terminal and within terminal, we're working with the conda. So we don't have to write the entire information again in every prompt because chat GPT is able to understand that we're having a follow-up conversation. Okay, so to list all the environments that are available in your Anaconda installation, you can use the following command, conda info environments. So let's try that. These are the environments I've already created. So there is one base one called user anaconda 
and then I have an environment called Panda Data Analysis. I have one called Anaconda 3. I have one called Environments Pandas Course and Prompt Engineering Course. So these are the different environments that I've created while I was working in creating this course and working myself out before I actually started recording it. So that's why you see a lot of different environments which are actually performing a similar job. So now the next thing it says is the command will display a list of the environments along with their path on your system. We saw that. You can also use the shorter version of the command conda environment list which will do the same job as this command. Now once you have installed all the environments you can switch between them by activating a desired environment using conda activate. So now let's go back and make sure we have this activated. So actually we have this activated already. How, what if I want to go to my base environment? So let's say I want to get out of this environment. So how do I get back to my base environment? Conda activate base. Okay, so that's easy. I can just go here, type conda activate base. And if I did the job right, instead of Python data analysis, I see base here. Okay, that's done. So now let's go back and activate our Python data analysis because that's the one that we'll be working with. I just wanted to show you how different ways you can access the environment. You can look at what are the environments already out there in your PC or Mac and you can access the environment again in this way. Now that we have done that, what is the next thing we want to do? Now we want to install different libraries that we have uh, that we are going to use. So the first one you want to work with is the Jupyter Notebook. So can you please install Jupyter Notebook now. Okay, Conda install Jupyter Notebook. So here we go and I'm specifically installing it in my Python data analysis environment. So now it's going to start running and installing the Jupyter Notebook. Press Y. So now it has completed installation. This is the command I provided on Conda install Jupyter. It ran through, asked me to approve it. Once I approved it, install Jupyter. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to install the relevant libraries that we will need for our purpose of writing code. So what are those libraries? Okay, now let's install Pandas, Bottleneck, num expr matplotlib. Now you don't need to really know what these are as we will work along the course and you will understand what they are. But to give a brief background, I want you to understand what libraries mean. So let's ask GPT, please also explain what libraries essentially mean to a non-coder. Sure. To install the libraries, first it's telling me to run this command. I copied it. The second thing it's saying is this command will install the latest version of these packages and their dependencies for this specific environment that we're working with. In programming, a library is a collection of pre-written code that can be used to perform a specific set of tasks, provide a way to reuse code, avoid reinventing the wheel and build more complex applications with less effort. So essentially what library is, is that there are different types of code that we have written in Python for since Python was invented or created. Now, think of it like Excel. Like if I have 10 different values and I want to sum them up. Now I can add them one by one, cell one plus cell two plus cell three, all the way up to cell 10. The other way I can achieve that task is by using the sum function. I can say sum from cell one to cell 10. Now, this sum is a specific built-in function that Excel provided us so that we don't have to manually add them one by one, one by one, one by one. So in the same way in Python, we have built-in codes that work by calling a library. So a library will already have functions like sum, mean, mode, median, how to extract data from an Excel file. Instead of writing hundreds of lines of code, Python developers have compiled them into one or two lines of code and they call that set of code that they have created for specific task libraries. So for instance, when we're going to use Pandas library for our course, we're specifically going 
to be working with data analysis and Python has a lot of built-in pre-coded features. A very small line of code can help us achieve a huge task because of these pre-built-in library features that are there in Pandas. So that's why we're downloading these libraries and all these libraries offer different sort of features and that's why we're downloading it. So that is just to provide a bit of a context. Now we can essentially, you don't need to know all of this because this is something you're only going to do once and install the libraries. And then once we start writing the code, this won't be that relevant. So just follow through and get these done so that we can start working on the code. But I want to give you a brief background of what we're referring to by these things. So I copied this code. I went back here and now I'm going to install these libraries. So it ran a bunch of lines and then it's asking me to type Y to proceed. I did that and now it's going to start installing these libraries. So the libraries have been installed. You see the execution, executing transaction, it says done and it has opened a new command for me to type in. So that means installation is complete. The next thing I want to do is I want to update all these libraries to their latest version. So now can we update? all libraries that we have installed so far. So now this will say conda update all. What this function will do is it will update all the libraries that have already been installed on our Mac or PC. So all the libraries have been updated. We have downloaded Jupyter and now we can start coding. But before we do that in the next lecture, I will show you how to delete an environment and how to move between environments just to give you an idea in case you need it later and then we'll start coding after that. Now let's actually open our Jupyter notebook through the terminal which will allow us to start coding. Now can you now can we open Jupyter notebook okay so open the terminal activate your environment we know okay so let's go and check so our environment is already activated from the last lecture. So I don't need to run this command again. Now to open the Jupyter notebook, this is what I need to do. Copy, I come here and I paste Jupyter notebook and it would take a few minutes and then Jupyter notebook will open in a new browser tab. And this is what Jupyter notebook essentially is. So let's now start working in a Python code and start working on the Jupyter notebook. Jupyter this worked how do i open a new python notebook in jupyter great to hear that open jupyter notebook click on the new button on the right hand of the screen select python 3 okay this will open a new notebook with an empty code cell you can start typing the python code and press shift enter okay you can add new cells by pressing plus okay so now it's saying go to the right top, click on new and click on Python 3. This will open a new instance of the notebook. Okay, now we have the notebook ready. I'm just going to add a few more cells here. Let's run a basic command of adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Okay, so now I copy this and I can paste this in the notebook. And then how do I run it? It says press, press shift plus enter. So as long as this is black, this means that it's loading. When this changes the color to white, that means the Python program has stopped loading. So it took a minute because I was working on a new notebook and now it has given you the answer of 10 and you see the color change from black to a white empty spot. And that means that the function has completed loading and we have the first line of code which is a sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3. Now before we continue with this and start coding I want to show you how to close the terminal and delete different environments if you want which would be important in case you want to set up a new environment or you want to work on a different project in a different environment or just if you want to close the terminal, it doesn't take a lot of server space, but it's a good practice and standard practice to have in mind. So that's what we're going to cover in the next lecture. So in this lecture, I want to show you how do you close first of all, the Jupyter notebook that we have started. Second, 
how do I move from my specific environment that I'm working with to my base environment? And then how do I close the terminal? Plus, if I want to delete an environment, how do I do that as well? Just some housekeeping jobs to give you an idea of how the system works and what are the different options available so that later on, if you're working on multiple projects or you're having, if you want to start and close the terminal for different tasks, you have the ability to do that and you know how to do that. So the first thing I did was I said, now, how do I close the Jupyter notebook of the Python that I created? It says, click on the file menu at the top left hand side. And then from the drop down menu, click, click on close and halt. And then it gives an alternate method to do that. So I go to, so this is the notebook we created and this is the answer we got for the numbers we added. Now, if I go to file, there's an option called close and halt. If I click on it, then this notebook will close on its own. So it's asking me changes that you made may be not be saved. So make sure you save the file if you're actually working with something. Now that I've closed it, this tab dissipated and I'm back to my basic directory of Jupyter Notebook. The next thing I want to do is I want to know how do I close the Jupyter from the terminal. To shut down the Jupyter Notebook from the terminal, you can use the following steps. Go to the terminal window where Jupyter is running. So this is our this window. Here is where our Jupyter is running right now. Press Ctrl C or Command C on a Mac. So this is wrong. It's actually Ctrl C on Mac as well. GPT is making a mistake. Keep that in mind for Mac users. For uh, Windows user, it's going to be Ctrl C. You will see a message in the terminal indicating that the server is shutting down. Once the server has shut down, you can close the terminal window. Okay, so I come here and I press Ctrl C. It asks me if I want to shut down the server. I press Y and it does the job. Now I am back to where I started with my Python data analysis environment within my computer. So the next thing I want to do is I need to move to the base environment instead of the Python data analysis environment. So if I type this command conda deactivate, it will take me back to the base environment. And how do I know that it has switched to the base environment? This part where it says Python underscore data underscore analysis will be switched to base. So see, now this part has updated to base. Now I can go and check all the environments I have if I want. So let's say I want to see what are all the environments available in my PC right now. So let's say let's view all the environments. So again, we went through this specific command before too, just to give you a quick overview conda environment list. And now it shows me all the environments that I have. So in this list, I should see my Python underscore data analysis as well. So this is the one. And the star means that this is the activated environment. So this is the environment we are in right now, which is the base environment. Okay. The next thing I want to show you is that, okay, how do I activate? We know how to activate it. Now let's see how do we delete an environment. So let's say if you're done with the project and you don't need it anymore for some reason and you want to delete all the presence of it from your PC, you can use this command. I won't actually use it because we're working on a course and I'm going to build up on the same environment for the entire course. But this is just a command to show you that how can you delete an environment if you want to create a new one. So in this way, I'm going to activate my Python data analysis again, because this is where we'll be working with for the rest of the course. And from the next lecture or the next section, we will start working on the Jupyter notebook and understanding what it is and how we can use such a powerful tool along with ChatGPT to write and test our code. In this section, we're going to start working with Jupyter notebooks. Now, Jupyter Notebook is going to be the console that we'll we will use for the rest of this course for all our coding needs and purposes. So I'm going to spend some time to explain you how Jupyter Notebooks work, how to save and import files from different directories, what are the most prominent shortcuts that you can use, how to create new scripts. So just a quick crash course on Jupyter through GPT to understand the basics of this powerful tool. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go on the right top corner, click on new and then Python 3 to create a new working file that we will work with in this section. I will, and I can click on here on the top where it says Untitled 2, that's the name it has right now. And I'm going to change it to Intro to Jupyter.
Next, I'll go to GPT. First, I asked it to rename this tab to Intro to Jupyter Notebook, name this tab Introduction to Jupyter Notebook. Next thing I'm asking it is now I have a specific folder I want to check location for in my Mac. How do I do that? So what I'm trying to do is I've created this file now, but I have no idea where it is stored on my Mac. So I want to figure out where this file is stored or maybe be able to store it in a specific location. To do that, the first thing we need to know is the location that we want to save our file in. Let's assume that we have no idea how uh, Windows directories work and we want to figure out the location of a specific file. So a very basic command, how do I find out the location of a specific folder in my Mac? It says open finder icon, go to doc uh, in the doc or by pressing command plus spacebar and type finder. And then navigate to the parent folder of the folder you want to locate. Right click on the folder and select get info from the context menu. In the info window, look for the where section. This will display the path to the folder starting from the root directory. Okay. So let's say I have this folder saved called Python data analysis. I want to open this folder and I click right on it, go to get info. And then I'm looking for the where command. Look for the where section. So here's my where command. So this is the file location that we are interested in. Okay, essentially this much. Uh, in, if you're working with PC, it's also very simple. Over here, you'll see the current working directory and you can just click on it and copy paste and that will give you the file location. Now, this is my folder location. This is the exact same folder location that I got from my Pandas data analysis folder. And this is the Jupyter notebook name that I want to save as Python data analysis folder first Jupyter notebook. Okay. How do I save it in this location? I've already have the notebook open, just trying to save it in this location. Okay, so I'm just saying that, okay, I have the notebook open. I've already named it. I want this notebook to be saved in this specific folder location. How do I do that using Jupyter? So it says, so if this first Jupyter notebook is the name and it's currently active in the browser tab, click on the file menu, go to save as, save notebook, as dialog box and navigate to the desktop folder. Type first Jupyter Notebook and click save. Okay. So I click on save as file, save as, but it's not giving me a browser directory to search from. It's only giving me an input folder path. That's not what GPT said. Okay. So in my next prompt, I asked it when I click save as, it is asking me for path, including file name to save it. Can you provide that? So now it understood that, okay, Jupyter is asking us to provide a specific file name. And this is what it came up with. So it said user, username, desktop, pandas data analysis, first desktop user. So let's copy this, come back here, and then I can change it to Saad because that's my location. And you can see the validate that from here. So it says Saad Ahmed. So I will just copy paste Saad Ahmed actually. Now let's see if it saves. Okay, it gave me an error. It's saying unexpected error while saving file. This, this, this location, no such file or directory. Okay, so it's not able to recognize the location that we're trying to approach. So this is what I told GPT next. This didn't work. I need, I think we need to ignore the user username command. So this is from my own experience. I know that the problem might be in this path that we're providing. So that's why I gave GPT a hint to see that, okay, maybe this is the reason. And it updated the command without the username, user and username part. So now let's try the new one. Okay, now it's saying that a similar name notebook already exists. Do you want to overwrite it? Yes, I overwrote it and my file is saved in that folder. Now the file name should be first Jupyter Notebook. Let's go to our Pandas data analysis folder. And there's our first Jupyter Notebook that we just created. 
So this was a quick easy way to show you how you can access a specific uh, folder location from uh, Jupyter and save a file in that exact same folder. When you're working with Excel files and input files could be of any format. It's a standard practice to save your Excel files and input files in the same folder where Jupyter notebooks are so that when you have to read those files, it's very easy and straightforward for you. So that's why I wanted to go through through these basic steps and show you how you can access specific folders and save files there. One more way we can also see that is here. So this essentially is the directory of all my uh, folders in my PC. So I can go to desktop. I can go to Python data analysis and I can access my file from here too. First Jupyter notebook. And if I put my import, import files that I'm going to use for my data analysis in the same folder, it would be very easy for Jupyter to read it. So you see courses, e-commerce, Fortune 100. These are some of the files we're going to use throughout the course for different exploratory data analysis purposes. So now I have saved everything in the same folder, including my script to make my life easier as I move, move forward in the course and start coding. In this lecture, we're going to start talking about the basics of Jupyter Notebook. Now, they have, now that we have learned how to open and save a Python, uh, new Python script in a specific folder, let's start talking about how, what are the different functions and features available in Jupyter Notebook. So I gave GPT a very basic prompt. I said it worked based on the previous answer we got. Now let's talk about Jupyter Basics. Tell me about keyboard shortcuts in Jupyter in tabular format so that it gives me a table. I'm new to programming, so please explain each one in a separate column in the table, which is here in the separate explanation column that it added. So three columns, shortcut, title, explanation. Please sort the shortcuts by popularity. Okay, so now it's talking about different things we can do in the notebook. So first of all, let's go back to our first Jupyter notebook and run a very basic simple command 2 plus 2. Okay, so now how do I shift plus enter is equal to run cell. So if I press shift and then enter, it runs the cells and it gives me the answer, which is 4 in the next line. So in is what you wrote and out is what the program gave you as the output. So that's how it works. In 1, out 1. Now if I do 2 plus 3, this is in 2, out 2. The next one will be in three, out three. Control plus enter runs cell in place. Okay, so now if you noticed, I press shift plus enter here, it runs this command and then moves on to the next cell. Now I'm going to do control plus enter. If I do control plus enter, it will still run the command, but you see this square box is still on the same cell. It did not move directly to the next cell. So a small shortcut based on what your requirements are if you want to move on to the next cell or you just want to run the existing one. The next one is escape command mode. Switch to command mode will allow you to navigate and modify the notebook structure as well as various functions through keyboard shortcuts. The next one is enter edit mode switches the edit mode which allows you to edit the contents of the current cell. Okay so if I am here and I press enter it allows me to start editing the cell and I can do anything I want here. Now if I press escape, it takes me back. You see the type, uh, the cursor has disappeared because now I'm out, out of the cell. So just another hack, enter and escape. Now if I want to insert a cell above, I can do A, insert a cell below, B, X to cut a cell, C to copy, V to paste, shift plus cell above, delete cell, undo cell. So just like Excel, a lot of different functions that can help you fast track your work. So if I want to create a new cell, let's say I can do B and it will keep creating new cells. And similarly, if I want to create a new cell here, so please keep in mind, I'm not, the cursor is not visible. I'm clicking on the cell and not the contents inside. And now I press A, it enters the cell on top. I press B, it enters the cell on the bottom. Now, how do I cut a cell? If I press X, this shell should be cut. So this is gone again now. This is gone. Okay. So just a few shortcuts that I wanted to walk you through that can help you fast track your work. Next thing we're going to start talking about the headers available here in the Jupyter Notebook and how we can optimize their use the most. In this next lecture, we're going to start exploring what are the different 
fields and options available us available to us in the header of the Jupyter Notebook, such as what's there in file, edit, view, insert, help. So uh, once again, I ran a very basic, simple command. Now, can you explain me the menu options in Jupyter Notebook? I see the following and I copy pasted the options that I see on top of my Jupyter Notebook here. Please create one table for each. So uh, what I'm saying is like create one table for file and then one for edit and so on and so forth. I'm new to programming, so please explain each one in a separate column in the table. So two columns, title and explanation. Okay. So some of these are very basic that are that you would probably know about just by reading them, such as open a new notebook, open an existing notebook. Let's start viewing them here. So this will just create a new Python file for me. Here I can go and start by finding a Python file that I worked on previously. So anything ending with IPYNB is a Python file. So I can find one and then open it from here if I want. Save as, this is the one that we first went through in the first lecture. We wanted to save a specific file in a specific folder format. Rename, save and checkpoint. So this checkpoint will be saved and the PC will remember to run it from here the next time if you want. You can also do this by command S or control S on your PC. Revert to checkpoint. So if you made a checkpoint safe before, you can revert to it and the new anything you did after the checkpoint will be lost. Print preview, download as close and halt, which was close the workbook like we discovered before. In edit mode, you will see some of those same basic options that we explored in the previous class for keyboard shortcuts, X, C, V, for delete, copy, paste cells, move cells up and down. So all those shortcuts are available here. View toggle header will make the header disappear. If I do this, it will come back. Same thing with the toolbar. So the toolbar disappeared now and now it's back. In insert cell above, cell below, the shortcuts are A and B. It tells you the shortcuts here too. Now this is for running commands on cell. So this is shift and enter run cells and select below. This is control enter, this is shift enter, run cells and insert below, run all. So this will basically run all the cells. So it basically went through from one to the last cell that we have here. Cell type will discover it separately. And now if you want to stop kernel is basically the script that we're running right now. So if you want to interrupt it, if you want to restart it, restart and clear output. So this will create all the outputs here and then just restart the workbook. Restart and clear outputs. So now what I expect it to do is it, it will run it again and you see there are no outputs here. So if I press shift enter, shift enter, I have my outputs again. Shut down, this will just shut down the kernel completely and take us back to the directory page here. Now help will have a lot of different features that you can explore. It gives you the reference to the different libraries and different functions that you're using. We will essentially be relying on this pandas documentation. So it's a very good user guide. If you want to take a look on, on your end, uh, that would be great as well. We understand the different functions, how they're used. And of course, you anything you don't understand from the documentary here, uh, from the documentation here, you can copy paste that specific part to chat GPT and ask it that, okay, you're new to programming. Please explain to me in very simple, basic terms what this function does now. And then you can up work from there on applying that function on different uh, parts of your data frame and make the most out of GPT without writing a single line of code. You can essentially use any function from the library with the help of the AI. So now we've covered file, edit, view, insert, cell. Then it forgot, it stopped. So I gave it a new prompt saying that, please explain me kernel widgets and help as well. And I copy pasted the same information from above. I'm new to programming. So please explain each one in a separate column in the table, two columns, title and explanation. And it continued doing that. So I just uh, ran these prompts so that you have a basic understanding and you have a cheat sheet or a resource to go through in case you're looking, wondering for more information and use that to build on more prompt engineering questions for chat GPT. The next important thing that I want, you, want to walk you through is the different type of cell structures available in Jupyter. So essentially any cell can have these four types. For our purposes, these two are the most relevant one, code and markdown. 
Now, before we start exploring them, let's just ask GPT to explain to us what these two means. So by now, I have trained or GPT have understood that we're specifically talking about Jupyter Notebook. So I don't need to write long prompts. It knows that we're in the context of the questioning is related to Jupyter Notebook. So a very simple prompt like this, can you explain cell types and cell modes? It knows that we're specifically referring to say, Jupyter Notebook and within Jupyter Notebook, these cell types. So let's see what cell types are first. There are two main types of cells in Jupyter Notebook, code cells and markdown cells, which are essentially these two, code and markdown. These cells are used for writing and executing code in the notebook. You can use, you can type in valid Python code into a code cell and run it by pressing run button or the shift plus enter button. This is exactly what we do here. We did two plus three and I press shift enter and it gave me the output of five because this is a code cell. Now markdown cells, these cells are used for writing formatted text and documentation in the notebook using markdown syntax. Now markdown is a specific type of a lightweight language that allows you to easily create headings, lists, links, images, so on and so forth. So now what if I want to do the same thing with a markdown cell? So I will write the same command that I wrote here, two plus three, and let's switch the cell type to markdown. And now you see it becomes a plain text. It's not a function anymore like this one. It's a plain text. Now within markdown cells, there are a couple of things that we can do, which we will discover next. Uh, okay. So next, let's go to cell modes. There are two main types of modes for editing Jupyter Notebook, command mode and edit mode. This is the default mode when you first open a notebook and it allows you to perform actions on cells as a whole, just as creating or deleting cells, copying and pasting cells. You can enter the command mode by pressing enter. Edit mode, this mode allows you to edit contents of a single cell, either code cell or markdown cell. You can edit the mode, okay. So what it's essentially telling you now is that when I'm not inside the cell on the cursor, this is command mode. When I press enter and I see the cursor, now this is edit mode. Essentially, I can update my command here and then run it and now I'm back into command mode. So when you're, when you see the cursor blinking, then you're in edit mode because you're allowed to edit the cell. When the cursor is not blinking, that's the command mode. Now back to our markdown. If I want to update this, into a different style. I can do this using hashes. So if I add a hash here, that should work. Let's ask ChatGPT. Can you give me the syntax for header and markdown in tabular format? Okay. So it's saying type in this way. Okay. So I forgot a space. That's why. Okay, so I was missing the space. That's why it was giving me an error. So if I just do the same thing again, but with space, okay, now it becomes a header. So this is this is the this is the power of GPT that I'm trying to explain. That although I know and I understand code, there are always small things in the syntax that I keep forgetting. Now I don't need to remember them because anytime I'm stuck with the problem or anytime I want to change my code, I can give a very precise instruction to chat GPT and it will help me figure that out for me. So let's see what else it's telling us about markdown. So very simple prompt. Can you give me the syntax for header and markdown in tabular format? So it says if you do one hash, it will be header one, two for header two, three for three, five for five. So if I just copy paste these, I can't copy paste all of them. Let's just try some of them here. So let's say I add another hash. So you see as I'm adding hashes, the size of the text is decreasing because it's going from header one to two to three. And as you move in subsequent headers, the size of the headers is decreasing. So this was a bit of the information about um, how the coding cells work. So essentially what we do, what we can do here is I can add a cell above this one by entering command mode and then enter a cell. I'll mark it as a markdown. And then I can say intro to Jupyter notebook, add the space here, and then I can say two hashes to make it a subheading, simple sum of numbers. 
and if I think it's too big, I can add another hash here. So now if I run it, this becomes my, basically the title of the Jupyter Notebook with a simple instruction before. And then I have these two cells where I'm running my code. So that's the difference. This is our markdown cell. This is our code cell. The next thing I want to show you is how the output in the Jupyter cell works. So let's start with a very basic prompt. I've asked GPT that if there are multiple commands in one cell, Jupyter will only output the last one. Could you show this by the following example? 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 3 plus 3. Sure, here's an example of a Jupyter notebook cell with multiple commands. And there are three commands. The first answer is 2, the second should be 4, and the third should be 6. When you run this cell, Jupyter will only output the result of the last command, which is 6, okay, in this case. The output of previous commands 2 and 4 respectively are not displayed. And here's the output. If you want to see all the outputs, you have to add print command next to it. This is because Jupyter Notebook only displays the output of the last command in a cell by default. However, you can use the print command function to display the intermediate outputs or the results of multiple commands within the same cell, for example this. And then your output would be 2, 4 and 6. So let's go and try this out actually in our Jupyter Notebook. So here I have these four cells. So let's start with the first one. I did one plus one, I got two. I'm going to edit it. And now let's do two plus two, shift enter. Oops, sorry. So actually this is being made as a markdown cell. I have to convert it back to code for it to be able to start coding. And you see how the color changed. That was the mistake I was making. And that's why the code didn't run. So let's do one plus one again. So that's your two. Now let's add two plus two. Now it became four. You see how the two disappeared. And now when I do three plus three, I will only see six. If I want to see all of them, what do I do? If I want to see all of them, it says use this, which is essentially print each cell. So now it's going to print this line first and then this line and then this line because we specifically told it to print all three lines. While here it's defaulting to printing only the last line because that's how Jupyter has been built. So now when I press shift enter, I see all three of them. This is a important part that I wanted to specifically explain before we start coding because essentially if you don't assign a print command, it will only output the last line and you'll be confused that why is my answer from the first two commands not shown. So that's the part I wanted to cover here. The next thing we're going to do is start talking about importing libraries. If you remember from our first section, when we were in the terminal, we imported a few libraries into our terminal using the pip install command. It's in our previous lecture where we imported pandas and Jupyter and a couple of other uh, libraries into our terminal for that specific environment. Now, we're going to call those libraries into our current script in Jupyter that we are working with. So first we connected our PC with those libraries in those specific environments and now we're calling them so that we can use them in a specific Python script. So to start with, I gave it a very basic command. Now we're going to talk about importing libraries to our Jupyter Notebook. Could you first explain to me what libraries means in this context and what they are? Be precise. Sure. In the context of Jupyter Notebook and programming in general, a library is a collection of pre-written code. Like we discussed before, it's a set of pre-written code that provides specific functionality or tools you can use in your own code. Libraries typically create, contains function, classes, and other objects that can be imported into your code and used to perform various tasks or solve specific problems. There are many libraries in Python programming language, which is what Jupyter Notebook uses. Some of the most commonly used are NumPy. NumPy is a library for working with arrays of numerical data. Pandas, Pandas, this is the one we'll be working with, is for structured data and data analysis. Data manipulation, cleaning and analysis, and this is the one that the course is focused on. Matplotlib is another one that we will use in the course in the visualization section because it helps us plot different graphs and customize them and use different options from there. Sci-Fi and Scikit-Learn are data science libraries that we won't be focusing on in this course. And these are just a few examples it came up with. We will be focusing on Pandas and Matplotlib out of these libraries. So to further understand libraries, 
I gave it another prompt saying that can you explain me the concept of library in Python by giving it analogy with pre-built functions in Excel as some. So just a way to make GPT understand that okay I don't know much about coding but I know Excel. So can you make an analogy with Excel so that I can understand the basic concepts of libraries. That's what I'm trying to do here. Sure. In Excel you can use pre-built functions such as some average and count. Okay these are very basic functions that we know how to use in Excel. To perform calculation and analysis on your data. These functions are part of the Excel application and are designed to make common tasks easier and more efficient. Okay. Similarly, in Python and Jupyter Notebook, you can use libraries that contain pre-written code to perform common tasks and operations. For example, NumPy library provides functions for working with arrays or numerical data, such as calculating the mean, standard deviation, and other statistical measures. Okay. So just like Excel has functions like sum, average, and count, NumPy has functions that allows it for calculating mean, standard deviation, and other statistical measures. Pandas also has functions for working with structured data, such as grouping and aggregating data, merging data from different sources, and performing data cleaning and transformation. Just like Excel functions, libraries in Python can save you time and effort by providing pre-written code that you can use to perform common task and analysis on your data. By importing these libraries into your Jupyter Notebook, you can take advantage of their functionality and use them to perform complex analysis. So in a nutshell, just like we can use built-in functions in Excel, we can use libraries so that I, we get access to built-in functions within those libraries. And specifically, we'll be working with the pandas library because it has a lot of built-in functions that can help us with our data analysis work, creating pivot tables, filtering out data, changing rows and columns, adding new rows and columns. So features like that that might require a lot of lines of code without the library. By using these libraries, we will get access to their free built-in functions that will allow us to do this job much faster and much easier. Okay, so now let's start with the first library that we will work with. Write me the code for importing pandas library. Be concise and only give me this code. Nothing else. Sure. Here's the code to import pandas library in Python. So import pandas as pd. This is the standard one. So I'll copy this. What does this code do? This code uses the import statement to import the pandas library and assign it to alias pd. So that every time we use pd alias, we know the script will know that you are referring to the pandas library here. This allows you to refer to the library using shorthand pd instead of typing out the full name pandas. Once you have imported the libraries, you can use its functions and tools in the Jupyter Notebook by calling the pd as alias. For example, pd.read underscore csv to read a csv file and create a data frame out of it. Dot data frame to create new pandas data frame object. So now let's go and import pandas as pd. So again, I copy pasted the code, shift enter. It's going to run for a while and I'm not expecting an output here because I just imported a library. I'm not expecting an output but I know it's been completed and there were no errors. Next thing I want to do is let's import numpy as well. So again same thing copied I come here and I'm going to override this one to include both the libraries. Why we need numpy? Numpy will help us later when we're doing statistical analysis on specific arrays and creating random numbers. So it's just another important library that we might be we will use in the course. So I added it here as well. Now can you tell me how to check what version of pandas are we using in the next Jupyter cell? Assume pandas has been imported as pd already. Print command not required. So why did I say print command not required here? Is because GPT was specifically telling me commands like this. Although I wanted only this because that adds more to the line of code. So I'm trying to explain it that okay, you don't need to write print command. Just give me this much of code and I can run it in my Jupyter notebook. So that's what took me seven attempts to get to the right output that I was looking for. Here's the code to check the version of pandas that is currently installed in your Jupyter notebook. So if I copy paste this code here, it should tell me what version of pandas are we using right now. And I got an output answer 1.5.3. 1 
this also confirms and validates for me that my pandas library has been imported because otherwise i wouldn't have been able to read its version number so that's it for this course in the next in sorry that's it for this lecture in the next lecture i'll show you a small hack and then after that we will start working with actual python data analysis So in this lecture, I quickly want to cover what Google Colab is and how we can use it to code. Now from my experience, one of the most daunting tasks or one of the most demotivating tasks for a new coder or someone who's just started coding with, is getting introduced to coding, is installing the right softwares, setting up the right environments and making sure that the coding environments are set up correctly on your PC to work. This is something we will exp start exploring in the next section when we ins uh, download Anaconda onto our PC, then I we will install it and then we will access it through the command terminal or the command prompt based on whether you're working with PC on Mac, we'll create environments, we'll install the relevant libraries and we will debug different sort of problems that we face during that. But there are a lot of times when you run in errors when you're setting up these environments and installing the right softwares and sometimes when you can't resolve them it becomes very demotivating so if you're new to coding and you don't have any of these softwares installed already and you don't want to spend hours on figuring out how to install them and you want a quick and easy access to python to start coding then use google colab or if you tried installing anaconda and you ran into errors and you have sent me a message on uh, helping you out with it in the meantime you can use google colab and continue with the course now let me show you what google colab is so i wrote a simple keyword google colab on google and it takes me to welcome to collaboratory by google now you see it's open this tab and it asks me if i want to create a new notebook now if I want to create a new notebook, I can directly click here and I can start coding. But to give you a basic idea, this is the home page. It will give you a get, getting started guide, a few of tips for data science and machine learning when, what, when it comes to working with Google Colab. And then you click on file and you click on new notebook. And it will open a new notebook for you and I can do start coding here directly without installing any libraries or anything. This is a Python console that is running on the cloud. Now to understand how Google Colabs work, it's exactly the same way or more or less the same way as Jupyter works. So you can skip the Anaconda setup section if you don't want to get into the hassle of installing and downloading the softwares and you directly want to get into uh, this course and start coding. Uh, skip the anaconda section directly go to the jupiter section and the way jupiter works colab works the exact same way I, i'm just adding this section to make sure that people who are struggling with setting up the environments they don't get demotivated and they have an easy easily accessible way of starting coding i've also added a resource section in the resource section a youtube video uh, which is from the google colab team um, that will provide you a bit of the basics about Google Colab if you're further interested in learning more about it. I thought it will be a good use source, resource for you, so I've added it here. So now that we're going to start talking about the basics of Python, um, let's start with understanding what comments are in a Jupyter Notebook and how can we best use them. So I gave a very basic prompt saying we are working in a Jupyter Notebook. The name of the notebook is First Jupyter Notebook. To continue with, can you tell me three things? What are comments and why are they used? How to add comments and best practices for writing comments? Be concise. And this is what GPT told me. Comments are lines of code in a program that are not executed, but are used to document and explain the code. So essentially we're adding information in our code to explain it. How do we do that? We add do that by using a hat symbol followed by the comment. For example, a hat symbol followed by the comment here. So it's breaking up giving in the example so basically what it's saying is hashtag this is a comment so you see how the color changes versus if i write this way so right now over here python is trying to think of it as a program a code 
to run. But if I add a hashtag before it, now Python knows that I'm working on a specific comment only to explain the code. So it does not need to run a line which starts with a hash. Now, what are some of the best practices for using comments? Use comments to explain complex or unclear code. Keep comments up to date with changes to the code. Avoid using comments to explain obvious code. Use clear and concise language in comments. Do not use comments to disable code. Use version control instead. So it's just giving some basic best practice techniques to make sure your comments are up to date and understandable. So if you're explaining something which is very complex, you should use comments to explain that. Keep your comments simple and easy to understand so that if someone else is reading your script, they have an idea and they can follow through your comments to understand what the script does. Now let's try a few examples of different comments. So what I essentially did here is I ran this command. So I'm going to run it in three different cells to get three different outputs. This is essentially the same command that we, we ran up in here in our previous sections. So import pandas as pd, check for pandas version and sum two plus two. And this time what we have done is that we have added comments for each one. So this one says import pandas library. Here's a comment here which says check for pandas version, which this code does. And here this comment explains what this function, here it's happening, which is we are adding two plus two. So now let's ask GPT and see how good or bad these comments are that we wrote. So this is the comment GPT provided when I said, please provide feedback on these comments. The first comment is a good practice. The first one is import pandas as li library as it helps to explain what library is being imported. The second comment is also good. Check for pandas version as it helps to identify the purpose of the code line. And it is important to know the version of the library that is being used. Okay. What about the third one? Sum of two plus two. Now it is saying that it is not necessary as the code is self explanatory. It is clear that it calculates the sum two plus two. So it's just saying that, okay, we don't really need to write this because two plus two in itself tells us what's going to happen in this comment. There is nothing to explain here. So just a brief background into how the comments work and why they are important. Uh, in the next section, we're going to start talking about different types of data in Python. Now, the first thing that we're going to learn in Python is the basic data types that are available in Python. So I gave ChatGPT a very simple prompt saying, please explain the basic data types in Python. Give the output in tabular format. I want three columns for each row, data type, its description, and give me an example that I can run Jupyter. Sort by most popular ones. Okay. So here are the basic data types in Python and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It gave us the eight basic most popular data types that are available in Python for us to work with. Now let's go through them one by one and see what each one is. So the first one is an integer. Integer could be any number positive or negative. The second is float. Float is essentially a decimal point number. Integer cannot be a decimal. Here and you see this example 3.14. So now you're adding decimals. So if you have 0, 0.0, this is a float. If it's just zero, it's an integer. The next is string. String is just a sequence of characters. It could be anything. It could be a word. It could be a number, but it is a sequence of characters stored in specific way. That specific way. So hello world is a string. Boolean. Boolean means true or false. So anytime you're looking for a yes or no answer, that's where Boolean comes into play. And for instance, I say two plus two is, is two plus two equals to four. The answer is true. That's a Boolean because there are only two possibilities here either true or false list list can order collection of values so you can have a list of numbers you can have a list of characters in a specific sequence and the sequence in the order matters in the case of a list tuple we won't be working with much in our data analysis dictionary is an unordered collection of key value pairs so essentially there are two different values think of it like two different values for x and y and both of them are related for instance if you're looking at a menu of a restaurant every dish will have a price so dish name and price is a key and value pair where my key is the dish name and the value is the price of the dish so essentially in this way every dish will have a key value pair of its price 
and set set is just another another an unordered uh, collection of unique elements so it's, it's like a list but uh, here the order doesn't matter okay the next thing i want to touch base on is how to check the data type value so for instance i have a data type for well, let's say let's i have this one how do i know whether it's a integer float string boolean or list okay i can tell by my understanding that okay this is a word so it's probably a string but how do i figure out in python that what the data type is and so what gpt does in it is it started explaining to me how to check the data types and it's doing this by using the type function so for instance this is the first one that we have here 10 so it took this and it wrote it within type and brackets so let's copy this and run this my answer from my understanding should be a integer now and that's what it says that the answer should be integer and that's what we got here int the next one it says let's try hello world so let's go with hello world and probably this will come out to be a string and that's what we see here it's telling me the type of this is string now similarly i can go here and do 10.1 and now it will be a float and then if i do 10.1 is equal equal to 12 so equal equal to means equality sign uh, what i'm saying essentially is that if this side of the equation is equal to this side of the equation give me true otherwise false so right now i'm asking it to tell me what 10.1 if 10.1 is equal equal to 12 and then it gives me the answer as a boolean why because right now the answer of this function is false and the type of false is boolean so essentially what i'm saying here is if i run this only my answer becomes false now if i ask it what is the type of my answer it's going to say boolean so that's essentially what's happening here so i created a, a question uh, where the answer could be either true and false the answer was false and then when i checked the type of that function the answer was a boolean so essentially that's why the answer come out to be a boolean here now explain me the difference between integer and float like we explained we just worked with its integer is without decimal float is with decimal one important thing to note is that the arithmetic operations between integer and a float so for instance if you're dividing 10 by 3.0 so 10 is an integer 3.0 is a float the answer will be a float so if i run this code here and if i say type of c so now i'm trying to figure out what is the type of this variable that we are creating which is equal to a divided by b where a is 10 and b is 3 so 10 divided by 3 3.33 now what is the type of 3.33 now it's a float but if i go check the type for a it will be an integer type for a sorry yeah so type for a is an integer so in this way an integer was converted into a float variable by dividing it by a float the next thing we're going to ask gptx to explain the data type string can a number be stored as a string don't provide any extra information okay so it says a string is an order of sequence ordered sequence of characters so keep in mind the order of the numbers or the characters in the string matters enclosed in quotation marks either single or double so it could be either single or double quotation marks both of them mean the same thing a number can be stored as a string by simply enclosing it in quotes okay so if i put a number in quotes so for instance if i say one two three one two three okay now let's check the type of this variable so although this is a number but because i stored it in quotation marks the type has changed to string if i do the same thing without the quotation marks the type will be an integer if i change this to point zero it will be float okay now please explain boolean data type use a basic example such as 2 plus 2 equal equals to 5 explain what equal equals to signifies 
the boolean data type represents a logical value and can have only two possible values it can either take a value of true or it can take the value of false and they offered they offer an answer to conditional statements to control the flow of a program for example the expression 2 is equal to 2 is a boolean expression that tests whether the sum of 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 since this is not true the expression evaluates to a false we can assign this boolean value to the variable like this so what it does here is that it defines a new variable called result which is equal to what 2 plus 2 equal equals to 5 so now it's saying is 2 plus 2 equal to 5 that's essentially what the statement does by adding two equals in the middle and if i print the result the answer will be a false so the symbol is called equality operator in python it tests whether the value on the left side of the equation is equal to the value on the right side of the equation if they are equal the expression evaluates to true otherwise to false now let's talk about another data type in python which is called none none means nothing essentially so if a variable has no value or if there is no value as an answer then it would default to none keep in mind zero is different than none because zero still signifies a numerical value while none means absence of anything not even a zero so it's a built-in data type that represents the absence of a value it is often used as a placeholder when a variable needs to be initialized initialized but there is no value to assign to it for instance here what it does it it says a variable x is equal to none and it says if x is none print x has no value so it basically just defines a variable of x to none and then calls it on a print command in the next lecture we're going to start talking about different operators that we can use on these data types such as multiplication subtraction and so forth okay so now let's talk about different operators and tell me the most popular one in a tabular format that's what i asked gpt tell me what are the most popular operators that i can use and give me the result in a tabular format so it gave me very basic examples of a lot of different operations i can do it starts with addition like we tested it out 2 plus 3 is 5 it subtracted 5 minus 2 is 3 multiplication 2 times 3 is 6 division so i can literally copy paste any of these come here run it and i should get the same answer 3.5 integer division floor division so it will give you rounded off to the lower value instead of 3.5 it rounded off to 3 if i do upper division or cap division then it will round it up to 4 modulus tells you the remainder so 7 divided by 2 is 3.5 but it takes only the last whole number value and then keeps the rest so 2 into 3 is 6 6 minus 7 is 1 that's what the modulus does here exponential means 2 to the power of 3 which is essentially 2 times 2 times 2 is equal to 8 equality operator we studied it compares if the left hand side of the equation is equal to the right side so if i copy this command it will give me the answer of true now the next one is also interesting which is the inequality operator so now it's checking if 2 plus 2 is not equal to 5 and if that is the case the answer will be true what if i do 4 now the answer should be false so you see how i use the equality operator both the sides of the equation were equal i got a true response i use the same two sides of the equation here 2 plus 2 and 4 but instead of equality i use the inequality operator so now it should give me the opposite way if 2 plus 2 is not equal to 4 then i want a true answer i can repeat the same task on a something that is false so essentially if i do 5 here now my first answer will be false because 2 plus plus 2 plus 2 is not equal to 5 but if i put in the same command through not equal to then i'll get a true because it's expected to be not true right so that's how equality and inequality operators work greater than and less than can be used in a similar way 3 is greater than 2 will give you a true 2 is less than 3 will give you a true as well greater than equal to just like basic algebra and mathematics and operator is also very interesting so here and or not so 2 plus 2 is less than 3 and 3 is less than 4 if both the conditions are true 
it will give me a true if even one of them is true and one of them is false in and operator my answer will be false so here let's try this out so now i know let's try the first one first so now we got a true what if we try the second one that is also a true so that means if i combine the two my answer will still be true right but what if we change one of the conditions to be false now i know this one is false but this one is true so essentially what i'm saying is that true and false my first answer is true but my second answer is false now if i run it the answer is false because you need both trues for this to work now i can change the same condition to a or which is the next one it covers probably in the list here yeah. or so now one is true and one is false i will get an answer of true because in or case if either one of the two conditions are true then it will give a true answer so now the answer is true because although this is false this is true similarly not is also a negation checker so not two is less than three let's try this one out so first let's see what we get when we do it without the not so this answer should default to two is less than three so it is true now if i add a not this should default to false right because that's the opposite of what we are expecting if it was a false it will give me a true answer so if i do five here then i'll get a true answer because a, a negation is expected in the result in feature and not in feature we'll cover slightly more in detail in when we start talking about list essentially it is checking if a specific value is available in a list so if three is available in this list one two three four five it says true if we ask six it would say false similarly here not in will give me a true if it's not in the list six is not in the list that gives me a true answer here so that's that's about the basic operators that we have in python i would suggest you take a break at this point and start using some of these on your own assign a few uh, do a different multiple uh, calculations using these operators and see test your knowledge of if you can get the right answer from the booleans that python provides the next thing i want to talk about is the logic in which these operators that we discussed in the previous lecture uh, gets prioritized when python is working on a specific numerical calculation to start with i'll just pick this code take this to jupyter and apply it so now it gave me an answer three now my question is that how do i know which one of these operators were used first so did it do five plus four first or did it operate four times three first or three divided by six first or six minus two first what what was the operator that was first committed how is the priority set between multiple operators when you're doing plus minus multiply subtract uh, exponential powers how does python decide which operator to act on first and decides a priority rank so to do that i gave gpt a simple prompt saying explain to me pemdas the logic in which operators are executed so pemdas is an acronym that stands for parenthesis for p exponents for e multiplication and division for m and d and addition and subtraction for a and s so it is used to specify the order of operations when evaluating mathematical expressions that involve multiple operators so now if you have multiple operators like in this command this is the order it will use the first thing is that it will cover anything which is in parenthesis since there are no parenthesis here it does it's not relevant the next one is exponents so where is the exponent here is the exponent so first it will do 2 to the power 2 which is 4 and exponent is executed the next thing it would focus on is multiplication and then division so then we're first multiplying 4 by 3 and then whatever the answer is we'll divide it by 6 and lastly we'll do take care of addition and subtraction which is 5 plus the answer from here minus the answer from here and here is the breakdown of the explanation on how it would be done so first thing first this is calculated first and this is turned into 4 2 to the power 2 second thing is multiplication so 4 by 3 this becomes 12 
6 comes down as it is. Now 12 divided by 6 is 2. So now you have your 2, your 4 and then 5 copied as it is. Your final answer is 3. So this is how PEMDAS work. A brief introduction to how calculations occur behind the scenes in Python based on what priority so that you understand based on your requirements what type of formulas you need to create. Now let's start talking about the concept of variables. So just like we studied in algebra, uh, we had equations containing y and x. We can also define variables in Python and assign them separate values. A variable is a name, storage, location in computer's memory. So you can assign a name to a storage location essentially and then store any value within it. The value can be of any data type. It could be a number, string, boolean or a complex data structure like a list or dictionary. And these are all the data types that we have discussed before in the previous lecture. Variables are used to store data that is being used by a program. And they allow programs to manipulate and transfer data dynamically as the program runs. To create a variable in Python, you simply choose a name for the variable and use the sign equal to to assign it to the value. For example, here you're doing x is equal to 5. So if I go here and I type this very basic example of x is equal to 5 and then I call x to see what this variable is equal to, I'll get a value of 5. Now we can build up on that too. We can assign a new variable y which is equal to x plus 2. Okay, so let's say I assign a new variable y which is x plus 2. And now if I call y, the answer is 7. So essentially took the value of 5, added 2 to it and the answer became 7. So now if I want to change this and I change this to 10, now my answer should be 12 for y. So based on the input value of x, it calculates this function and gives me the value of y as well. One important thing to note here is that variables are case sensitive. This means that x and x are two different variables. So a small x and a capital X will be treated separately by Python. So essentially if I did this, then it should not work. X is not defined. It doesn't know what X means. But if I change this to X and then run this command, it would work because now I have used the same X in both the situations. This is not necessary for me. So keep this in mind when you're assigning variables. I would highly advise you to keep them in small cases and don't make anything capitalized as a standard benchmark. Okay, and this is what we discuss next. Let's briefly talk about the naming convention of variables. In Python, there are some conventions for naming variables that can help make code more readable and consistent. Here are, here are some guidelines to follow. Variable names should be descriptive and meaningful. This helps make the purpose of the variable clear and understandable. And here it gives an example, num underscore of underscore students. So it clearly helps me understand that this variable defines the number of students. So that's what it means by descriptive and meaningful. Variable names should be written in lowercase with words spreaded by underscores. This is known as snake case and make variables names easier to read and distinguish from other parts of the code. So it's saying all of them are in lowercase, num of students and anytime you want to add a space, add an underscore. The next thing it says is variable names should not begin with a number or contain any spaces. This is because Python uses spaces and spatial characters for other purposes and starting a variable name with the number can cause errors. So keep this in mind, don't start with an spatial character or a number, keep it to plain simple text from A to Z or in lowercase. Variable names should not be the same as of any Python's reserved keywords such as if, else, while, for. Why? Because these are built-in functions that Python uses for different things. While and for can be used to run a loop. If and else are statements that helps you come up with boolean answers like if this is true do this if that is if else do something else so it helps you make in the decision making process of what step to take next that's how the code uses these functions so therefore make sure that you don't keep your variable names on these names otherwise python will get confused 
the next thing i want to get into is help you understand how the value of the variable can be modified and changed by using it over and over again so let's say i have these three lines of code age is equal to 10 age is equal to age plus 5 age is equal to age plus 10 so if i run this code what do you think will be the output first we are assigning a variable of age to a value of 10 then we are saying that the variable age is equal to age plus 5 and here the value of age is 10 so essentially i am doing 10 plus 5 here right which will give me 15 but now here what we are doing is we are saying age plus 10 again so here we did 5 and here we are doing 10 so now at this point the value of this variable is already 15 so my starting value of age is 15 and now i'm adding 10 to it so i'm going to end up with 25 so my output here of age variable if i call a variable called age will be 25 so you see how using the same variable over and over again we can override its value to a new value by calling the calling that variable and this is what it's going to try and explain you here age is equal to 10 the variable age is created and assigned a value of 10 age is equal to age plus 15 now the value is 15 because it uses the 10 and added 5 to it and then now it uses the 15 and added 10 to it making it 15 so in summary the variable age is assigned the value of 10 initially then the value 5 and 10 are added it in it to it in subsequent lines resulting in the final value of age now how do you make sure that you don't do that in case you want to store the original value of your variable so i can change the name of this variable and then i wouldn't run into this issue so i can say age underscore five added and here i can say underscore 10 added i'm just defining variable names here out of my head to give you an idea of what i mean and then i can say here age oh sorry 10 and then if i call this variable then the value will be 5 and then if i call this variable 15 sorry and then if i call this the value will be 25 so now essentially i am not changing my original variable but instead of doing that i am creating a new variable based on whatever numerical calculation i want to do on the existing variables so essentially now i have three different variables with three different values the first one says age is 10 okay 15 and then third one should be 20 20. why is this 20 this is 20 because it's taking the original age variable the value of the original age variable is 10 and adding 10 to it that's why it's 20 and not 25 anymore if i want to make it 25 again then instead of calling age here i can call this variable so now this will go from 10 to 15 to 25 so use these different iterations and try and understand how the function is behaving or this operators are behaving in different circumstances here i'm calling in age underscore five underscore added which has a value of 15 already so that's why it ends up at 25 but instead if i call age only which has a value of 10 it's doing 10 plus 10 and would essentially correspond to the value of 25 now uh, to the value of 20 now so so far in this module we have covered essentially a lot of different things we started with different data types that we have we we looked at how are they different from each other then we talked about what are the most popular operators that we can operate on our data types then we talked about what is the priority set for using these operators on specific data types then we looked into what variables are and how to best use them what are their conventions next we worked with a variable which was called multiple times to see how that changes the value of the variable next what i want to talk about is functions 
So understand what are the pre-built in functions in Python and how we can best utilize them for our task. So this is the prompt I gave to ChatGPT. Let's talk about the built-in functions. What are they? And give me a list of most commonly used built-in functions in tabular format. Sure. Built-in functions in Python are predefined functions that are able to use without the need for importing any modules. They are part of the core Python language and are available, always available to use. So if you remember, we imported pandas and we imported numpy because we wanted access to specific functions that are available through those libraries. Now we're going through functions that are pre-built in Python already. We don't need to access any extra library to get to those. These functions are already there in the core Python programming language and we can just directly call them. What are some of these functions? So for instance, we have been through this one print. So essentially, if you want to print something or, or which essentially means that you want to output something, you can just write it under the parenthesis with the print command and, and that will be outputted. So for instance, if I give this command here, it would just print the output hello world for me, whatever is inside here. So if I add another exclamation mark, that's what it does. Very basic type. This one also we have worked with. It tells you what is the type of the output uh, value. So what is the data type of hello in this case? So we know that anything in the inverted commas will be counted as, as a string, like we discussed in the data type section uh, lecture. So if I type this, type hello, I would get an answer of string. The next thing is length. This returns the length of a specific specified string or sequence. So for instance, if I, let's use the same hello for the example. I copy paste this here and then I'll change the type function to length function. And essentially what it will do is it will tell me the length, the number of characters in the string. So there are one, two, three, four, five characters in the string. I should expect an answer of five. Now, if I go back here and I add a space there, my answer will change to six because essentially that is also being counted as a character here. So keep this in mind, length, length function can help you tell the number of characters in a string. Input is when you want the user to enter an input to the function or to, to be used in a function, um, not very relevant to us right now, I will skip this one. String, converts a specified value to a string, okay. So what it's doing is like I can give it any sort of data type, the output data type will be a string. So for instance, if I have a number one, two, three, and I find the data type of this function, it should be an integer. But if I pass this number through this function called str, the data type will change to string and now if I check the type of this function, this should be a string as well. So see, um, if I want to show it to you in an easier way, I can do this. I can define a new variable called x123 and then I can say, give me the type of x. It gives me integer and then I'm saying that y is equal to string on x so it's taking the value of x or one two three and then converting it into a string and that's my value for y now if i check the type for y the type for y will now be a string and this can work on any data type essentially it will convert that data type into a string integer converts a specified value to an integer okay so now if i have Let's reverse it out. So now I have a value stored of y and the value is equal to one, two, three and it's a string. The type of y is a string. How do I go back to converting it into an integer? So I can use the, so now I can use this integer function to convert that value of a string back to an integer. How would I do it? I would enter I would call my function y and this function will essentially convert it into an integer. I will store this as a new variable z and now if I call the type function on z, my answer will be 
equal to an integer. So essentially this is what we did. We went from an integer called x with 1, 2, 3 to a string called y which is equal to 1, 2, 3 to back to an integer called z which is equal to 1, 2, 3. So this way you can play around and convert one function type into another. If we want we can also do the same operation and convert something into float. So if I want to convert this function into float I can just type float here and then my value will be a float. If I want to see the value of z now it should have a decimal value next to it. Yeah. So in this way we covered some of the most basic functions that are already available in the built-in Python library. In the next class we will start discussing how to create custom functions in Python. So in the last lecture we discovered some of the most built some of the most popular built-in functions in Python. Now let's try and create our own function that we can provide a value and it gives it a different value as an output and we will define our own logic in that specific function. So this is what I'm going to ask ChatGPT to do for me next. Now let's discuss custom functions. Explain the anatomy of the function by explaining define function name variables logic return. So these are essentially the five key things that we need to know when we're defining our own function. It starts with a def, it ends with a return value. There's a logic in the middle of there somewhere based on a couple of variables and the function has a name. When writing syntax, write logic and return command separately and how to run the function. Use an example of a function that converts inches to centimeters. Okay, so this is the use case of the function that we're going to work with. Next, we're converting inches to centimeters. So if you take a step back and think about it, how would this work? I would basically create a function where I provided a value in inches and it will give me the output as centimeters. So inches becomes my input, centimeter becomes my output. Now before we go through this how it defines it, let's look at the code directly. So def meaning define which was essentially the first part I assigned, I asked for it here is what starts the function and it ends with the return. So you see these two values are blue because this sig signifies the starting and ending call of the function. After def in the red is your function name which is inches to centimeter and then parenthesis means that anything within this parenthesis will be the input value that the function receives. So in this case inches since we are converting inches to centimeters the input value should be in inches. So that's what it expects that okay here there will be an input value. Now everything in green is what it's written in comments format to explain us what the function does. So the function converts inches to centimeters. Args means argument. The arguments are that it takes an inches which is the float value. So it has already said that inches will be stored as a float value with decimal points. A length in inches is provided. And what does it return? Essentially the output of the function. It returns a float, float value which is the length, same length but in centimeters now. And how does this logic work? And this is the logic part. So it assigns a new variable called centimeter, which is equal to inches. Inches is the same variable here, which is provided in the input and multiplies it by 2.54 because that's how you convert these two uh, from one to another. And then the return value gives you the variable centimeter, which is essentially what the function calculated. Now let's read here how ChatGPT explained it. So def statement, the def statement is used to define a function. It starts with the keyword def followed by a function name inches to centimeter and a pair of parentheses. I hear a parenthesis here within which we put an in inches. The function name is the name that you choose for your function. It should be descriptive and meaningful. So essentially I can call this anything. I can call this ABCD. But what it's saying is like make sure that you name it well so that by reading the function you know what it is supposed to do. In this case it is very clearly evident that this function creates changes inches to centimeters. Variables. Variables are placeholders for data that is passed into the function. So these are short term storage places where Python will store the data based on what you pass through the function in the input variable and what you expect it to give you in the output. So there are specified in the parentheses after the function name. In Python you can also specify default values for variables 
in case they are not passed in when the function is called okay so it's saying that they are specified in the parentheses after the function name here are the input values that will be used in the function and you can also assign them a default value which we will discover next the logic the logic of the function is the code that executes the function it is is called it can involve any number of statement or operations and can use the variable passed in as arguments so this is essentially the logic part where it takes the inches variable multiplies it by 2.54 and stores a new variable called centimeter based on it cm based on it lastly the return statement here return space cm the return statement is used to specify the output of the function it returns a value or values back to the calling code here's an example of the function so now let's copy paste this function and run it in a new tab so if i run the function i don't expect anything right now what we have done is we have defined a function now the next thing is how to use this function to calculate a specific value from inches to centimeter and this is what gpt will cover next so here it talks about to run this function you can call it by name what is the name of the function inches to centimeters and pass a value for the inches okay so here where it said inches now it's passing it a value of 10 like this in this example we call the function with a value of 10 and the function results the value which is 10 25.4 which is essentially coming from multiplying the inches value with 2.54. So now let's go and run this and see what result do we get. So if we say this and then I print result, I should get 25.4 based on this. Now I can change this. Let me write this in the same cell so that I don't have to run it twice. So now if I change this to 100, I get a new value. I change this to 1.11.534, I get a new value. If I change this to zero, I should get a zero value because zero multiplied by 2.54 is zero. So now in this way, we defined a new function called inches to centimeters and we can pass in any value for inches and will be converted into centimeters. Now for your own practice, can you create a function using GPT that created that converts centimeter to inches by yourself and see if you can pass on different values to that function and make it work. The next thing I want to talk about now is what GPT suggested here when it says that when it comes to variables, you can also specify default values. So what it means is that essentially what happens if I pass, let me actually copy this over again so that you have a record when you're working through this Jupyter notebook. So now what if I don't pass a value? It gives me an error. What is the error? Inches to CM missing one required positional argument inches so it's saying I can't accept empty brackets you have to give me a value so what if we don't want to give it a value and we want it to default to a given value on its own we can also do that so this is where I write this prompt to better understand predefined values so can you tell me how do I set a predefined default value of the input variables of the function in case input variable are not provided for the function Yes, you can put a predefined value for the input variables of a function in Python using the following syntax. So what it's saying is here, it, it basically wrote a new default function name saying def, def define function name. And here it says variable one is equal to default value of this. And then variable two is equal to default value of this. So in this syntax, you specify the variable name followed by the default value that should be used if no value is provided for that variable when the function is called you can specify default value for as many variables as needed. And here it comes up with a new example. So let's work with our existing example and update the function to include a default value so that we don't see this error. So first I'm just going to copy this here. Let's go to our original function and our variable one is equal to inches. So I will just copy this here and then I can add a default value of zero here. So now if I call an empty function, I should see an answer of zero and it worked. So now you see that even though I passed an empty parameter, the function knows that if no value is being provided, then my value for inches is zero. 
it multiplies 0 by 2.54 and then the answer comes out to be 0. So in this way you can also define a predefined default value for the function to fall back to in case the input parameter is not provided. What GPT does next is it comes up with a new example of calculating rectangle area of width and height and how it calculates the area it multiplies the width and height and essentially what it does here is it assigns a default value of 1 to both the parameters. So if you don't provide any input parameters the answer would be 1. So let's quickly try this just for our practice. So we define the function and now I can call it. So now keep in mind this function needs two input values a value for width separated by a value of height. So here let's say 10 and here as well let's say 10. So my answer should be 100. The next thing I did was I ran the same function but this time I'm not going to define any values for input parameters of width and height and I expect an answer of 1 because both of them will default to a value of 1 here and here and then 1 multiplied by 1 should be equal to 1 as well. Now how would this function behave I, I gave only one value so let's say if I gave it 4. So what the function will do now it will assume that the first variable is 4 and default the second one to 1 and this is what I get now. So in this way you can assign a default value to a function to get a sp specific answer even when the input values are not being provided. In the next section we will start talking about strings and what are some of the most common methods that we can use on them. Now let's talk about strings and what are some of the common methods that we can apply specifically on strings when working with different string variables. So let's say now please explain what are string methods, how it is different from a function and give me a table of the popular methods in tabular formats. So essentially we are asking GPT to tell me what are methods that can be called on a string variable or data type and how it is different from calling a function. So in Python a string method is a built in function. So essentially a string method is also a function which is already built in Python which only works on a data type string when the object's data type is only string. So these are built in functions in the core Python library that only works on data types which are strings. String methods perform specific operators on strings such as formatting, searching or modifying the string. They are similar to the functions in that the key arguments and return a value but they are specifically designed to work on string objects. <coughs> and there is a difference between the way they are called on a string object using the dot notation while the function is called on a value or an object directly without using the dotted notation. And here's an example. So now it creates a string called my underscore string which is equal to hello world and then it says let's create a new string which is my string converted to uppercase. So here if you see it provides a table of different methods that we can call on the string. So upper converts the string to uppercase. So if I run this code what will happen is that hello world will turn into an uppercase hello world. So I guess I'll have to call the function to actually sorry the variable to actually see the output hello world. Next we can also use the function uh, the method capitalize and what capitalize will do here is I will just change this part. So what it will do is it will cap the first character of the sentence to capital. So here it converted hello the H in hello to capital whereas the world was untouched. So it's essentially only changing the first character on the string to make it capitalized. Now lower will convert everything to lower. Replace is fun because with replace you can convert a specific character into a different one. So let's say I want to convert let's use replace and the two arguments they have provided here on our function. So let's say I want to replace this. So now what this function essentially does is that it will take everywhere we have an L which is on these two positions and convert this with an X. So in my output now I'll see two 
x's instead of the l's and that's exactly what happened here the next one is strip which removes the white space from the beginning and end of the function so let's try this one separately so if i just call the function strip so right now i get the same output that i saw before but now let's add a few spaces here and a few spaces at the end and let's see how it interprets that so you see now although my string function has a lot of spaces in it the new string function after strip does not so to make it easier let's call the my string function first so that we know what we're talking about so you see now my string function has these spaces here but the new string function will not it removed those extra spaces because I applied the dot strip method on my string. So from my string to new string, the extra spaces has been removed. Split. Split splits the string into a list of substrings. So what it will do is it will split it into substrings based on the specific parser that we provide. So let's try split now. So let's go here and let's try split so now what do i expect so actually i don't need these extra white spaces i will remove them so now first i'm going to call in my string i would see the same function no change but now if i call the new string it's basically two different functions because by default split is using a space as the splitter so anywhere there is a space, it will convert it into two different strings. So let's say I add something else as well. Hi, a, hello. So now one, two, three, four, five. There are five different words separated by a space in the middle of them. So now I expect five things in my output. So this is essentially what split is doing. It's converting it into a series of strings uh, wherever there was a space in the middle now this is helpful when we're working with in data with full names for example if i have a name as john davis and i want to figure out what my first name is first underscore last name so now what my actually i should keep it in small and not confuse the program so first underscore last name now if i run this function what will happen is I have essentially broken down the function John Davis and the variable John Davis into two strings of first name and last name. Right. So this is this is how split could be a very powerful function when working with data analysis. The next is join and join is basically the reverse of split. Over here we split the cells based on a space in the middle by using join we can essentially join them back and decide how do we want to treat the space in the middle so let's say i use join um, so i'm going to just i just copy pasted the same function from here to join and then added my own variable in it which was the first underscore last name from the last output now the interesting thing about what this one is here which is the dash so when i do this it adds a dash in the middle when it's joining john and davis if I want to take this back into my original format of John space Davis, Davis, I can just leave a space and I'm back in my original format. One last thing I want to cover before we wrap up this lecture is that just like I provided a specific condition here in join, I can do that in split too. So for instance, let's say right now it's defaulting to a space essentially. So when you don't provide an input argument to split, it defaults to so remember we defined default values to the function variables in the same way this method of split has a default value of space so essentially when i run this function it creates john and davis as two different spaces let me copy this here so that we don't lose that part of the code when you're reviewing it now let's see i want to use something different i want to divide it by d so now what do i expect i expect this to be one string and then a is to be the second string because essentially we will break this string into two based on wherever we find a D. So let's see what happens. And this is exactly it. John plus space is here and Avis is here. So 
this is also a very powerful tool for instance if john davis was written like this we could have just used a dash feature and converted it into first name and last name separately so a lot of different ways we can use this built-in methods specifically on string types we will further explore how to apply these methods on the entire list of columns and rows in a data frame but right now I'm trying to walk you through the basics of applying these methods and functions on very small basic simple variables so that you grasp the knowledge of it and as we move on to the course and build up on that knowledge and work with bigger and bigger data frames having these this base understanding of how programming works will really help you in understanding how GPT is coding for you and debugging it. In the next lecture, we're going to start talking about how these string methods that we have just discovered changes the original variable or how do we make sure that we understand that what we are calling these functions and methods on are not actually this changing the original variable and being called on to new variables. So the next thing that I asked GPT was that when I apply this method, does it return a new string or it destroys my existing string? So what and I basically say to explain, explain to me what does this mean the method returns a new string and does the value of the original variable is modified when I use the method. So essentially what I'm asking is that if I use the function upper on a specific variable, let's say, Will it change that variable or it will become a new variable that it's changing? And this is what GPT said. When we say that a string method returns a new string, it means that the method creates a new string object as its opt output rather than modifying the original string object. So that's what's happening here. So when we call this object my string dot strip, it did not change the original string my string. It did something new and created a new object which we stored as new string. So essentially we, did, we are not changing the original value of my string rather we are creating a new object and assigning it to a new variable. For example my string is equal to hello new string is equal to my string dot upper will assign the value to new string and not to the original string which stays the same as hello with lowercase. Now let's say we want to do the other thing if we want to modify the original string object that they are called on rather than creating a new string object with desired changes so the value of the original variable is not modified when you're using a string method if you want to modify the original string object you can assign the output of the string method back to the original variable so now what it's doing is essentially instead of assigning the output to new string it's assigning the output to my string, which is the same variable. And what this does is it's actually changing the original value of variable of my string right now. So let's say you inputted some data and you are 100% sure that you want to use only uppercase letters throughout the script and whatever the output you're working with. You can go in and change the original variables that were uh, in the input data frame by assigning them a new value. So that's what I'm trying to show you here that if you want, you can work with a new variable or you can modify the existing variable. So in this case, if I run this here, actually, let me run my string first without changing it. So right now the my string will be hello. Now, if I run my string after changing it to upper, it will be hello so the same variable my string has been modified now it's not the same we have completely changed its value and this change is permanent so based on your use case you can either assign to a new variable or to an existing variable depending on how you want to use the function now i called in the same prompt again where I asked for what are the most commonly used string methods and I also added it asked it to include a few more that I thought which were missing in the previous response we got here. So I specifically told it to add begins with end with and contains. So these are some of the functions that are still very important which provide a boolean answer. So for instance here you see it's using a string hello and then calling a function that says starts with and then the value of the starts with function 
is H. So does hello starts with H. If the answer is true, it will give true. So instead, if this was Z, hello does not start with a Z, the answer would have been false. So very simple quick test. We can just copy paste this here and we expect a true answer. Unterminated string literal. Okay, so this is because I forgot to add this inverted commas here. So it's true. Now if I change this to Z, it's going to be false. If I change this to capital H, it's still going to be false because it's different than small h and python is case sensitive. Same thing is with ends. We can check if it ends with O, the answer will be true. We can ch check if it contains something. So for instance, hello contains an L, the answer will be true. I, the answer should be false. L, L should be true, I should be false. The next thing I want to talk about now is the in method specifically. We're calling in this specific method called in. So in Python, the in operator is used to check if a value is present in a sequence or character, such as a string list, tuple or dictionary. It can be applied to different types of data types. It could be a string, it could be applied to list or a dictionary. The operator returns a Boolean value. Remember, if you remember Boolean value means either a yes or a no answer in the form of true or false, depending on the, whether the value is found in the sequence or not. So in essentially allows you to check if something is present within your data set. If yes, it will give you an answer of true. If not, it will give you an answer of false. Here are some examples of using in operator with different types of sequences. So first example it gives is my string is equal to hello. H in my string, the answer should be true. Z in my string, the answer should be false. My list, one, two, three, four, five. Is three in the list? Yes, three is in the list. The answer is true. Is six in the list? No, six is not in the list. I expect an answer of false. Now, this was an example on a string where it was parsing through each character of the string to figure out if it, that specific character is there, in this case, H. This was an example of a number list. One, two, three, four, five. This is a list of integers and it's checking if a specific integer is present in the list or not. Now this is example of a dictionary. So which essentially what was dictionary? If you remember, it was a value key pair. I gave an example of a restaurant menu at that time that okay, every restaurant menu item will have a price assigned to it. So name and price is a value key pair. Here are also value key pairs. Name is Alice, that's a value key pair age is 30 that's a value key pair city is new york that's a value key pair now print age in my dictionary is age in my dictionary the answer is true is gender in my dictionary no the answer is false so now we can go and essentially run all of these here by just copying it and see if we get the same answers so true false true false true false true false true false true false so in this way you can use the in function to check if something is in the data set or not and we can later right now we're only working in small list and variables to get you a brief idea and a flavor of how these built-in functions work later we will apply these functions on large data sets on entire columns to see if specific values are available in entire columns or not there is also a built-in function called not in which works in exactly the opposite way as in function. So now the answers will be opposite. So Z is not in my string. The answer becomes true because yes, that's true. Z is not. H is. So when you say H is not in my string, the answer becomes false. Similarly, 6 is not in my list now becomes true. And 3 is not in my list becomes false because 3 is already there and 6 is not. And same thing here because gender is not in my value key pairs of the dictionary i will get a true answer because yes it is not in my dictionary and for age i will get a false because it is so different use cases based on your use case you can use either the in function or the not in function to check if a specific character value or word or is available in a specific data set the next thing what we're going to cover in the next lecture is start talking about lists and how can we work along them. Now let's talk about the next data type which is lists.
what are they example of number string and boolean list common methods on list in tabular format including dot append because it kept missing dot append so i thought i would specifically ask it to include the dot append method as well in python a list is a collection of values that can be of any data type such as numbers strings or booleans a list is created by enclosing a comma separated sequence of values inside square brackets so we start with square brackets and then we can have a list of values within them if you're working with string each string will be in inverted commas because as we have learned before that in anything between inverted commas will be a string data type here are a few examples so this is a number string this is a sorry uh, this is a list of numbers this is a list of strings and this is a list of boolean which is essentially the value of true and false once a list is created you can access its values using index starting from zero like this so you have five different elements in this list one two three four five now i can call in a specific value which is based on a specific location in this list so for instance here keep in mind in python any numerical or text list will start with a value of 0 and not 1. So the value for the starting element is always 0. We will further cover this in the next lecture just to give you a basic idea. This 1 corresponds to the value of 0. This is 1, 2, 3 and 4. So instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, the index value of this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's how Python remembers it that the value on 0 is 1, the value on 2 is 3. Same situation here, apple is 0, banana is 1, cherry is 2 and date is 3. So here if I call in 1, my answer will be banana. And same thing here for 2, so this is 0, 1, 2, my second value based on this index is true. So in this way, we can not only create list, but we can slice the list and filter out specific values. It's just like using a filter fun button in Excel. And we can filter out by the relevant position in, this, in the list. Starting from the first position is always called the zero position. So we, I, now we can go run this code and this is essentially what we'll get. So the first value is one, the second value is three, the third value is banana and the last value is true based on how they're being indexed. So if I want to be more clear about this, let me add a comment here. Indexed value starts with zero. So essentially now your one corresponds to, so if I'm looking at the indexed values for my underscore numbers, are equal to 0, 1, sorry, I forgot the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So now 0 corresponds to 1, 2 corresponds to 1 here, 3 corresponds to 2, and then in the same way, the fourth index value corresponds to 5. Same thing here, apple is 0, banana is 1, cherry is 2, and date is 3. Now, what are the common methods that we can use on lists? Append adds an element to the end of the list. So if I use dot append function to a list, it will add that element at the end of my list. So my list name here is my numbers. So if I do my numbers dot append, and then I call this function my underscore numbers, so I can either call this by writing print before it or if this is the only function that I'm printing then as we discussed before um, Py uh, Python is capable of understanding that I want to see the output for the last variable in this cell so it gives me the list so now you see the value of this function initially was one two three four five now because we added the dot append command with six a value of six has been added so essentially this is what append does it adds a value at the end of the list extend adds element from another list to the end of the current list so let's say we have another list called five six seven eight add six seven eight to my list 
So now what this function will do is I'm going to change the variable name first to the same variable working with and then let's call the function. So now what it will do is it will add 6, 7, 8 to the same lift. So 6 already exists here. So 6, 7, 8 will be added after the 6. So now we have two 6s because first we started with this function 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we added a 6 to it and then we are adding 6, 7, 8 again. So now we ended up with two 6 here. Insert. Inserts an element in a specific position in the list. So now it's saying my insert my list dot insert one comma apple so first let me change the variable name back to the variable we're working with so now what it's going to do is one is the position at which it is adding the value so what is one one is this position keep in mind we started with zero so we are working with this position so now it's adding a value of apple at position one so let's call this function my underscore number sorry variable and you see now I have two apples here because I ran this function twice. So let's go again. So you see now I ran those functions again from the top all the variables got reset and then because apple was added only once it was it got added in the first one index position which is essentially the second value in my list and it pushed the rest of the values forward. Similarly, we can use the remove function to remove a value from the list. So what this function will do is it removes the first occurrence of three from my list. So let's say if my list has a value of three, it will remove the first occurrence of the value of three. If there are multiple values, we'll have to run it multiple times because it's only working based on the first occurrence of the function. So let's say I have my remove function here um, and I want to remove this value of apple so keep in mind I've intentionally ran this function twice to show you that there are two values of apple now I'm going to pass in the parameter apple here and see what happens what I expect is that one of the two apple values will be removed which is essentially the first one here and that's exactly what happened now if we take it back from the top so here we defined a list called one two three four five here we appended 6 to it. Now we are going to add 6, 7, 8 to it. Now we are going to insert apple at position 1, which is essentially second position in the table based on our indexing. And now we are going to remove apple, so I should go back to my this string. And that's what I got. So in this way, there are different functions that you can use on the list. You can also sort list in descending or ascending orders. The default sort is ascending and then it will sort the list by ascending order. You can reverse the order of the list. Then the first element will be shown last and the last element should be shown first. So try out these functions, create a few lists, ask ChatGPT to create a random list for you for names, numbers and try playing around with them on different functions. Ask ChatGPT to elaborate on any one of these commands. For instance, you can say, can you help me understand the sort feature and how different ways of sort are available within Python for me to work with? And it will give you a list of different ways you can sort, such as by ascending or descending, so on and so forth. And in this way, you will be able to better understand and grasp the power of Python and its built-in function on lists. The next thing I want to quickly touch is the in function, which can be applied on the list as well just like we applied it on string. So here we have a list of one, two, three, four, five. Is three in the list? The answer will be true. If six in the list, the answer will be false because it doesn't exist. Next, does capitalization matters when using in function? Please explain by an example. So like we have discussed before, uh, Python is case sensitive. So capitalization does matter, which means that will only return to if the output if the expected capitalization is matched. So for instance, let's take this example, my string hello world, and actually run this and see which ones are true and false. So when we did hello in my string, it says true because yes, hello is there. When we change the H to lowercase, it says false. World, it says true. When we change the world's W to lowercase, it says false as expected because it's case sensitive the in function is looking for an exact match including 
capitalization or not. So it's saying in case you have list that you want to use in on and they could be in different case cases you can essentially run a string method on the list and convert everything into lowercase or uppercase and then apply the in method to make sure that you get a standard answer across the board while searching through the list in the next lecture we're going to further discuss about index positioning that we quickly covered in the pre in this lecture as well that the index starts with zero and how does python indexing works okay now in this lecture let's talk about index position and size slicing specifically on a string and if you understand the concept on a string it would be very easy to understand the concept when we start working with series and data frames because essentially it's the same idea being applied to different data types explain index positioning and how it works in python with a basic example in python each character in a string has a unique index position starting from zero for the first character one for the second character and so on so h is zero e is one l is two the second l is three and o is four index positions are used to access individual characters or substrings within a string so if i want to call in e i can essentially say my string value at one and the output will be e here's an example that demonstrate index positioning in python so zero is h one is e 7 is w how did it get to 7 1 2 sorry 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 the blank space and then 7 is w and then 12 will correspond to d in this example we use index positions to access individual characters in my string variable the first print statement accesses the character 0 index which is h the second one accesses the one at 1 which is e the third one at 7 which is w and the fourth print statement accesses the character at the 12th position which is d the most important thing to note here is that the first value always corresponds to 0 and not 1 which is what we have normally studied and uh, unconsciously uh, think about because of working with excel uh, that the first value should be 1 but keep in mind in python it's always 0 Note that if you try to access an index position that is outside the range of the index, that is a negative index or an index greater than or equal to the length of the index, you will get an index error. Okay. So what it's saying is, let's try this one out. So let's say, okay, I didn't get copied correctly. Let's copy this here, paste this here. I run this and this is what I get. So now let's say if I run this, on something that doesn't exist so 1000 so i know the length of this of this index cannot be 1000 right so this should give me an error and that's exactly what happened string index out of range so this is a very common error index error whenever you see this error this means you're trying to get to something that does not exist in the input frame the thousandth index position does not exist in hello world so that's why it's giving an error now there are other ways of indexing as well. In addition to accessing individual characters, you can also use slicing to extract a substring. So more than one specific value from this, we can extract specific sequence of characters as a whole as well. So for instance, slicing allows you to specify a range of index positions to extract as a substring. Here's an example to demonstrate this. So let's copy this and let's see what this one is doing. So now we have hello, comma, space, world with an exclamation mark. Now first it goes from 0 to 5 and prints hello. So let's see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah. So the way this works is the first value is inclusive, but the last value is not. Keep this in mind. First value is inclusive last value is not so essentially what it's doing it it's giving you everything between 0 to 4 inclusive in the same way let's go from 7 to 12 so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so 7 is this one so it starts from w 7 
8, 9, 10, 11. So exclamation mark will not be included because the last value is not included. So that's how you can slice the index into specific values. What if I want to extract only RLD? How do I do that? So let's see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So O is 8, 9, 10. I don't want the 11th value, so I want 8, 9, 10. So I can update this to starting with 8 and I want up to 10, but the last value is non-inclusive. So I will go to 11 so that I get 8, 9 and 10 values out of this. And I got my ORL, which I was trying to extract from this string this time. So basically remember this, your first value is where you will want to start with the subset. Then you sub give a semicolon in the middle and then you provide the ending value, making sure that the ending value will not be included in the substring. So this is what it explains here that we use slicing to extract substrings from my string. The first print statement extracts the substring from index 0 to index 4, which is hello. The second print statement extracts the substring from 7 to 11, which is world. Note that the first string is inclusive and the second is exclusive, which means that the character at the second index is not included in the substring. You can also use negative index positions in slicing to count for the end of the string. For example, my string minus one refers to the last character of the string. So this is what I asked GPT to explain next. Now let's talk about negative values on indexing. So when you're talking about negative values on indexing, this means that this value becomes minus one now. So my last value, which is exclamation mark, would refer to minus one. D will be minus two. In the same way, the space character is minus seven because we're starting from here, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, minus six, and essentially minus seven. And H becomes minus 12 from zero. When we're working with reverse indexing, Make sure that you remember that we are starting with minus 1 now, not 0. 0 still refers to H. Now let's talk about leaving starting and ending points blank in a few examples. So just the way how we are extracting subset of values from a string by using square brackets and assigning the start and end value within the square brackets separated by a semicolon or a colon. Now we are doing the same thing but with more different advanced parameters so essentially in python you can use slicing to extract a substring from a string or a sublist from a list by specifying the starting and ending indices if you leave the starting or ending index blank in a slice it is assumed to be the beginning or end of the sequence respectively so what python is saying now is that if you give me a blank string with just a colon in the middle I will extract everything out from it for you. Okay, so here is just a colon with no starting value or ending value. In the next one, it adds a starting value but no ending value and the starting value is 1. 1 is E. H corresponds to 0 so it will start with E but we haven't given an ending value here so it will go all the way to the end and that's what our answer is hello world without the h now it's showing the other way around it's saying i'm not giving a starting value okay so that means my starting value will default to zero it starts with an h and it ends with a three with three being exclusive so one zero one two three so three is this l so everything before this l should be printed which is h e l and that's what my output comes out to be this time now let's try the same thing on this my list of numbers when we did just the colon with no starting and ending values, we got everything. When we started from 2 and went all the way to the end by providing a blank value for the end, 2 means 0, 1, 2. So I should get 3, 4, 5. And that's what I got. And then in the same way, we can give an empty starting value but assign an ending value to 3. So it will go from 0, 1, 2 to 3. 3 is not included, so we get 1, 2, 3. And we can run this code to see that's exactly what we get here. Hello world, hello world, hell, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, everything, the last three values, the first three values. 
So in this way, slicing could be a very powerful tool when you're trying to extract information starting from a specific point. For instance, you have a string in which the first two characters are wrong, are always wrong. So you know that, okay, I can skip the first two characters by starting from, let's say, position one and not assign an end position. So it will catch everything and just omit the first two characters in that string. And we can essentially apply the same concept to entire columns and rows of the data set later when we work around uh, with data frames. So this gives you a very powerful tool to, to manipulate data sets later in the course. What if I run a query with value that goes beyond the list of the index? For instance, on my list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I run my list from 0 to 100. Okay. So essentially what I did was I asked GPT that, okay, I have a list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now what if I run it from 0 to 100? So I know 0 is 1, but it only goes to the index value of 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So what if I assign an index value that ends with 100? What will GPT do? So now GPT will not create an error. Rather, what it will do is it would output everything in the list because this goes beyond our list. So you will get the output of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in this case. And not an error which happened when we did, when we tried extracting a specific value from an index that doesn't exist from 13 and 13 doesn't exist, it gives us an error. But now if I do this similar thing by slicing an index up to a value that is beyond the end of the index uh, of the list, it will still be able to give me an answer and it will give me everything that is in the list prior to that index value and that's what we got here. So this could essentially be any large number. It will keep giving me the same answer because those are the values that already exist here. That's it for the list. I hope this was beneficial for you to understand how we can manipulate list, extract different arguments within the list. We can also apply different operators on the list. So if you want, you can ask GPT next that, okay, what if I want to do multiply all of the numbers in the list by two or by five? How would that work? What if I want to divide them by five? How would that work? So another exercise for you to try on to better understand how to make the best use of GPT when working with Python. The idea is not to write the code yourself, but to understand enough to be able to give precise instructions to chat GPT so it can write the code for you. That's it for the list section and in the next one we're going to start talking about dictionaries. In this lecture we'll explore a new data type that we have briefly touched before which is of dictionary and this is also a really powerful data type that can help us out when we're working with large data frames in our data analysis work. So I asked GTP let's talk about dictionary data type next, explain to me what it is, give me an example dictionary of a small Italian food menu using this dictionary data type. In Python, a dictionary is a collection of key value pairs. Like we discussed before, there is a value, there is a key and then each key is assigned a value. And these two are counted as one in terms of how the, uh, the, the different variables are stored within the dictionary, where each key is associated, associated with its corresponding value. Dictionaries are unordered, meaning that the items in a dictionary do not have to be in a specific order. So here it created a menu dictionary for me where there is a name of the product and the price of the product. Now if you notice here that the, the order of the key value pair does not matter. Tiramisu 4.99 could have been the first value and pizza could have been the last value. That's not something that makes a difference in terms of dictionary whereas in list the order matters a lot. Um, and that's one of the key distinctions here. Plus, if you look at the key value pair, that's the only thing that we're concerned about here, that the value of pizza is 10.99 and that cannot be the value of the pasta because that's 8.99. So that's how the dictionaries are structured. In this example, the dictionary menu has four key value pairs for where each key is a string representing a dish on the menu. Each value is a float representing the price of the dish. So this is a string and there is the corresponding float value for it. To access the value associated with the key in a dictionary, you can use the key in square brackets like so. So now if I want to see what the price of pizza is, I can do menu, square brackets and the key of that specific value. So I can say pizza, it will give me the value of 10.99. I can say tiramisu, it will give me the value of 4.99. So let's quickly copy this code and run this as well. So now here I've defined my list. 
I won't see an output because I'm not asking for it. But if I say menu specifically, now it's going to print my list here for me. Now we want to get a specific value out of it. Let's say we want the value of pizza. So let's copy this one, paste it here. And then you see the first one I asked for was the value of pizza. It gave me 10.99, which is right. And then tiramisu, which was 4.99, which is also right. Explain the len on a dictionary data type and what it represents. So before we run this function, before we exp I explain this function, I want to quickly show what it means. So if I run len on menu, and menu is the name of the dictionary that we have defined here, right? So let's see what we get. We get five. Why is this five? One, two, three, four, five. So essentially in the menu dictionary, there are 10 items. There's pizza, it's price, pasta, price, lasagna, price. So there are five value key pairs and each row has two values. But when we're calculating the length of a dictionary, it will calculate count one key value pair as one. So that means pizza and 10.99 is one key value pair and is counted as one. So essentially you have five rows in this data set and that's why your length is five. If I add a six one here saying, let's say pizza cheese and I gave it a price of 100.90 and I run this function again. Oh, sorry, I forgot a comma here. And then again, and then now if I check the length, the length will increase by one to six. So essentially keep this in mind in a dictionary value key pair is considered as one length and not two. Now we can also use the in and not in function on the same menu in dictionary. We can say is pizza in menu, is spaghetti in menu, is salad not in menu, is lasagna not in menu. We can run these functions quickly. We have tried these in and not in functions in different um, um, previous data types as well. So let's quickly go through them. So when I do pizza in menu, I should get a true, which is right because pizza is here. If I do spaghetti in menu, I should get a false because spaghetti is not defined here. Now, what if I do salad is not in menu, I should get a true because sal salad is actually not in our menu. So that's a true statement. Is lasagna not in menu? Lasagna is already in the menu, so I should get a false. So in this way, not in an in function can be also be used to see if a specific key appears in our dictionary. So we can, so just a quick recap, value key pairs are counted as one. If you want to see a specific value, you can call it using square brackets. And if you want to see if something is present in the list, you can just use the in and not in function based on what type of Boolean commands you're looking for. One more thing to note is that how the way the dictionary is defined is by these squirrely brackets. I don't think syntax matters that much because ChatGPT is smart enough to understand that and it will write the syntax for you. But to give you the basics, this is how you define that you're creating a dictionary by calling in these squirrely brackets. The next thing I want to cover is that how do I change a specific value in the string? So let's say I want to change the price of pasta to 12.99. How do I do that? So I asked GPT, could you help me understand how do I update a specific value in dictionary? For example, I want to update the price of pasta in the dictionary above. So this is what it said. It said, call in the menu dictionary, use square brackets and then call the pasta and then make it equal to the new price that you want to assign it to, update the price of pasta to 9.99. Very simple, right? In this example, we use the square bracket notation to access the value associated with the key pasta. And then we assign a new value of 9.99 to that key. The result is the price of the pasta is updated to 9.99 in the menu dictionary. Note that if you try to update the value of a key that does not already exist in the dictionary, Python will add a new key value pair to the dictionary with the specified key value. Okay, this is something we'll cover next. But for now, this is what it's telling us to do. So I can go here, write this code. I have my menu, I have pasta, and the current price is 8.99. I 
I have changed it to 9.99. Now let's call in our dictionary again and see has the price of the pasta been updated or not. Menu is not defined. And this is the mistake of using capital M. So now you see the value of the pasta has updated to 9.99 from 8.99 and we have modified our existing script, ex existing dictionary by assigning a new value to an existing element in it. Next thing, let's see how do we add a new value key pair completely to the dictionary, which we believe we did here. I added a new value here of pizza cheese of 100, which got reflected here. But now I'm doing to do this without calling in, changing the entire function, but rather add just one more value to it. So how do we do that? Okay, now let's add a new menu item in the dictionary called Alfredo Pasta and price it as 9.99. This is going to be the most expensive menu on our item on the menu now. To add a new item to a dictionary, you can simply create a new key value pair by assigning a value to a new key. Okay, here's an example on how to add a new column to Alfredo Pasta. And essentially it takes the same menu and then it adds this line of code. So it's if you look at it, it's exactly the same line of code as this one. It takes a menu, it assigns a new key and assigns it a price. If this key is already available in the menu, which is the case here, the pasta is already available. The price of that associated with that key gets updated. If this key is does not exist in our original menu dictionary, then it will be added as a new value key pair into our dictionary. So let's call this function menu and let's see what we get. So now you have Alfredo pasta added to the bottom. So in this way you can append a dictionary and add more values in it if you want to by using a very basic function like this. Does the order matter in dictionary? I slightly covered it before, but let's go into it in more detail. In Python, dictionaries are unordered collections, meaning that the order of the key value pair in a dictionary is not guaranteed. The keys and values in a dictionary are stored in an unordered manner, and the order can change each time you iterate over the dictionary or perform other operations on it. Okay. For example, if you print the menu dictionary multiple times, you may see that the key value pairs are printed in different order each time. Okay. We print the menu dictionary twice and we can see that the order of the value key pairs is different. So it's essentially saying that the order does not matter. What matters is which pair corresponds to which value. And here pizza corresponds to 10.99. So even if we change the order, what does not change is the key value pair. And that's the only thing we care about here in this scenario. How do I check if specific values exist in a dictionary? For example, I want to know if there is any dish priced at 9.99. So previously, we used the in function to see if a specific key exists or not here. So what we were doing it, we were looking at the keys, which are these values on the left hand side. And these are our values corresponding to that key. So you were going through the keys to see if those exist in the dish, uh, if the value exists for those specific keys. Now, can we do the same thing for our values, which are the prices? So is there a key? that corresponds to the value of 10.99. Can I figure that out? And that's essentially what it's trying to do here with this function. Let's run it and try and decipher what it's trying to do here. So now this also introduced the if and else function here, which we'll cover shortly. So what essentially if and else function do here, it says that there's a condition. If 19.99 is in menu dot values, what are, what is menu? This is menu. What are the values in menu? These are the values on menu, which is are on the right side of the colon. And these are the keys, which are on the left side of the colon. So it's going through these values on the right side and trying to figure out if 19.99 exists. And if it does, it will say yes, otherwise it wouldn't. So there is a dish priced at 19.99 in the menu. And that's what we got here. A very simple code to help us understand if a specific value exists in the dictionary or not. Now, I, now let's try and understand what if and else does. So here, GPT used a new 
function that we haven't seen before if and else so let's try and understand what it's doing here in everyday language if and else are words that are used that we use to express a condition and its consequence if x happens do this if not do something else for example we might say if it rains today i will bring an umbrella otherwise i will not bring an umbrella so now bringing an umbrella is conditioned to raining depending on whether it rains or not i will decide whether i'm bringing my umbrella or not right so in programming if and else are used to control the flow of a program based on a condition in other words if a certain condition is true the program will execute one block of code and if the condition is false the program will execute a different block of code so this is what's happening here we are going to give it a conditional argument and see if the argument is true then do something if it's not true then else do something else and now it's giving us a very basic example it's saying x is equal to 10 okay if x is greater than 5 print x is greater than 5 else print x is less than or equal to 5 so if I copy this code and run it quickly here, you will see that x is greater than 5 because we know that x is actually greater than 5. Now if I do 4, then it would change. So essentially what it's doing is it takes x and checks if it's greater than 5. If the value is true, it prints this. If the value is false, it prints this. So that's a very basic definition of how if function works in Python. Now let's discuss for loops. Uh, as the last section or the last lecture in, in this Python crash course. So I asked GPT a very basic command saying, now let's briefly discuss for loop. For beginners, give a basic example on menu dictionary using loop to find price of the first item equal to 8199. So essentially what I'm asking it to do is to go through each row in my dictionary and figure out where is the price equal to 8199. And when you find that, give me the name of that food item. So first, let's see what for loops are. It's a programming construct that allows you to iterate over a collection of items. So here we have a collection of items and we want to go through them one by one to figure out where is the value of 8.99 true and print out that value. So essentially, that's what for loop will allow us to do to look at each value one by one. In Python, you can use a for loop to iterate over the key value pairs in a dictionary and perform operations on each key value pair. Here's an example on how to use for loop to find the price of an item which is equal to 8.99. Here's our dictionary. So it use the, uses the item methods where it says menu.items is referring to one row. And then in each one, it says there is a price, which is this numerical value. And when price is equal to 8.99, I want to see the price of the item. And item refers to the name of the dish. So let's try and get GPT to be more descriptive. Please explain this code in detail to a non-programmer. Sure, here's an explanation of each line of the code. So the first line for item price in menu dot items, the line of code starts a for loop. Okay, we know that through for. That will iterate over the key value pairs in menu. What is menu? Menu is the name of our dictionary here. The items method returns a list of key value pair pairs in the dictionary and we use two variables item and price to unpack each key value pair in the list as we iterate over it. So it's saying that we are calling an item method which corresponds to each key value pair in the dictionary and we are calling two different things for the two different things available in the dictionary. We are calling it item and price. So my pizza becomes item and 10.99 becomes price. So that's how it did this for item price in menu dot items. It's saying there are these two things available in menu dot items in each row. Now, how did it define it? The first one became item and the second one became price. So the first one became item and the second one became price. So anytime it says price now, it's referring to this part of this key value pair and when it says item, it's referring to the key of the value pair, which is the item. What does it do next? So now the line of the code starts for a for loop. Okay, it goes through each item and price. The line of the code uses an if function and it says if the price is equal to 8.99 or not. 
if it is true print the function to print a message indicating the price of the item and it uses the item variable here to get its price we use a f string to insert the value of the item variable into the message this line of code uses the break statement to exit for loop early once we have found the first item with the price of 8.99 there is no need to continue over the rest of the items in the menu dictionary because i said i only want to find the first one so overall this program uses a for loop to iterate over the key value pairs in menu dictionary and then checks if the price of each item is equal to 8.99 now here the initial command that i used was that using loop to find the price of the first item equal to 8.99 what if i want to find all the items that correspond to a specific price so let's say i call two of these items at the same price of 8.99 and now i want to see all the items where the price is 8.99 can you write the code using for loop to find all the items with the price of 8.99 okay so now in this example we use a for loop to iterate over the key value pairs in the menu dictionary using the item method we check if the price is equal to 8.99 using an if statement if the price is equal to 8.99 we print a message indicating the price of the item this will print the price of all items in the menu dictionary that have a price of 8.99 so now the only difference that it did was it that it stopped the break command so that you can iterate through all the pairs even if the price is available so before what the code was doing that when it hit pasta 8.99 it saw the break command here and that was an indication to the code that stopped breaking but now we have removed the break command so it will iterate through each and every pair up to the last pair and here the price is also 8.99 so we should see pasta and spaghetti as the answer of this one so I've copy pasted that specific part of the code here. Now if I go back and run the previous command, this one gives me the price of pasta at 8.99. And now if I run it again, I have two different values available, both pasta and caprici salad as expected, because now we are not using the break command in this part of the code. Here I did the same thing. I just copy pasted the entire code here. And I ran it and now I have pasta and spaghetti because those are the two with the price of 8.99 here. So that's it for for loop. I hope this was helpful for you uh, as a crash course into Python and its basic functions and variables and data types. In the next lecture, we're going to start working specifically with the pandas library starting with the series. So welcome to the next section in the course and now we're going to specifically start talking about pandas library so to give you a quick recap so far what we have done is first of all we went through anaconda how to install it on our pcs set up the environment work with the terminal then we worked a little bit on the jupyter notebook some of the main features of the notebook and how to best utilize it i also covered google colab in a short crash course to give you an idea at that if you don't want to go through the effort of coding of downloading all the softwares on your pc right now and you just want to start coding you can use a cloud version of a python console such as a google colab to start working from there after that we did a python crash course in which i walked you through some of the main features and functions and parameters that you need to be aware of before we can start specifically working with data analysis now in the next two sections we're going to specifically cover pandas library and the two sections will be first on series and then on data frame what's a series so series is in very simple terms it's just one column of excel or data frame what's a, a data frame data frame is think of it like an entire sheet of excel so these are the next two sections and then we'll talk about visualizations we'll we will introduce other libraries such as matplotlib that can help us um, uh, make great visualizations from the data that we analyzed from pandas and then we'll walk on to the courses so now let's dive into the series start learning about them what are the most popular features and functions that we can use with series and fast track our work and productivity okay so now let's start talking about what are series in pandas specifically and how to best use them 
first thing I did here in the new, I started with a new tab. I called it Series in Pandas. Actually, I asked GPT to name the tab as Series in Pandas. And it actually took me five attempts to do that. First, I had to make sure that it's not uh, reading any previous instructions. Although it was a new tab, it kept giving me code for Jupyter to write Series in Pandas as the title of the notebook instead of naming the tab here in GPT. Secondly, I had to add square brackets here for it to understand that, okay, this is the name I want for the tab. Otherwise, it kept getting infused in what should be the name be. Sometimes it called it series, sometimes it called it pandas. So, and this is something mentioned in API doc, in the documentation by OpenAI. They say that if you want to specify a title in your prompt, include it in, in brackets. So now that I named the tab, I gave it a very basic prompt on what are series in pandas and Python, explain to a non-coder who understands Excel. So throughout this section, I'm going to try and make analogies with Excel because I believe uh, most of us are aware of how to use Excel in at least in terms of basic data uh, manipulation and formatting. So it might be easier for you to understand and grasp the different concepts within Python by making an analogy with Excel. So in simple terms, a series in pandas is a one dimensional array. So it's a one dimensional array that can hold any data type such as numbers, strings or days, similar to an column in an Excel spreadsheet. It allows you to perform various tasks such as filtering, sorting, mathematical operations, and it's useful for manipulating data in Python. Overall, it's a very powerful tool, especially when working with large data sets. So I have this data set open over here, which is essentially a data of Udemy instructors. This is the data that I got from Kaggle, and we're going to build up on this in one of our projects as well. But I just wanted to show you quickly on what a series mean in terms of a basic data set. So like GPT said, series is a one dimensional array. So what does that mean? Any one column of this data set could be a series. So this is a series of IDs. This is a series of titles. This is a series of names. When I combine a couple of them together, that becomes a data frame, which we covered in the next section. Now a series could hold different types of values. So if I look at this B column, this is a series of names so essentially a series of strings because each one is a text value here on the other hand this is a series of numbers now if i ignore the first value and make it non-decimal now this becomes a series of integers but if the first value is float then that means that this is a series of floats so in this way we can hold different types of data sets into a series in pandas now let's talk about series index and explain similarity and difference to column in Excel. So index is something that we have discovered in our Python crash course as well, where if you if, uh, quickly recall uh, a list index or any index starts with a value of zero instead of one. And that's how we did all the counting when we were counting the character numbers in hello, that H was in zero position and not in one position. So it's going to reiterate to that same point here. Like a column and index in Excel, a series index in Pandas provides a way to label and reference the data. Both allow you to perform operations on the data based on the label or the index value. They can both contain strings, numbers, or data. Differences. Unlike a column in Excel, a series index is not restricted to a single data type. It can have mixed data types such as integer strings and also be non-unique. In Excel, a column is typically identified by a letter, while in Pandas, a series index can be a string integer or even a tuple or multiple values. A series index can be used to perform advanced operations in pandas such as reindexing, grouping, and merging as well. So now if you see, if you look at column B as our series, so the first value in the series starts at the value of 2. So A2 is how Excel reads this. So the index value of Jose Portila is 2. Now in if we look at an equivalent in Python, this will always be starting at a value of 0 and not a value of 2. If I add another row here, now the starting index value is actually 3. So if I want to look at Jose Portilla, I'm looking at B3 now. So index becomes 3. But if you're looking with, if you're working specifically with pandas and Python, we, would, we should always remember that the starting value of a series will always be 0. So that's the crust of it that is trying to explain here. It's saying that you can do a lot of different tasks on it, multiply, divide, which is also something we can do here in Excel. So if you want to apply something on the entire series, I can do it. 
here I can multiply everything by 2 and then if I drag this down then all my columns are getting multiplied by 2 here now so I can apply this process on an integer or a float series similarly I can do a lot of different task here on a text series for instance I can check its length of each one right and this tells me okay there are 13 characters here if I want I can filter by a specific name let's search if there is any John here yep so anything that contains John has been filtered out so all these different operations that we quickly performed here in Excel on a specific series of ID and title can also be performed in a Python uh, pandas series and that's what we're going to explore in this lecture so to start with let's create a list of popular ice cream flavors and then convert that list into a series okay so what it did was it started with import pandas as pd as always like we did in the previous section and then it defined a series of ice cream flavors of vanilla chocolate strawberry mint chocolate chip and peter pecan and if you recall these are in inverted commas so that means this is a text value so this is a string in inverted commas so i am create essentially ice cream flavors is a list of strings now to convert the list to a panda series it's used a pd dot series function so it used pd to call this pandas and said convert into series whatever is inside the brackets which is the ice cream flavors in this case so let's try and copy this code and run it here so first thing I did was I ran the first part of the code which is still here and I called this ice cream flavors function to see what's inside so this is exactly what I expected that it copied the ice cream flavors here in a row because this is an array or a list right now now let's see let's try and convert this into a panda data series which essentially means a column in Excel right so now I passed in the second part of the code which was convert this into a series and then print the series so it converted it into the series first and then it printed the series so now here's your series with an index value assigned to it to its each value just like you would expect in an excel column and this is what i've shown you here so you see there's an index value of zero assigned to vanilla four to butter pecan this is the name of the series and now this is an excel format slightly different from excel because now you have an index value assigned to it and this one will always be zero this one will always be three in the next lecture we're going to start talking about number series so in the previous lecture we discuss we went through a series of strings now in this lecture let's talk about series of numbers and dictionaries quickly so I started by saying okay now let's create a series of numbers 5 10 15 25 30 which are essentially multiples of 5 and then convert it into a series as well okay so it did the same thing it first created a series of numbers a list of numbers and then it called the same function of pd dot series to convert it into a series and now if I copy paste this here I would expect a similar outcome where my zero index has the value 5 and my last value is associated with the 30 so six values six values of index starting from 0 to 5 very simple very basic so we create a python list of numbers use the pd dot series function from pandas to convert the list into a series and then print the resulting series to the console the output shows index values of each element in the series and the corresponding number the data type indicates that the type of the series and integer so here you see that it's saying int 64 which means that this is a series of integers here it says data type is object which means this is a series of strings because the data type for strings will always be object now let's create an italian menu dictionary so if you recall this is the same italian menu that we were talking about before in the previous section when we were working with series so now we're going to take the same menu and convert it from a dictionary into a series and let's see how python interprets that with index as dish name and value as price so so far what we have seen here is that index value this 0 to 5 is a numerical value that has been assigned by python on its own in a default manner now i'm changing it now i'm saying i want my dish name to be my index and the value to be price so what i'm expecting is that instead of zero it will say pizza 
and instead of 5 it's going to tell me the price of the pizza so let's try and do that so this is what GPT did first it imported pandas as expected and then it created a dictionary of Italian menu and now let's see what's there in the dictionary so spaghetti is 12.99 pizza is 14.99 lasagna is 16.99 tiramisu and bruschetta is 6.99 and then it took the exact same function as before. You see pd.series, pd.series, and then it passed in a parameter in parentheses of the menu which it created, and that gave you the series. So now let's see how the series is different from the ones we have created before. So now if I run this, so you see, now instead of seeing the index value of zero, we're seeing an index value of spaghetti. So this is the part where Python gets really powerful. In Excel, we were restricted to a number value for our indexing. Your cell can always be A1, B1, B3, B1000. It will have an index value assigned in a number and you can't even play around with that and you can't change that. But that's not the case with Python. You can actually assign a string value or a text value to a series, as, to a index value as well. So now this really helps later. So for instance, if I want to search the price of Tiramisu, I can just call in Tiramisu index value and it will correspond to the price of tiramisu then. So very powerful way of manipulating the data by converting it into a series. So in this example, we first create a Python dictionary of Italian menu items and their prices. We then use the pd.series function from pandas to convert the dictionary into a series. Finally, we print the resulting series to the console. The output shows an index value of float 64 D, uh, sorry, the output shows a d-type value of float 64, which is essentially the value of the values here. So because these are all numbers and decimal numbers, the value is float 64. Here they were all numbers and non-decimal numbers, that's why the value was integer. Here they were all text, that's why the value was object. Keep in mind that the value is being assigned based on the data type is assigned to the series based on the values in it and not the index. So index is string or a number or an integer, it doesn't matter the data type value, the data type of the series menu underscore series will always be dependent on the actual values that are being stored and not the index. The next thing I want to quickly go through is to help you understand the difference between series, list and dictionary and when to use what when working with pandas because I know it can get confusing. So certainly here's a summary of the difference between series, a list and a dictionary and when to use which one when working with pandas. Series is a one dimensional labeled array that can hold any type of value. Keep in mind it's labeled. It is similar to a column in spreadsheet and is useful for programming for performing data manipulation and analysis. Just like we looked at manipulating this data in Excel by filtering, multiplying and other functions, we can do all these things using a series as well. A list is a collection of values that are ordered and mutable. So the order matters. Unlike a series, it does not have a labeled index. So if you go back and see here, this is the series, right, of ice cream flavors. So there is no index value assigned to it. If I want to call vanilla, there is no way to know how do I call this specific value? Unlike here in series where I know, okay, this is stored at an index value of zero or here the price 12.99 is stored in an index value of spaghettis. So that's a major difference. And that that's why series are much more powerful when manipulating with data. It is useful for storing a sequence of elements and can be used when you need to store a simple list of values or when you need a data structure that is ordered and can be modified. So it's saying that when you want to store a sequence of elements for later use, list can be a useful purpose. But if you want to manipulate the data and perform other analysis on it, it's better to convert it into a series. Now let's talk about dictionaries. Like we know, a it's a collection of key value pairs that are unordered and mutable. It is useful for storing data in a way that is easily searchable by a key and can be used when you need to look up values by a key, such as in lookup table or configuration file. Okay. When working with pandas, you typically use a series when you need to perform data analysis and manipulation, a list when you need to store a simple sequence of values, and a dictionary when you need to store a data in a key value format that is easily searchable. So this is the crux of it. So keep this in mind when you're manipulating data, convert it into a series. When you 
just need to store a simple list of numbers or text in a specific sequence you can store them in a list and if you want to associate your two values together like the menu item and the key value pair then dictionary would serve the purpose for us for example if you have a data set that you want to analyze using pandas you would typically convert it into a series or a data frame if you need to store a list of values that are not related to each other you would use a list if you need to store a lookup table or configuration file you would use a dictionary so that's it for this class in the next section we'll start talking about what are the most popular methods that we can use on a series in this lecture we're going to start talking about different methods we can use on a series so if you remember methods are also built in functions in python so these are the specific methods that are built on the series in pandas and we want to go through the most popular ones with example and description of what they do and then we can also try some out to see how they work so here gpt created a table for me summarizing most commonly used methods for panda series so let's start from the top dot head we'll return the first n rows of the series default is 5 okay so let's try this so if i take my menu series and i just type dot head and I type 2 so this should show me the first two values so I am expecting I will see this much of the data frame so that's it it showed me the first two values now let's try tail so just like the word means from head to tail tail should show me the bottom two now and that's it it's showing me brusetta and tiramisu I can change this number to 5 and it should show me the bottom 5 it's showing me everything because there are only five values in the table so that's why it's defaulting to everything right now if i do four it should stop at the pizza so see now spaghetti has been removed because it's showing you the bottom four the next one i want to talk about is describe so let's say what happens when we type in describe here so now it's telling me a bunch of statistics about my series on menu items it's telling me the count is 5 the mean value of the price is 12.19 the standard deviation is 4.14 min minimum value is 6.99 which is bruschetta the 25th percentile lies at 8.99 15th is at 13 75th is at 15 and the highest value is 16.99 which is the value of the lasagna so a very powerful function if you just want to get the basic statistics to better understand and explore the data you can use the describe function on your series the next one is value counts so the value counts will tell me the same thing as this the number which is five count the occurrence of unique values in the series and returns them as a new series okay it's actually counting the number of unique values sorry but since our series only has one dish repeated i would expect a similar answer so see so it's going through the price of each one and telling you how many of them are what is the count for each one so now it says 12.99 is one so let's try and modify this a bit so that we can play around with it a bit more so i'm going to copy this again and i'm going to change the variable name into menu underscore new so that it doesn't affect our previous work and then i will type in here dot value underscore counts and what i'll do here is i will make two of the prices the same so now my lasagna and spaghetti price is the same so what do i expect now i expect 12.99 to have a count of two and that's exactly what i got so I manipulated my initial data frame to show you this that value and count will show you the number of times each value in your series is repeated and 12.99 is now repeated twice. The next is unique so returns an array of unique values in the data set. So let's try this. So exactly the same thing I will copy my variable which is menu underscore series dot new dot unique so what do you expect now one two three four i should see four unique values now one two three four so it counted 12.99 once only although it comes twice because we're looking at unique values now n unique will tell us the number of unique values so if i just 
copy this here and now I'm just going to add an in here. So now what is the number of unique values? One, two, three, four. So my answer should be four unique values. Sort underscore value sorts the values in the series in ascending or descending order. So now if I apply this function by default, it's going to sort in descending. I believe, sorry, it's going to sort in ascending. So again, the same thing, I call my function, uh, I, my variable, and then I use the method of sort underscore values. So I expect it to start from 6.99, and then 8.99, then 12.99, and then lastly, the last, the largest value. And that's exactly what we got. So it took this data frame, which was unsorted, and sorted it based on the smallest value to the largest value of the price here. Series dot IDX min returns the index label of a minimum value of the series. So if I call this, it will tell me the name of the dish that has the lowest price. So now let's do the same thing. I copy my table here. And so what do I expect here? Returns the index label of the minimum value in the series. So what is the minimum value in the series? It's 6.99, right? We can also check it here when we did the describe function. Actually, we removed it. So, but we know that, okay, the minimum value is 6.99. It's going to tell me the index value corresponding to the minimum value. So my answer I'm expecting is since 6.99 corresponds to bruschetta index value, my index value of answer will be bruschetta. And that's what I got. So this was a very powerful way of understanding that, okay, which product is the cheapest product that I have on my menu? It's Prochera. Now, I believe this should have a max function to attach to it. Yes. So now I just changed min to max here. And now it's Margarita Pizza. So now a very quick way of checking, okay, what is the highest, what is the maximum priced product on my uh, menu? So this is really helpful when you're working with thousands of rows of data. Imagine you're an Amazon seller and you have 1000 products uploaded and instead of Excel, this will provide you a much faster way to explore your data and get an understanding of what's happening. So the next one is mean, mode, median, min, max. So all these functions can be used in a similar way. We already went through describe, which also told us the mean, mode and median. Um, try these out. I would highly suggest that you go through these on your own time. Try these out on different series. Pick a column in a data set that you have worked with and use that for the specific purpose. In this way, you will better understand. And I strongly believe practicing is the best way to learn. So please try these out. And in the next lecture, we will start talking about different attributes that we can use on a series function. So now that we have learned how to convert different data types into series, how to perform different methods on them, and how to check different attributes for a series, let's go back and figure out in more detail what this pd.series command was that was converting our different data types into a series and see what are the features and possibilities that we can use with this command specifically in Excel. So I would go down to my next prompt, which I said, explain what the parameters and arguments mean and how does that concept apply to the following pd.series function. And this is essentially the same function that we have used to convert our dictionaries and lists into a series. And I've specifically given the entire function from the documentation of pandas here so that GPT knows exactly what I'm referring to. So now let's see what it says. So it says a parameter is a value variable or value that is defined in a function or method signature and an argument is a value or expression that is passed to the function or method during the runtime. So now basically this pandas.series is a function. It could, so do, uh, pandas and pd mean the same thing here in this context. So pandas.series is a function and like any function as we explored in our crash course in Python, can have multiple input arguments. So these are all the different arguments that we can pass to this series. And then based on what the input arguments are, they will be used to create the appropriate series accordingly by Python. So here are the input arguments for the pd.series and their use case for each one. 
So some of these are very relevant to us and that uh, those are the ones that I will cover. So the first argument is data, the input data for the series, which can be a list, array, dictionary or scalar value. This is exactly what we did here. We called pd.series and we passed one input argument, which was the dictionary of menu. So here our data was dictionary. And if you want, we can write it specifically like this too. Data is equal to prices. So if I want, I can go back and call this data is equal to prices menu. My answer should not change. So by default, pd.series function knows that I don't need to write data is equal to as the first value will always be data. The next thing here is index. The index labels for the series, which can be a list of array or of labels or a single value to be repeated on all index labels. Then we can define what the index label are. If you recall in this function, we used our index value of the dish name as the index. Now, when you passed in a menu dictionary, Python was smart enough to understand that I can use the key value of the key value pair as the index. But that wasn't the case when we passed the list of numbers and it defaulted to an index value of 0 to 5 based on the count that we have. If we want, we can specify a specific index label as well on a number series as well. So let's try this out in a new cell. So here, this is what the program did, um, GPD did for us. It created a price list of three different prices and then it created an item list. And now it's saying that my data is going to be prices, which is my actual data in the series. My index is equal to items. So here's my index is equal to items and the name of the series is prices. So if I copy this code and I run it here, I'll have a new series where my index label will correspond to apple, banana and orange and my values will correspond to the values corresponding values for each item. I'll have to call it actually to be able to see it. And this is exactly what we got. So in this way, we can also assign an index value to pd.series function if we want, if we already know that, okay, this is the index labels that we will be working with. The next thing it's talk about is the data type. So we can assign a data type as well uh, that we want to work with. We can assign a name to the series as well. Here we assign the name of prices. We can create a copy of the original series so that we don't end up manipulating the actual data that we are working with. This is something we'll cover later in the data frame and fast path is not something we need to worry about yet. So in this example, we create a series of prices for different items by passing in a list of prices for the data parameter, a list of item name for the index parameter and a string for the name. So see it passed data, a, a list in data, a list in index and just a string for the name. The resulting series will have the prices as values, the item names as index labels with the name prices. Awesome. Now let's further explore the data type and name parameters in the same command. So now I'm specifically asking GPT to tell me more about what this name means and what this data type means. Sure. Here's an example of data type and name parameters. The data type parameters allow to specify the data type of the values in the series. This can be a NumPy data type or a Python object. If you don't specify data type, Python will try to infer the data type from the input data type. So what it's saying now is that, okay, you, you can decide what type of data type goes into the series. If I want it to be a string, a float or an integer. Now, if you don't do anything, this would default to an integer because there are numbers and there are no associated decimal values in there. But if I want, I can hard code it to a different sort of a data type as well. And that's what it's trying to do here. It's added a feature func uh, parameter saying that the data type is string. So even though these are numbers now, they will be stored as strings. So if I run this fruit underscore series now, the data type is an object on this series of fruits. Now let's do the same thing for the number series. 
I'll actually copy this in the next one to make it less confusing for us. So this is the one that we ran first to as expected the data type here is string. These are all in inverted commas. That was the expectation. Even if I remove this, I would still see the data type to be an object because that's what I believe Python will infer and default to. But this would be a different case here. So now it's saying it's a data type np.intl6, which means it's a number floating data type. So now it's saying it's an integer. It's counting these as integers. I can change this to string too. So I can just go string, I believe, here. Yeah. So now if I recall this, now this changed to object data type. So although these are numbers, I have specifically told Python to store them as strings, although that should not be the case, but to, just to give you an example. Now I'll go back to my original one, which was np.integer16, and this stores it back to integers. In the same way, the name parameters allow you to assign a name to the series. This can be useful when working with multiple series or when displaying the series in a data frame. So you can name a series to whatever you want and it could be a different name than the name that you have assigned to your initial list. In the next section now, we'll start discussing how to import data into our Python from Excel files for specific series. So the next function we're going to talk about is one of the most powerful functions in pandas which is essentially importing a data into python from a csv file so here we have a csv called instructors that i've been walking you through in different parts so far so now there are multiple columns here that talks about different things here's the title of the instructor here's the name display name on udemy this is their job titles the image of the instructor the initials, URL, and their specific ID. Now, what I'm going to try and do is extract a series, essentially, which is a column out of this data set. And the column that I'm trying to extract is column F, which is the job title. And I want my index, instead of having a numerical value of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I would assign the name column as the index of my data set. So now, how do I achieve this? So the first thing I want to do is to make our lives very easy, I am going back to my Jupyter directory and here you see I am in my desktop within the pandas data analysis folder and this is where I keep everything for this course right now. So you see this is the function that we are working with pd.series so it's stored here and I will drop the instructors file instructors.csv file in the same folder as well. So why am I doing this because then it becomes very easy for Python to extract that data point directly from this file and we won't have to spend time in directing it to a specific path or a specific location within my PC to be able to achieve that job. So that's the first thing. Make sure that you're working, that you're, you have put in this instructors.csv, which this file is available in the resources. If you go open the resources of the data, um, you will see this file available. You put it in the same folder where your working sheet is for Python so that it becomes very easy for you to import it. Now, how do we import it? So let's try and understand the pd.series uh, PD to CSV function. So essentially what we're doing is we're reading pd.read underscore CSV function. I misspelled it uh, incorrectly here and called it pd.series, but it understood the task that I am referring to read underscore csv function here so now this function has a couple of different parameters when you're reading a file specifically a csv file we can assign different things so for instance we can say that okay the file path or the buffer containing the csv data we can say okay the file is located in a specific location in my pc go extract it from there we are going to try and avoid it by putting it in the same folder as our python notebook as and the data file in the same place the next one is the separator so usually a csv is a comma separated file so if you open a csv file in notepad what you will see is that all the columns are separated by a comma in each row so that's what it defaults to if you have a different separator in your file you can assign it using this as well the header row so now it's asking you which row should i use for the header so it sounds a bit 
over cautious because my header was always the first one but it's specifically asking us so if let's say your header row was this 12th row you can also do that so right now what i want to tell it is that my header row is row 0 because in python the first value always starts with 0 my header row is row 0 the next thing is i can assign the index column to it and like we just discussed i want my index column to be the name column so i'm going to call in the name column as my index column then it asks which columns do you want to use the columns to include in the series default is none which means include all columns so right now we're not working with a data frame if i import everything then it will be a data frame i only want to work with a specific column because i'm working with series right now and not data frame so i'm going to give it this column which is column f and column d because essentially this is my index and this is my series so i need to provide these two names when i'm referring to the use of columns the data type if i want to assign a specific data type just like we did in the pd.series function parse underscore dates a boolean value indicating whether to parse dates in the csv so this will help you convert anything that is not in the dates format into date format and lastly squeeze is a parameter argument that we can give to this specific read underscore csv function a boolean value whether indi which indicates whether to return a series or a data frame so if it's true then it will convert the data into a series otherwise it will convert the data into a data frame and we will explore this further and we will get back to this read underscore csv function in our next section we are working with the data frames as well but i wanted to quickly show you how it is done now i've written a specific special prompt for you to follow each time you are working with a new data set and you want to import it so it's very simple only five to six specific steps that you'd need to outline based on the information provided in the previous form that we went through so i said use pd.series function to import a data set where the header row is the first row so I, that's the first thing i said i didn't even need to say zero it automatically assumed uh, understood that okay then i need to go to row zero so this is the power of gpt that i'm trying to show in this course that by just by providing the basic logic on how to write the code gpt will write amazing code for you the next thing is I'm saying the index row is called title, which is my title row. So sorry, this row. So I have assigned the title as my index here. The next thing I'm saying is column to import is job underscore title. Okay, so this becomes my series. So now it knows that, okay, this is the main column that all the values in the series will refer to. Set squeeze variable to make it a series, not data frame. So I didn't even tell it whether to make it true or false. I just said I want it to be a series. So now it was smart enough to understand that and make it true. And then I said I didn't even assign the use columns here. All I said was that column to import is job underscore title and the index row is called title. So it understood that title and job title are the two columns I need to extract and it used the use columns parameter to add these two here so now if you see it's and i have assigned the name of the csv file as well so i said the cvs i made a spelling mistake but it was smart enough to understand that that csv file name is equal to instructors so now it created the entire function for me saying that okay we are going this is the data it's coming from instructors.csv the header row is the first row the index column is the title column we are going to use these two columns this one will be assigned the index value so this is the only column we have and squeeze is true which makes it a series now if i copy this and i paste this here in the same pd.series so df refers to data frame which is the most default generic way of identifying a data set in pandas so you will see this across if you're looking at others code as well we always do this just a naming convention and now if i run this cell you see this is my series values head of data science at pair training developer and lead instructor developer and bootcamp instructor so these are the job titles that i made my values and the name or the title which is this column column c jose portila this became my index so you see how jose portila is the first one so this is my index value and jose is the head of data science at pair training let's double verify this that we're looking at it the right way so jose portila is the head of data science at peer training so our data set has been successfully imported 
and now let's start playing around with it. So now that we've imported our data frame, now let's start talking about some of the basic functions that we can apply on this specific data set that we have imported into our Jupyter Notebook. So I gave a prompt saying this word, can you give me a list of basic functions I can apply on the DF? So DF is the same name it gave to the variable that it assigned to the series variable. So I'm using the specific name here so that all the code that it gives me is linked to that and I can easily copy paste it into pandas. So that's another thing to keep in mind that <clears throat> when you're working through these prompts, make sure you use the same variable names that GPT is used to so that you can easily copy paste the code and you don't have to work around with it and manually change them. So I said I want three columns. I want the function name. I want the code that to apply it on DF. DF is again the name of the function of the variable. I specifically mention it again so that GPT doesn't make a mistake and then explain explanation of what it does. So then it gave me some of the basic ones df.head which will show me the first x number of rows df.tail that showed me the next few rows and here I've applied them. So I went from length df first which tells me okay there are this is the number of rows in the data set. I can double check that if I go to my series again the last value is 322 32,234. So if I ignore the first header row, it's going to be 32,233. And that is exactly what we got here because it's not counting the header row. I did df.head, so it gave me the first few and I can see parent training here. I can double verify that by seeing going back to the top. Actually, let me go to the top from here. And this is the one head of data science at parent training which is Jose Portila. And that's exactly what I have here. So this is working out fine. I can also look at my last, I can also call df.tail on the last five and verify that, okay, it has picked up the entire data set. And the last one is right, Victor Kemeninsky. So let's see if this is actually the last one. Yes, it is. So the last one is also being picked up. So all the data has been picked up correctly. Now we can see df.value underscore counts which will give you a count of the number of times each value has been repeated. So if there is only one singer songwriter, the value will be one. If there is more than one, then it will give us the count for that. So it's saying instruct, there are 265 with the title instructor, software engineers 144, professor 76. And as I expect, there will be a lot of ones with ones because it's using for an exact equal match for this word. So that's why there are, although there could be someone whose title is software engineer instructor that will be counted separately and not counted in either instructor or software engineer. So that's why this count is what it is. What is the next feature we can look into? Let's talk about df.describe. So this will give me summary statistics on the data set that we're working with. So there are this is the count of the data set. This is the number of unique values. The top value is instructor because that's been repeated the highest number of times. The frequency is 265 of this and the data type is string. That's why it's saying object and the name of the data of the series is job underscore title. Great. Now if you want to sort them in a specific manner, you can also use that by using this function df dot sort underscore values sorts the series by values set ascending is equal to false for descending order so right now it's going to show them in an ascending order so let's see if we do this this is going to show me in ascending order so that how do i know it's ascending order because the first one starts with an a now now if i want to do this in descending order i can just say ascending is equal to false So now it went to the bottom of the data set and the ones that were at the very low, which is basically the Mandarin characters in the name are being sh uh, showed in the end. And then this would be followed by Z and all the way back to the A. And if I change this to true, this means the same thing as ascending and it's back to starting with A. Non-lock and I-lock are ways to uh, extract specific values 
based on the index values. So to better understand lock and I lock, I ran another prompt so that we are clear about what it is and how best to use it. So lock and I lock are two ways to access and manipulate data in Pandas series for data frames, similar to how you interact with cells and ranges in Excel. Okay, so this function is label based, which means that you use the row or column label to access data. In Excel, imagine having named ranges for specific cell names like revenue or cost using lock. You can access data by referring to these labels. Example, df.log revenue. Okay, and then for i log, the function is index based, which means that you are, you will use the numerical index position of rows or columns to access the data. It's similar to using row and column number in Excel, such as a1 or c1 in i log. You can access data by referring to rows and columns such as tf.ilog0, 2. Okay, so what it's saying is that you're, you can filter the data based on your index. So remember, this is our index, right? This is the first column, not the, the job title, but the name or the title of the instructor. This is our index that we're working with. Healthcare, Career Development Academy, and Fernal. So these are indices, index label. So we can filter out the data set from using these index labels by lock and i lock. By lock, we will provide an actual value that exists in the index, such as Healthcare Career Development Academy. But in the case of i lock, we'll provide the numerical index value associated with it. So let's do this by an example from our Excel. So let's say we have this row of cold steel corresponding to developer and bootcamp instructor. And I want to extract it using both the methods of lock and I lock. For lock, what I'll do is I will provide the value of cold steel. I will copy this and I will paste this in my Jupyter with the lock function to get me the corresponding job title with, and my answer should be developer and bootcamp instructor. In the case of I lock, I want to provide the index number that this refers to. So if we start from here, we're going to ignore the header row because pandas, pandas doesn't work that way. It's going to ignore the header row. So this is my count one, count two, count three. So this is my third row in the data set. Since in Python, you start with zero. So this becomes zero, one, two. So essentially in lock, I will provide cold steel as the input. And in I lock, I will provide two as the input. So let's go back and try this out. So here I did df.lock and I provided cold steel. And as expected, my answer came out to be developer and bootcamp instructor. I did the same thing with I lock now. And this time I write two here because that's the index position of cold steel. And I got the same answer as expected, which was developer and bootcamp instructor. So in this way, you can essentially filter out the data set just like you do in Excel. If I wanted, I could have copied this, opened the filter, and add a filter here equal into cold steel and this will extract me the data that i was looking for in this case which is the job title of bootcamp instructor so this is the data set that we're working with and this is what we got and now we have exactly replicated it using pandas the next thing i want to do is show you how to override this value to a different value so let's say I want to change this value for cold steel to Udemy instructor. How do I do that? Do I have the permission and ability to change the data frame itself by assigning a different value to a specific value? So let's go and ask GPT that. So here I wrote a prompt saying that I ran this code, which is the code that we ran and I pasted this code and I said, and I got the corresponding value. Now I want to update the corresponding value to Udemy instructor. How do I do that? So it says to update the value to the index of the index cold steel in the Panda series DF, you can use the lock function to assign a new value to that index. So what it's doing is it's saying df.loc to the same and equals to Udemy instructor. So now this will update the value from developer and bootcamp instructor to udemy instructor so if i call this function again let's see what answer do we get now it's udemy instructor so now what we have essentially done is we have filtered out a specific value in the data frame and updated it let's quickly do this in excel as well so that you have a very good idea of what we're referring to 
So we went and we filtered out cold steel and now we have changed this value to udemine structure. So this is essentially what we did just did. The next thing I want to understand is that okay right now what we are doing here is we are filtering by the title right. What if I want to filter by job title instead which is my value column. So what if I'm looking for this. How do I figure out all the columns which are equal to Udemy instructor right now Excel is giving me contains. So to be more precise I will do text filters equals and then Udemy instructor. So now I should receive these values as my answer, these five values. Let's see how do we do that in GPT, uh, through GPT. So this is what it says. Now I want to find the index level corresponding to the value Udemy instructor. And this means it should be equal to and not contain, which is what we did in Excel as well. So it's saying it defines a new variable saying index underscore label, which goes into the data frame and gives you all the values where the value in the data frame is equal to Udemy instructor and then it provides the corresponding index value of that and stores it in this variable. So let's copy this and paste this here and now I should see the five rows that I'm looking for. Cold Steel, Sana Maksud, Alina M, Ross Zager, one, two, three, four. Is this the same thing that we got in Excel? One, two, three, four five okay it's missing one why is it missing one because this one is with a small case if this was a capital i the program would have caught it it's case sensitive so that's why it wasn't able to catch it now this is going to be a a much uh, advanced code but i can technically go in here and say make it less case sensitive i want to pick up everything that contains udemy instructor and the spelling the capitalization should not matter so if i run this prompt right now it will give me a couple of lines of code that can exactly replicate the output from excel so if you want, i would suggest you try that on your own and if you have any questions or concerns you can definitely message me and i will run the code for you on the same data set and help you sort debug it if you're having issues but definitely do try that out the next thing I want to quickly walk you through is the get method. So that is exactly the same thing that we have done through lock. Um, we can also search by an index label using the get method. It allows you to retrieve a value from a panda series using the index label. Here's how to do it. So now I can provide in the value of cold steel. So exactly in the same way I go here, I copy paste this. So here we did df.loc and then cold steel. We can also do df.get and this will also give me the value of Udemy instructor exactly as I got here. And it has a default value of not found as well that you can add. So basically if you're not sure if the value exists in the data set or not and you don't want to run end up with an error, you can use this version of it with a default value of not found so that you get a print output and not an error in the end. So if you recall in the last lecture what we did was we changed the value of the job title of cold steel to Udemy instructor specifically. Now I want to try do something more customization and what I want to do is essentially I want to add space Udemy instructor to all the variables to all the values in my data frame. So essentially I want to go through each one of them and I want to add Udemy instructor next to it. Now I know how I do, can do it in Excel. In Excel I can just create a new cell here and then call Udemy instructor here and what I'll do next is I will call the equal to I'll say this and add a space and I will add Udemy instructor here and I will lock down this cell so that it doesn't change as I move down. So and now if I go to the bottom of the data set and I press command D or control D I have done what I wanted to do. So in every cell now you will see Udemy instructor has been added to the end of the cell. So 
Now let's try and replicate this in pandas and see how do we go about optimizing or editing each cell by adding an extra value in it. And we can do this by using an assigning a new function and then using the method of apply. So I asked a very simple prompt from GPT saying, okay, now let's add Udemy instructor to all values in the series. Make sure we don't delete anything, rather add. And I added inverted commas with a comma, with a space in the middle here. So I'm leaving a space here. Udemy instructor to all values. GPT was pretty good at understanding the task. It said to add the string and it included the space here as well, if you can notice. To add the string Udemy instructor to all values in the series DF without deleting any data, you can use the dot apply method with a custom function. Here's the code. So if you recall in our Python crash course, we learned about custom functions. They define, they start with defining a function. Then there's a function name and then there is an input value that you provide to the function. If you recall, we were converting inches to centimeters. So our input was the inches value and then it does a logical task and then it gives you a return function return value and in this case the return value in that case in our previous example in python crash course our return value was the centimeter which we got after multiplying inches by 2.56 i believe over here our return value is equal to the input text plus udemy instructor next to it so in this way i can just use this function to pass anything through the data set so let's say i call this function and then i have a text value that i want to pass it through let's say i say the title is data scientist data scientist so what will this function do is it will add udemy instructor next to it so now this is something that we have discussed before very simple very easy the question becomes how do we apply this to all the rows in our data set essentially we're going to do this everywhere on this column so for that it's going to use df.apply function and what that does is applies that specific function to all the values in the data set so now what it's doing is it's taking that df and then it's using dot apply and then feeding in this function of add udemy instructor as an input parameter to dot apply this tells Python that I need to go to each and every row in the data set and apply the add Udemy instructor function to it. And whatever the value is in that specific cell is going to correspond to the text value. So let's give this. So now I copy paste this function here exactly the way GPT told me to and it gave me an error. And the error says that unsupported op operand type for float and string so it's saying that in this line df dot apply add udemy instructor there is some mix up happening between float and string that's why it cannot apply the function my hunch is that this text value is a string so when it's parsing through the columns here one by one it's expecting all of these values to be strings but there could be a number here and that number is something python cannot understand and therefore it is unable to run the code so instead of debugging it myself i'm i just copied the entire error and i pasted it in gpt here so this is the exact error that it gave me and i just copy pasted it and gpt problem solved it for me and debugged it it says it seems there is a type error because one or more values in the series are of type float and the custom, custom function is trying to concatenate a string to a float value. To fix this, you can modify the custom function to first convert the value to a string before concatenating it. And it updated the function by adding string text here. So now it doesn't matter whether the text value is an integer or a float or a string by adding str next to it, it will always be a string now because we are forcing that specific value to be converted into a string if you recall this is also something that we covered in our python crash course where we learned how to convert an integer into a string and then string into back into an integer so now i will copy paste this code and i will run this and this time there was no error why because now this error 
of not being able to identify float in strings is not happening and I got my output. And as expected, you see in the output that it has added Udemy instructor next to each and every one with a space into it. So for the ones that are small enough for us to read completely here, online education space Udemy instructor. So it did exactly the job that we were asking it to do. I'm just going to delete these two cells because they're not needed. So in this way, we were able to modify an entire series or column by adding an extra point to it. Now, this can be done in a lot of different ways. For instance, if you have a data set of numerical values and you want to convert everything into a percentage, you can do the exact same thing. You can ask GPT that, okay, I have a, I have a column of numbers and I want to pass them through a specific function that converts them into a percentage it will do the exact same thing first it will create a custom function depending on the job requirement that you assign and then it will apply the dot df dot apply method using that function onto the entire column and give you the outcome that you're looking for so very powerful way to work through and analyze and manipulate data sets using pandas Next, we're going to talk about attributes of a series and I've asked GPT to explain me what it means and give me a table of popular attributes I can apply. So just like we can use methods to filter out the data frame or calculate specific statistics. So for instance, here we did dot head and we said, okay, give filter out the data frame and give me the top two rows or the bottom two rows when we did tail or we asked it to give me the count by unique values or if we asked it that, okay, calculate me the mean mode median. So these were all methods that we were applying on the series to filter out the data frame or to calculate some exploratory data analysis work on the series to get us an answer. On the other hand, methods are values or in that allows us to access the underlying array of values. So for instance, I can say that, okay, give me the values that are in the series. So it's not going to do something extra. It's just going to extract all the values in the series and give them to me in a simple list. I can ask all the index values. I can ask it about the data type of the series. I cannot change the data type, but I can call in the attribute of data type to understand what data type exists. In the same way, I can ask for the name, the size and the shape of the argument. So just some basic exploratory variables, uh, variab uh, ways for you to explore the data set. So let's try a few of these and see what we get. Although I, I understand these are very basic and you would have an idea by now of how these work. So let's pick the same thing and let's say I want to call in the D type attribute to see what is the data type of the series. So I expect it to be float because these are all decimal values and numbers. So why did I get the error? Because I was trying to call a method as in uh, I was call, trying to call an attribute as in a method. So when we were calling methods, we were adding these parentheses, right? But we were calling attributes, we are not going to use these parentheses because there is no input variable that we can provide here. Unlike methods, attributes are just values or attributes about these underlying variables that are already stored that we can just access. So if I type D type, it tells me float 64 which is what I expected because these are decimal values here. Now let's look at size and what it represents. So the size is five, which is essentially the count of the number of rows that we have here in the series. What is shape? Five comma zero. So because we only have, so shape will tell you the number of rows and the number of columns. Since we're working with series and not a data frame, series means only one column. So that's why it's defaulting to a value of blank here and the number of rows are being highlighted. If this was a data frame, this would be a different story and we'll get the number of columns as well. Now let's do empty and what I essentially empty would do is tell you the number of values which are empty in the data frame, which is false because there are no values which are empty. If I change one of these value to empty, then the Boolean response will be a yes. In the next lecture, we're going to start talking about parameters and arguments and on a specific series of importing data.
So the next thing I want to talk about is how do you deal with these NaN values? So you see in our data frame, there are a couple of spots where we see that our value is NaN, which means a non-existing value. So how do we deal with that? Because if you want to pass any function through it, or if you want to do any, op apply any operator like multiplication, then these NaN will cause an issue for us. So it's important to figure out how many NANs exist, how to clean our data, and then what are the different available options that we have along those lines. So I went to GPT and I asked a very simple prompt saying, my series contains NAN. What are my options to deal with? Please explain how to identify them and how to clean the data. List popular option in tabular format. So it says when dealing with missing values in a panda series, there are several popular options to handle them. Here's a table with these options and in their explanations. So let's start going through these one by one to figure out what works best for our data set and in what cases. So the first thing is being able to identify if there's a NaN value. So now this would call a function on the entire series saying is NA. So it will tell you if a specific value is a missing value or not through a Boolean. So you see now all these uh, job titles has been changed to a boolean of true and false and it's essentially telling you if whether the value exists or not and now it's because we called it on the entire df it's showing us the first five rows and the last five rows these dot means that there is a lot of data in the middle of this so based on these rows there are none so i guess they are somewhere in the middle of the data so we need a better function to be able to identify it so let's say we run this df is na dot sum which means count the number of missing values in the series. So if I run this function, now I would know what is the total number of missing values in the series. So there are 78 values somewhere in the data set that are missing and that might cause an issue for me when I'm doing any analysis in this data set. Now the next function is drop NA, it returns a new series with all the rows containing NA values removed. So this is the easiest hack that we can do is just drop the rows where this exists. So if I run this function, what it would do is that these 78 rows will be dropped from the data set and the size of the data set that we have will reduce. So run it and now our data set size should have, should not have any missing values because we have essentially removed it 78 values. How do we check it? Let me assign this to a new variable saying df underscore one is equal to this. And then I'm going to call df underscore one and check if there are any missing values left on this variable. So my answer technically should be zero because now I have removed those NaN values from this data set and made it a new data set. And this new data set has no missing values. What are other ways to deal with it? So instead of removing these rows, we can also fill them up with something else. So if we do fill NA, it returns a new series with NA values replaced by a specific value. So let's try this. So now what I want to do, so I want to replace all my NAs with let's say one. Keep in mind, now we're working with two different data frames. DF1 is the one where we remove the missing values while DF still has it. So I am applying this new function on DF to make sure that I my data set still has these 78 missing values. So now I will save it as DF underscore filled and up let's apply one to all those values and if I run this sum function again I should see zero nans because essentially I have replaced them with a value of one so again I am down to zero again what are other ways to deal with it so we can also forward fill and backfill and interpolate so what are forward and backfill because these could be useful so it returns a new series with NA values replaced by the previous non-NA value. And the backward fill does the other way around where it will replace by the next non-value. And here GPT just provides a bit of a code on how to run each one of these. Walk through this, you can use this on your own data sets to figure out how this works. To further understand forward and backfill, I ran another prompt saying, please explain me how forward fill and backfill works. So it's very, easy to understand this using an example. So the first one is forward fill. So you see we're going from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is the original series. This is after applying the forward fill. So what forward fill is doing when it finds a missing value at 1, it will fill it with the value before this. 
So A will be used to fill the forward value of NAND. So for the zero value was used to fill the value of one, which was used to fill the value of two. Three had a value, so nothing was done. And fourth value was filled using the value of three. And this is what we see here. The first three becomes A because the first one is A and the last one becomes B because the second last one is B. On the other hand, if we look at backward fill, it's going to start from the bottom and work its way to the top. So now we're going from four to zero. So this three value is NAN, so it will be filled with the fourth value B. So three becomes B, two becomes B, one stays as it is, and then now zero becomes A because the previous value was A. So this is what we see here, B, 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 and then A, and then the first one also becomes A. So just a quick tutorial on how to work with missing values in your data set. What are the options? Either you can remove them or you can replace them by a specific value, or you can use backward and forward fill or interpolate fill to assign a specific value based on the position of the missing value in your data frame. When we work with data frames, we will further visit this again and figure out what if there are missing values in one column, do we want to remove the entire column or we just want to change that value. So it will become a lot more powerful as we work along data frames in the next section. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to show you a quick way of working through missing values in your data frame and what are the different options available to deal with that. Now welcome to the next section where we start working with data frames and this is where the fun part starts. Now we have established a base now where we understood what chat GPT is, what prompt engineering is, we took a crash course on, Panda, uh, on Python and we understood the basics of data manipulation on one column which was a series. So now we're going to use everything that we have learned so far and apply it on an entire data set. So how will we do this? We'll do this in a couple of different subtasks. Just like we discussed before, we have to take a big project, divide it into smaller tasks, and then solve each one of them independently. So the first thing we'll do is how do we import a data set? And how do we assign an index to a specific column based on that? Once we, ha we have imported the data set, we're going to start cleaning it. What do I do with missing values? Are all the data types exactly the way they are? Is date stored as a string or is there a number column which has been stored at a string? How do I convert different data types to make sure it's in the right format so I can use it for data manipulation later? After that, we'll start learn how, we'll learn how to filter columns. We'll filter the data set based on one or two columns. For instance, uh, we're going to play with the Udemy data set. So I want to figure out what are the courses that are greater than 12 hours. So how do I filter that out? Then we'll understand how do I filter by multiple columns. So instead of one column, what if I have two columns and I want to filter out by two columns. For instance, let's say I want to filter out all the courses which are greater than 10 hours on Python. So how do I use more than one column to filter my data frame? Next, we learn how to apply different operators. For instance, we have a review column which gives us the review out of five. I want to see a percentage of the review. So I want to create a new column which takes that four, point, let's say it has a 4.5 rating for a course and converts it into a percentage that is 90%. So how do I add a new column which is basically based on an existing column in the data frame? And then we learned different operators such as multiply, sum, and how do we apply them on the data set? Lastly, we learn how to parse data sets, uh, data, parse specific columns in the data set based on our need. For instance, if uh, in the data set that we'll work with, the duration column will be stored as a text 12 hours course. So now I don't need the hours course part. I just need to know the number of hours the course is. So I need to extract the number part from this cell, which is the 12. So how do I do that? How do I tell Python that I want to parse this column and extract only the numbers out of it. So these are the different things we're going to go through in this section. And once we are done manipulating data frames and we have a basic understanding of it, we'll move on and start visualizing, visualization, the data that we were, that we have explored and did our analysis on. So stay tuned. And now let's start diving into the data set and start working with data frames. So in this lecture, we're going to start working with our new data set. And this time the data set that I've chosen is of courses on Udemy. So the data set that we used in the previous section was on the instructors on Udemy, which gave us basic instruct information about different instructors, their job titles, 
their URLs and so on and so forth. Now we're going to work as we work in this section on data frames. We're going to use the courses data frame from the same data set that I got from Kegel and you can download it if you want and play around at the same time as you work along the course from the resources section. So this data set has a couple of different columns. It has a course ID. I believe this would be a unique course ID assigned to each data set, each course. And then it has the title of the course, the URL for the course, the rating of the course, the number of reviews each course has, the number of published lectures that are there in that course, the date the course was created, when was the course last updated, the duration in total number of hours. Keep in mind, this is being stored as a string here. 22 space total space hours will be treated as a string by default. So we might have to figure out a way to make this a numerical value so we can play around with that variable. Similarly, last updated and created are date and time format. So we might have to take care of that and work with that accordingly as well. Similarly, instructor ID. So this would be the same instructor ID that we saw in our previous data set of instructors. So if I go here, there is an ID here. So this ID of corresponding to Jose Portilla would be the instructor ID here as well. So this is something we need to keep in mind that if you want to connect the two data sets, we can use column J to do that. And lastly, there is a photo of each instructor in the data set through a JPEG URL link, I believe. Yes, of Udemy. So this is the data set we're playing with. Now let's go back to GPT and ask it how do we best import this data. So this time I wrote a much better, much profound prompt. And this is the kind of the prompt that we would be working with when we are importing data into our Jupyter notebook from a CSV file. So first I said, you're an expert in Python, specifically in Pandas library. So I defined the context that, okay, you are an expert in this talk accordingly. You will help me write the code for data analysis for Jupyter notebook. So I gave it a precise instruction that, okay, the action item for you is to write code, which is specifically for data analysis. And we are going to write it for a Jupyter notebook because that's what you're working with. I will provide you precise instructions on what needs to be done. Understand the task and write neat, concise code. So I first give a bit of a context that, okay, I'm going to provide you instructions. You need to understand them and write code for me, not just code. You have to write neat, concise code with comments so that it's descriptive and I can understand it. After providing the code, you also need to explain what the code does by explaining each line to a beginner. So I said, you need to explain it, not just explain it, explain each line of the code and you're explaining it to a beginner. Your first task is as follows. Use pd.read underscore CSV function. If you recall, this is the same function we used to import the instructor's data set the only difference is now we're going to work with multiple columns at the same time instead of just one column. So we will use pd.read underscore CSV function to import data set where and we have been through these different requirements for the pd read underscore CSV function or parameters that we can use to further enhance the output that we get. So the first thing I said was header row is first row. So it can mark row zero as the header. Index row is called ID, make in place true. So now what I'm telling it is that use this value of ID as your index. Why am I doing this? So if I want to filter out the data later, I want to filter out using a column that is easy to filter through and that is unique. Now, because I know that it, there is a possibility that two courses can have the same title. There could be two courses with exactly the same name but they will have different IDs. So I will be able to easily sort and manipulate my data if I'm filtering it through the ID column. So that's why I assigned ID as my index label. I can also do the same thing using URL because I believe URLs will also be unique, but this is shorter and numerical value and it would be faster uh, in terms of computation power taken to filter through this or sort through this. So that's why I've used ID as the column through which we will index base our index. Next, I say column to import is equal to all columns in the data set. If we want, we can drop some of these few columns by adding them here. 
set squeeze variables to make it a data frame. So if you recall, the squeeze variable helped us distinguish whether we want to import it as a series or a data frame. Since we want it as a data frame, that's the instruction I provided here. The CSV file name is courses. So this is the name of the file in my original folder where I'm getting it from and which is basically here. So here is my file of Python called courses and here's a file here called courses. So as long as they're both in the same folder, which is Pandas data analysis, I am good to go. Create a copy of the original data frame using dot copy. So if you remember from the last section in the last lecture, we don't want to manipulate the original data set, rather we want to manipulate copies of it. So I would, in, even in the starting of my script, I'm going to assign a copy and work along with that. The next thing I'm telling GPT is that there is a column called created, which stores data in the following format. So what I did was I went to this created column, which I know is a date column. And I said, the name of the column is this, and I copy pasted one of the cell values here as 2015, 7, 29, T, 0, 0, 12, whatever it provided me. So make sure this is being read as by the uh, data by code. Sorry, as a date by the code. So make sure that when you read this column, you understand that it's date. And why is that necessary? So for instance, to, uh, if later during my analysis, I say that, okay, I want to look at all the courses that were released between January 2019 to February 2020. How do I do that? I can essentially filter out those courses using the, the created column. But to be able to do that, Python needs to recognize that, okay, this is a date format and convert it accordingly. So that instruction was important to provide here. If I want, I can do the same thing on last updated column. Duration will deal with later in the course. So the file is in the same folder as the script. And why did I say that? So that it doesn't write any extra lines about the location of the file. So let's see what the code does. Because I precisely asked it to provide me really good instructions, it's doing that as well. So it's saying header row is the first row by default, so I didn't add it. Index column is ID and in place is equal to true is not applicable. Okay, so I set the index column to ID. So the index column has been set to ID. All columns in the data sets will be imported by default. So it did not assign any use column variable because it's importing everything. Squeeze is not needed here as we want a data frame, not a series. So by default, this function will pick it up as a data frame. So we don't need to call this one as well. CSV file name is courses.csv. So this is the file name that it assigned here. Create a copy of the original data frame using dot copy. Parse the created column as a date. Okay, so parse underscore date is the parameter it used to make sure that created column is being used as a date. So now I can copy this code, paste it here, and run it and this will do the job for me. One small change that I've done is that I have marked, labeled my first data call as df underscore one and after I make a copy of it I've called it df. So now I'm just going to call it df and that would make my life easier as I'm working on uh, doing further tasks with the course and let's just view the header of this. Okay. Okay, now that we have imported our data frame, the next thing we want to do is we want to teach chat GPT on what the columns are that we will be working with in our data set. So I basically went to my data set in Excel or you can do this from the notepad file as well. And I copied all the columns and I pasted them here. So now my GPT knows that, okay, these are the data sets. And I said that, okay, my data frame name is DF. So it just responded by saying, I understand the data frame name is DF and it has the following column. So now if I want later in the course, I can just say title column and it would know exactly which column I'm referring to and will write the code accordingly. So once you have inputted the data frame, this is the next thing I would recommend you do. Moving on. Now what we want to do next is clean our data. So we want to make sure there are no missing values and there are no NANs in our data set. So to, to do that, we can figure out or work with a couple of different functions that are available in pandas for us. So I wrote a simple prompt saying the first thing we'll do is check for NAND value in the data set and clean them up. Could you please explain to a beginner has NANDs, is null, fill NA and drop NA methods. Now some of these methods we have covered before 
for example, fill any and drop any in the series section. But I thought it would be a good idea to go over these again here to give you a better understanding. So the first thing is Hasnans. This is a property of a Pandas series. Remember, this applies to a series and not a data frame. So we'll have to apply it on a specific single column of the data frame if you want to check for this. That returns a Boolean indicating if there are any NAN, not a number value, in the series. It is useful when you want to quickly check if a particular column has missing values. Okay. So now what it's doing is saying DF rating. Okay. So it goes into our data frame and then it goes into the rating column and then applies the function has NANs. If this function is true, it will say there are NAN values in the rating column. Okay. So let's try this. So now I'm back in my Jupyter notebook and the next thing I'm going to try is do this. I have named my data frame df so that I don't have any confusions and GPT understands that. So now because it's not printing anything that means there are no NAND values. Is there a better way to check this? I can also do this. false so that means there are no nan values in our data set at least for the rating column so now either i can apply this command one by one to each and every column or i can figure out a better function to do this the next option we have is is null this is a method in both panda series and data frame so this can be applied to a data frame that returns a boolean mask so what does a boolean means either true or false with the same shape as the input indicating which elements are nan okay so it will apply the is null method to each and every cell in our excel sheet or in our data frame and give us a true or false value of if that variable is a nan if that cell value is a nan or not it is useful when you filter or count the number of missing values so this is what it did it assigned a new variable saying missing values and it said that this variable is equal to the sum of is null so if a value is null it's going to be marked as true and it's going to sum up all the true values in the data frame so let's apply this function and see if we actually have any null values so now it's giving me a breakdown by each column so if you see this these are all the columns we have in our data frame and now it's clearly visible that last update date has 72 values which are nan so these are the values that we need to rectify so this is a very powerful function in terms of understanding where the none value exists and then you can work on updating them the next method is fill na and this is now we're talking about filling those nan values so now we first first we figured out okay are there non nan values or missing values in our data set if there are we can use fill na method or drop na method to actually fill those values with something else or just drop those rows so fill na method just like we discussed in the series section we can replace nan values with a specified value or using a specific method if you remember we talked about forward and backward filling we can fill them by mean mode median as well so here in the example what it does is it says that if the value in the rating is missing fill it and fill it by the mean value of the rating and in place is equal to true means that it will replace the existing value now since our rating column has no null values if i apply this function it's not going to have an impact and what i want to do is i don't want to fill missing values i want to drop them so if the value is missing i don't want it to be included in my data set so essentially what i'm saying is wherever this last update date value is missing i want to drop these 78 rows from my data set how do i do that i can do that using drop any method so this is a method in both pandas series and data frame so this can be applied to a data frame as well that is used to remove rows or columns with missing values you can choose to remove rows or column based on certain conditions such as if any or all values are nan so if, so if you choose any here that means that it will remove rows where any value in that row is missing so let's say we have 10 columns out of 10 columns only one column has a missing value then it will remove that row whereas all method if i change this any to all what it would do is it would only remove rows in which all the cells are nan so to give you a example look at this here so i created these two sample rows just for showing this so in the in this row only the first value is nan and all the other 
values exist, whereas in row 3, all the values are none. So what happens if I use any method? And any method will remove both the rows because at least one NAND value exists in both the rows. But if I use all method, it would re definitely remove this row because all the values are NAND, but it won't remove this row because only one value is NAND, whereas it would only apply if all the values are NAND. So that's just a quick summary of how any and all works when you're using drop NA. And you're defining an axis based on whether you're looking by rows or by columns. Now there are further parameters that can be used in the drop NA method. The next prompt I ask is that please explain the subset parameter of drop NA method using last update date column. So now I know that this is the column that has missing values, right? So I specifically said, explain to me how would you use the subset parameter on this column? So let's see what the subset parameter does. The subset parameter and drop NA methods allow you to specify a subset of the columns to consider when dropping rows with missing values. This is useful when you only want to remove rows based on missing values in specific columns rather than the entire row. So now what it's going to do is, it's going to say that, okay, I'm going to the DF only if there is a missing value in last update column. So if there is a missing value in this column, then that specific row will be dropped. So it's not checking on all the columns if there are missing values, rather it's only checking on this column if there are missing values. So let's go and try this one out. So if I do this, my df cleaned. Actually, let me apply this function again to see where did we end up. So we now we applied this. Okay, I can still see 78 missing values. Why? I know what the issue is here, but just to make sure that in case you run into shoes with similar, you know how to debug them using chat GPT. I'm going to use chat GPT to resolve this. So first I need to tell chat GPT that I applied this function and then I applied this code and then this was the output that I received. So can you please explain me why did drop NA method did not drop these 78 values? That's my question that I'm going to ask chat GPT next. So I did this. I ran this code in which I gave it this code first, starting from remove, remove rows. But, and I put it in square brackets. But after when I run this code, so now I gave it this code. I still see 78 null values in one column. And then I provided it this code, this answer that I got from my code. And GPT was smart enough to understand the issue. I apologize for the confusion. The issue is that when you removed with NAND values in the last update column, you created a new data frame called DF cleaned. So this is the new data frame that created DF cleaned when it dropped the values. However, when you counted the number of NAND values, you were still looking at the original data frame. Whereas when I called this function here, I was looking for DF. Whereas DF will still have missing values because after removing the NA, we added, we made it a new variable. So if I change this to DF, I should see zero now. So that's the power of GPT. I intentionally made this mistake so that I can show you that this word GPT will be able to solve it for us. And it solved it for me and it said, okay, run this and you will be able to find it. In the next column, we're going to start looking at the duration column where we see this text data and try and figure out how do I extract the 22 number out of this and remove everything else so that I can actually use it as an integer. The next thing I want to do is I want to make this column more useful. So you see how here you have 64 and then total hours in every one. So essentially this column is a string. What I want to do is I want to remove this much part 
and now it becomes an integer and I can actually use this to filter out my courses to see what is the length of different courses. So essentially I'm trying to convert this column into a numerical column. How do we do that? So now I ask GPT, there is a column called duration which has values stored as a string like and I copy pasted the first value. I want to remove everything except number from column that is and in square brackets I provided it with the information that needs to be removed space total space hours. Now it's saying you can use a function called string.extract method along with regular expression to extract only the numeric part from the duration column. Okay, so it's saying I'm going to use a new function called string.extract and that function will help me extract only the numerical part out of that column. So essentially it's saying I will extract this out. Here's how you can do that. So let's run the code and see if it actually works. And let's call df underscore clean after this to see if it actually happened and yes it did you can ignore this part this is just a warning based on the library that we're using so now you see the duration column is only numbers and how did that happen so let's see so the first thing it does is df underscore clean this selects the duration column in the data frame and enables string manipulation methods so it selected this column and it said okay now i'm going to manipulate the string by adding dot str extract slash d plus this extracts the first sequence that is the number sequence referring to number so it finds the first number in the string so the first number occurs here using a regular expression the slash d pattern matches any digit and the plus sign means one more one or more repetitions the parenthesis used for capturing the match digits and then dot as type float this converts the extracted digit to a float data type you can change this to integer if you're preferring if you prefer integer values so first it extracts the specific column you're looking for and then it says that i'm going to apply a string method on it and then it applies the extract method with slash d which means that it's going to extract the numbers only from this string and lastly it converts it to float why because even after the numbers has been extracted the original data type of this data is string so even after i've extracted 24 i need to convert the string into a number so that python can read it accordingly to do that i can use a function called dot as type and what it does is it converts the data type from one form to another so i could have converted it into a float or if i want i could have given an input of integer here and converted it into an integer as well now let's understand this extract feature more in detail on what exactly is happening here. Explain me this in more detail. I'm a beginner to coding. So anytime GPT writes a code that you don't understand, you can always ask it to further explain it to you. And you can do it for any part of the course. Essentially, if I covered anything that you're not fully able to grasp, write a few commands on GPT, help it, make it understand that you don't understand this tell it you're a beginner to coding and it will do a much better job in explaining it to you if you're still in, running into issues don't worry you can message me i'm always available to help out so now let's further understand this specific function so df clean duration we know this is used to extract the column dot string means okay i'm going to start manipulating the string specifically now extract slash d plus this is a string method that extracts a pattern from the text data using a regular expression a regular expression is a sequence of characters that specifies a search pattern for text in this case we want to extract the numeric part of the duration okay so what we're trying to do we're trying to extract the numeric part of the duration this regular expression d plus can also be understood as follows slash d this is a regress shorthand character class that matches any digit 0 to 9 okay so slash d will look for 0 to 9 this plus sign is a quantifier that indicates one or more occurrences of the preceding character in this case slash d so now slash d meaning it's looking for numbers between 0 to 9 and plus means it's look at looking for more than one occurrence so that means the number could exist more than once in the string the parentheses are used to create a capturing group in the regress. This means that the part of the text that matches the pattern inside the parentheses will be returned by the extract method. Okay. Now dot as type converts that string into a float. So in this way, we were able to convert a string to a float number. 
by asking GPT to remove the extra part and extract the numerical data from it and store it as a string. In the next lecture, we're going to start manipulating the data frame by adding more columns to it and assigning different groups based on their ratings. The next thing I want to show you is how to identify and select one or more than one columns from our data frame. So the first thing I asked it was, okay, now let's select two columns only this new rating group and duration. So I specifically said from my data frame here, I want two columns. I want my rating group, the new column that I've created and my duration column only. Where is my duration column? Here it is. And keep in mind, this is the updated duration column after I've removed the R's string out of it. So it gave me a very basic code where it says selected column is assigned a new variable and it's equal to df clean, which is our data frame. And then it passed in two columns in square brackets. So if I run this code, it should be fairly simple. I should see the two columns that we have selected here. So now it's only showing me the two columns that I was looking for as expected. The next thing I asked is I want duration first and rating group after. So what I did first I did was I said I want to see the rating group and duration so it showed it to me this way just to show you that whichever column name you provide first will be the first one shown to you. So if I do this way where I write duration first and then rating group later now my answer will be opposite the rating column sorry this is called rating columns reordered so that's why this wasn't updating so now my duration column is first and my rating column is second the next thing i asked it to do is now let's sort the df underscore clean by number of reviews column so if you remember there is a column here called number of reviews and now I want to sort this, sort my data frame based on this column. And I want to sort it in a descending order. What I mean by that is that the course with the highest number of reviews should be the first course and the course with the lowest number of reviews should be the last course. So how do I sort my entire data frame by a specific column in descending order? So that's the next command I gave GPT. Now let's sort the df underscore clean by the number of reviews column. So all it did was it created a new variable called df sorted by number of reviews. And this is equal to my df cleaned data frame dot. It used the method of sort underscore values by number of reviews. So it takes our data frame, applies the sort on it. And within sort, it gave it the column that we're looking for as the by function so that it knows that okay this is the column I'm using to sort it. Now this is for ascending order. If I want to do it for descending order I need to assign ascending is equal to false. So I will use this code to get my final output here. And then I can call this function by copy pasting it to see what the values are and here you go. Now 45 452,972. That's the highest number of reviews that any course on Udemy has so far. And no wonder it's a Python course as well. So this is a very powerful way to sort the values in a specific format that you're looking for. If you want, and this is something I think you should definitely give it a try, sort it by two columns. So first ask it to sort a column by let's say rating or number of reviews, and then say that once this is sorted by this, now also sorted by ratings. So what it would do then is that first it will show you the course with the highest number of reviews and then let's assume there are two courses with the same number of reviews but different ratings. So then it will show the course with a high rating first and a lower rating second. So please do try this out in your own versions uh, when you're replicating this work to make sure that you understand how different functions work. And honestly practicing is the best way to learn. In the next class, we'll start checking if how to check for duplicate rows and how do we delete them from our data frame if they exist. Now, let's say that there are duplicate rows in your data frame. 
that can impact your analysis. For instance, if one course was repeated 100 times, that would impact our analysis, analysis, right? So we want to make sure that there are no duplicates in our data frame. What do we mean by duplicate? A duplicate means that there are two rows which are identical to each other. So we don't need to have two rows. One row will do the job because essentially that's double counting. So how do we find out first of all that there are duplicate rows in the data frame? I asked a very basic command. Let's check if there are any duplicate rows in the df underscore clean. How can you, here's how you can use duplicated method to check for duplicate rows in df underscore clean. The duplicates is equal to df underscore cleans dot duplicated. So let's try this function and see if there are any duplicates in our. So this function, what it did was it's checking for if for each row, it would give a false Boolean if there are no duplicate rows and it would give a true if that row is a duplicate. Why is it doing by ID? Because if you remember in the beginning, we assigned ID as the index column. So it's using the index column as our frame of reference and then checking for each row if a duplicate exists. Now all the answers that we see here is false. But as you remember, um, these three dots mean that there are a lot of values in the middle. There are actually 83,000 rows in total that it's checking for. So how do we know that we did not miss a value uh, there is no true value in the middle. So there should be a way to check the sum of duplicate rows if there are any. And that's what it did next. This will, so first it explains the first function. This will print a Boolean series where true indicates that the corresponding row is a duplicate of a previous row and false indicates that it is not a duplicate. The ones that we saw here were all false. So we are on the right track so far. If you want to count the number of duplicate rows, and this is exactly what we want to do. You can use the sum method on the Boolean series. Okay. So now instead of using this function, what we can do is we can check duplicates.sum and then print that there are X number of duplicate rows in the data frame. So all it's doing, it's checking duplicates.sum. And what is duplicates? Duplicates is df underscore clean dot duplicated. So it first assigned a Boolean value of true and false to each row in the data frame using this function and stored that column. So duplicates is essentially this call, this Boolean list that we have here. Now it's taking a sum on this Boolean list and the sum will only take the cases where it's true into account. And as I knew, there are zero duplicate rows in this data frame. But what if there were duplicates? How do I remove them? So now just like we did the drop na method, there is a method called drop duplicates. Uh, take, I would suggest you explore this method on your own when you get a chance to make sure you understand what it means. So ask GPT, what is the drop duplicate method? What are the parameters? And then use it on your data set as practice to make sure you understand how it works. The reason I'm not covering it is because my data set right now that I'm working with does not have any duplicate values. Plus it's very similar to dropping drop any method so it's doing the exact same thing it finds the duplicate rows for you and drops them from the data set in the next lecture we're going to start filtering the data set in terms of how do i extract courses with a specific rating or how do i extract courses that were created in a specific year or how do i extract courses which have a certain duration so these are some par powerful filtering techniques that i want to uh, want you to understand so that you can use pandas best for your analysis. Now let's say that there are duplicate rows in your data frame that can impact your analysis. For instance, if one course was repeated 100 times, that would impact our analysis, analysis, right? So we want to make sure that there are no duplicates in our data frame. What do we mean by duplicate? A duplicate means that there are two rows which are identical to each other. So we don't need to have two rows. One row will do the job because essentially that's double counting. So how do we find out first of all that there are duplicate rows in the data frame? I asked a very basic command. Let's check if there are any duplicate rows in the df underscore clean. How can you, here's how you can use duplicated method to check for duplicate rows in df underscore clean. The duplicates is equal to df underscore cleans dot duplicated. So let's try this function and see if there are any duplicates in our 
so this function what it did was it's checking for if for each row it would give a false boolean if there are no duplicate rows and it would give a true if that row is a duplicate why is it doing by id because if you remember in the beginning we assigned id as the index column so it's using the index column as our frame of reference and then checking for each row if a duplicate exists now all the answers that we he see here is false but as you remember um, these three dots mean that there are a lot of values in the middle there are actually 83000 rows in total that it's checking for so how do we know that we did not miss a value uh, there is no true value in the middle so there should be a way to check the sum of duplicate rows if there are any and that's what it did nest this will so first it explains the first function this will print a boolean series where true indicates that the corresponding row is a duplicate of a previous row and false indicates that it is not a duplicate the ones that we saw here were all false so we are on the right track so far if you want to count the number of duplicate rows and this is exactly what we want to do you can use the sum method on the boolean series okay so now instead of using this function what we can do is we can check duplicates dot sum and then print that there are x number of duplicate rows in the data frame so all it's doing it's checking duplicates dot sum and what is duplicates duplicates is df underscore clean dot duplicated so it first assigned a boolean value of true and false to each row in the data frame using this function and stored that column so duplicates is essentially this column this boolean list that we have here now it's taking a sum on this boolean list and the sum will only take the cases where it's true into account and as i knew there are zero duplicate rows in this data frame but what if there were duplicates how do i remove them so now just like we did the drop na method there is a method called drop duplicates uh, take i would suggest you explore this method on your own when you get a chance to make sure you understand what it means so ask gpt what is the drop duplicate method what are the parameters and then use it on your data set as practice to make sure you understand how it works the reason i'm not covering it is because my data set right now that i'm working with does not have any duplicate values plus it's very similar to dropping drop any method so it's doing the exact same thing it finds the duplicate rows for you and drops them from the data set in the next lecture we're going to start filtering the data set in terms of how do i extract courses with a specific rating or how do i extract courses that were created in a specific year or how do i extract courses which have a certain duration so these are some par powerful filtering techniques that i want to uh, want you to understand so that you can use pandas best for your analysis Let's try out a few more filtration techniques because I believe this is one of the most powerful ways of working with pandas. So let's view all the courses with duration greater than 10 hours. How do I do that? It does the same thing. It goes through the duration column, looks at the courses with length greater than 10 hours, creates a boolean out of it, and then calls the data frame on that boolean list to extract the data set. So let's copy this, run this here, and I will just copy this here again to make sure I can get the list out and now you see it has filtered the courses by the duration column and you see only the courses which will be above 10 will be shown here so there are 16,000 courses in on Udemy which are greater than 10 hours long next let's try and filter out all the courses which have greater than 50 reviews so same exercise again it goes through that specific column assigns a boolean based on the condition we provided and then calls that boolean on the data frame to extract the data set we're looking for. So let's see how many courses have greater than 50 reviews. So that's almost 35,000 courses have more than 50 reviews. Now let's do something powerful. Let's apply. So we have so far gone through four conditions. We check the courses which had greater than 50 reviews. We check the courses which had greater than 10 duration. We check the courses which were created in 2022 and we check the courses which had a rating of 4.5. Now, how do I apply all those four conditions together? So that's 
the task I asked GPT to do next. Now let's apply the four conditions we discussed all together. And this is an important thing to note here that I did not provide all the four conditions again. It remembered. So it said rating is greater than 4.5, created in 2022, duration is greater than 10 hours, and number of reviews are greater than 50. So now what it's doing it, it created a boolean with and condition between them. So the rating is four, greater than 4.5. Creation year is 22, duration is 10, and number of reviews in 50. So now if I run this part only, this will also give me a Boolean list first, which is essentially checking through all the parameters here. Made a mistake in copying. Yes. So now it's giving you a false or true answer based on if all the four conditions are met. And then based on that Boolean, it's going to apply it to the entire data frame to get the answer that you're looking for. And if I call this data frame, now you see there are 282 courses where all four conditions that we have specified are met. Now what if we want to further drill down and filter by a specific instructor ID. So if you remember instructor ID is also a variable available here. So here is my instructor ID. So now I want to use a specific instructor ID and filter out all the courses corresponding to this instructor while maintaining the same conditions. So now what it did was it added one more condition in the list saying that okay the instructor ID should be equal to this value. And now I believe this instructor has only one course that was launched in 2022 and meet all the conditions. So if I search this I should be left with only one course in my data frame. Yes, total Python 16 days to become an advanced Python. So this is the one course that we have filtered out based on specific conditions. In the next course, we're going to start further drilling down and discuss how can we filter out courses based on if they contain specific text in a specific column rather than just in equal to. Now let's try and filter out courses that contain a specific word. So for instance, I want to filter out courses that contain Java in the title column and sort them by highest rated to lowest rated courses. So two things happening at the same time. First, I want to filter out all courses that contains Java in their title and then sort them from the highest rated to the low, lowest rated. So to filter out the data frame based on the condition that the course title contains Java case insensitive. So it doesn't matter whether it's capitalized or not. You can use the string dot contains method with case is equal to false. So in case it's capital or not, both of them will be picked up. And then you can sort the resulting data frame by the ratings column in descending order. Okay. So same thing again, it goes, first thing it does is it selects the title column. And then if it says that the string contains Java, so this will give me a Boolean list first. So if I call this column DF, so this will give me a Boolean list of true and false. It will be a true if the title column contains the word Java in it, otherwise it would contain a false in it. Now, now it's going to, now the next thing it does, is that it passes this boolean list through the data frame again to get a list of java courses and these are all the courses that contain java in the name so you see how whether it's capitalized java or it's java script both of them are included here is just java dash so it picked up all the java courses so there are 1324 courses with java in their title that's interesting. And the next thing it does is that it sorts the resulting data frame in a descending order by assigning it false 
and by the column rating as I assigned it to. So now if I run this, I'm going to get a sorted column based on the rating. So over here, if I go back to the previous one, this is not sorted because since I see 4.5 before 4.7, but now that won't be the case. It's starting with five and then it moves on to lower ratings all the way to zero. So if you want to filter out columns based on a specific container value that, okay, I don't want an exact match, but I'm looking for columns or rows that contains a specific string. You can also do that in pandas. Now the next use case that I want to do is I want to filter out who are the top five instructors based on the number of courses that they have published. So if you remember, there is a column called instructor ID, one ID for each instructor. I want to figure out based on this IDs that what are the top five or top 10 instructor based on the number of courses that they have launched since Udemy was started. So I gave it a basic prompt saying, now let's filter out who are the top five instructor based on the number of courses. And what it did was it filtered out the instructor ID column and did a value count and then n largest is five. So it's going to show the largest values and then first five of them. So let's try this. I copy this code and then I'll copy the print command as well. So this shows me that, okay, the highest number of courses by is by this instructor ID 5058914 and he has 400 or she has 485 courses. And the fifth one still has a very high number of courses, which is 240 courses. Now, what do I want to do next? I want to figure out out of these courses, how many are above 4.5 rated. So I gave it a very simple prompt saying how many of their courses are above 4.5 rated. So the first thing it did was, if you remember, it, it created a variable called top instructors here, which contains the top five instructors by the number of courses. So now it called in that variable and stored it as an index list, as, as a list. So now the next thing it did was, it wanted to figure out what are the top instructors courses. So these are the IDs of the top instructors. So it filtered the data frame based on the instructor ID is in top instructor IDs. So it goes through the entire list of columns, uh, the entire column of instructor ID. And if the instructor ID in a specific cell matches the instructor ID here, meaning it's one of these five instructor IDs, it will give a true Boolean value. Otherwise it will give us false Boolean value. And based on that, it filtered out the entire data frame. So if I run these two right now, Actually, yeah. So let's see what do we get here. So these are the list of the top courses by the top five instructors. This is the list of the instructor IDs. This is the list of their courses now. What do we want to do next? Filter for courses with rating above 4.5. So same thing, it's going to go to this specific data frame and then apply a condition of greater than 4.5 and then filter those out from the data frame. So now after I run this code, I will only have the list of courses which are rated above 4.5 and are from top instructors. So now you see all the ratings are greater than 4.5. At the same time, the instructor ID would be the same as the instructor ID in these five lists. Now only the last step is left, which is to get the count. And how did it do that? It just added a dot count in the end for this specific function. So let's copy this now and run this. So what this will do is number of courses above 4.5 ratings. See, it did not do a decimal here because that would destroy the meaning in Python. So it kept it as 45. GPT was smart enough. Top instructor high rating courses, group by instructor ID and rating. And this is what will get you the answer that you're looking for. 
now in the next lecture we're going to start discussing the group by and the pivot table feature and move on from there so in this lecture we're going to start exploring the group by feature of pandas data frames and for that we're going to work with a new data set so now if i go here in my files you will find another csv file called fortune underscore thousand and this is essentially a list of companies in the us the top thousand companies based on 2022 i believe and these are your headers columns company rank rank change revenue profit number of employees sector city state newcomer CEO founder, CEO woman, profitable, previous rank, CEO website, ticker and market cap. Based on this, we are going to work on our new Jupyter notebook. So I started it with this exact same prompt that I used last time and I said this time my file name is this and my index should be based on the column rank. And if you see rank is a column here which is the second column which basically ranks the companies from 1 to 1000 so first gpd did not understand that i'm actually asking to provide me the pd.read function so it said sure i can help you with that Pro please provide me with precise instructions on what needs to be done so i said let's import the data and it understood the job and it gave me the code i copy pasted it and i ran it and my data set has been loaded now as you can see the top companies in the us are now showing up as the top five because i am specifically assigning my index to be ranked so the first five companies will show up and as expected it includes walmart amazon apple cvs and united health group once i imported my data now we're going to start working by group by so I said group by based on sector column. Where is my sector column? Here's my sector column. And basically what sector column does is it assigns a specific industry sector to each company. So for instance, Walmart and Amazon are retail and Amazon and on technology and CVS Health and United Health Group are healthcare companies. So I copy this and I paste this here. This will give me my sector. What sector is, we will understand shortly. So essentially what sector does is it breaks down the data frame into smaller data frames let's learn this by an example from gpt so a group by is a function in pandas that is used to group a data frame by one or more columns when we group a data frame by a column we are essentially splitting the data frame into smaller groups based on the unique values in that column for example if we have a data frame with a gender column then it could have male values or female values and we group the data frame by gender column we will get two smaller data frames one for the male group and one for the female group similarly we have multiple sectors in our file here when we are grouping by sector we are essentially creating smaller data frames within our big data frame one for each sector so a technology sector has been created and if i want to access that specifically i can do that directly now so just another way to filter through the data and extract the data that we need in summary group by is a powerful tool in pandas that allow you to easily split a data frame into smaller group based on the values in one or more columns and then perform operations on these groups so for instance i can filter by let's say sector technology and then sum up all the revenues within the technology sector or some of the profits or the number of employees and I can use this analysis to further build on and get insights from my data that might be pretty difficult in Excel the next thing I asked GPT was please provide me a list of common methods that I can apply on my sector group now so now similarly similar to the previous data types that we have worked with we know all of these methods from before and we can apply all of them here the first will show me the first few rows the last will show me the last few for each group so remember dot head only showed me the first few rows but now we're talking about each group values so it's going to show me group values for each one so you see aerospace it showed me one apparel business chemicals energy so these are all the sectors they have become my index now and for each sector it's going 
it's showing me the first value. If I do last, it's going to show me the last value for each sector. Now, if I change this to size, it's going to show me the size or the length of each sector. So the highest number of companies exist in financials and the lowest number exists somewhere in telecommunications, I believe. If I want, I can further sort this list out to understand how many companies fall under which section. The next thing I want to go through is I provided all the columns that are available in my file to GPT so that it understands what are the columns you're working with and as we move on in the course it would know which column to address based on the information I ask it for and it said sure I'll keep the list of the columns in my mind as we move forward now let's use the group method on sector groups and view companies in technology sector so now what I'm saying is like that we have created a sector underscore groups here right and we can apply a lot of attributes here but now I'm saying I just want to see the sector underscore sector group for technology sector only so it created a new variable called tech group in which it essentially takes the sector underscore groups and then use a get group method just like the get method we studied before and applies it on the technology sector specifically so if I copy this code and I run this what I will see now is all the companies that are present in the technology sector I'm intentionally removing the print command because then my output is more visually appealing if I do with print command it's going to show it to me as this whereas if I remove it I get to see the entire data in a much better format that's why I keep switching off the print command so these are all the companies in my technology sector it went to sector under groups and it got the groups which refer to technology as the sector here and Apple Alphabet which is Google Microsoft Meta is Facebook Dell Technologies all the way to DocuSign being the thousandth company now in the next class we'll start working on numerical analysis with the get group method the next thing that I want to do is I want to group by more than one column so now I gave it a command saying let's group by two columns now sector and state and it gave a very basic code saying that okay df dot group by on sector and state so let's copy this why am I doing by state because different companies are based in different states California Michigan Arizona so now I want to figure out if there is a relationship between states as well the next thing I asked was so I just ran this basic command of group by as you know by now that it only groups them by a certain sector and assigns a key to it there is no actual output of this command but now let's use it and try and get more data analysis done through it so let's repeat the same exercise as above find companies in each group with the highest profit so what am I saying here just like we found the companies with the highest profit from each group by which was the sector in our case now we're going to apply that here on two columns so sector and then state so we are first of all we're going to look at sector let's say technology sector and for all the states we'll figure out which company has the highest revenue in California within technology then New York within technology then Michigan within technology and so on and so forth so that's what we did here so now it does the same thing it calls the sector underscore state underscore group applies the lambda on the profit gets the max value and outputs three columns company revenue and profit so let's copy the code and run it here I will again delete the print command so that I get better visualization and here you go so now you have arrow and space defense within that you have California first and then the profit for that and revenue for that and then CO Florida and so on keep in mind that this Florida revenue is higher than California but this is not what we're looking for what we're looking for is 
aerospace companies within California and give me the one with the highest revenue. So it filtered out Teledyne Technologies and this was the one with the highest revenue. Similarly here, wholesalers, the state was PA and then within PA, Wesco International has the highest profit and that's what it filtered out because we're doing it by profits here. The next thing and the last thing that I want to show you in the group buy method is how to use the aggregate method. What does the aggregate method do? This code uses the ag method to apply the sum aggregation function to the revenue column. So what I asked GPT to do was, was to use the aggregate method now to get the sum of the revenue for each group. So now what it's doing is it's picking up California and aerospace and defense and summing up the revenue of all the technology companies within this group. So if there were 10 technology companies within California and aerospace, then it will give you the sum based on that. So how does that work? It called the same function sector underscore state underscore groups, the same function we're using here, and then the dot ag method on revenue. And how are we aggregating it? We're aggregating it by sum. If you want, you can use a different operator here as well, and a lot of different operators will apply. If you want, we can get a list of operators here. Could you give me a list? of operators that can be used instead of some in the above function. In the meantime, let's run this code and see what do we get. Sorry, I forgot. Okay, so now you have the revenue summed up across all companies which are in California and aerospace defense and so on and so forth. This is the list of the different features that we can call or operators we can call with the aggregate function. Let's try one of them. What if I do? Let me copy this here and I will call it count. And I will replace this by count as well. And I will replace sum by count here as well to keep everything neat. And now you have the number of companies in each. So in this way, I wanted to walk you through the group by method on this specific data set to show you how powerful this filtration process could be and it can help you generate a lot of insights from the data. Now we're going to come back to this specific spreadsheet or specific data set when we're talking about visualizations but the next thing we're going to cover is how to merge and concatenate and jo join multiple data frames that are related using different columns so in this section of the course we're going to start working with multiple data frames at the same time so far what we have done is that we have learned and understood how to work with a single data frame and perform different tasks on that one data frame. Now we want to see how do we figure out how to communicate between data frames, link them together based on different columns and what are the features available in Python that can help us do that. So to start with, we're going to start working with a new data set this time. So I have five files essentially and you can download them from the resources here. So the first file gives you the week one sales, the second one gives week one satisfaction, then week two sales, list of customers and the list of food items. And I started with a very basic command, exactly the same way as we did before. You're an expert in Python, specifically in Pandas library. You will help me write the code for data analysis for Jupyter Notebook. I will provide precise instruction what needs to be done understand the task and write neat concise code with comments accordingly after providing the code you also need to explain what the code does by explaining each line to a beginner so exact same prompt as before and then i said we are going to import the following files and i gave the name of the five files that we are going to use 
and these files are available in the resources section for you to download and follow with me as I go along the code. Sure, let's start by importing the necessary libraries and loading data files into Pandas data frame. Here's the code. So I copied the code, I pasted it here and I ran it and now I have my output. I can double check it. We know this much now that if I type head here, I can see the output. Let's take a quick look at all the files we have. And in the next lecture, we're going to start playing around with them. So I'm just calling the dot head method on each one of them to see the first few rows in each one to get a basic idea of what the data set is. So now you see the week one sales give me the customer ID and the food ID. So customer number 537 bought food ID number nine. Okay. Week one satisfaction gives me the satisfaction rating received for that week. And it's just one column. Week two sales gives me the same data as week one sales that is customer ID and food ID. So the customer 688 bought food ID number 10. Now this is the list of customers. Okay. So now these are all customers in our database. So everyone is assigned an ID. So this ID in the customers table refers to the customer ID in week two and week one sales table where it says customer ID here. Similarly, we have a food table where we have a food ID, food item name and its price. And the food ID here is the same as the food ID here. So, so far I have understood that I can actually combine the customer's data set with sales data set using ID and customer ID because these two are essentially the same. So if you're familiar with Excel, we can do a VLOOKUP function and look up the relevant data from each uh, in, from the other data set based on the common key. In this case, the common key will be ID and customer ID column. Whereas I can also look up, combine the food ID key with the food ID key here and they both have exactly the same name. So that should be an even easier job for me to do and figure out what does this 10 refer to. For instance, this three refers to taco and it's 2.99. So if I want, I can add another column here based on that. And that is what we're going to explore in this section to see how do we merge and play around with different data sets at the same time and make a new data set out of them. Now that we have imported our data set and looked at it, what are the different columns and tables available to us? Let's start playing around with it. So the first command we're going to explore is called concat function. Please explain concat function to a non coder by making an analogy, analogy with Excel, then apply concat on week one and week two sales data frame. So what are week one and week two? Week one is this customer ID and food ID and week two is this customer ID and food ID. So essentially the same columns in both data sets. Sure, in Excel, imagine you have two worksheets, sheet one and sheet two, just like we have week one and week two with the same columns and you want to combine these two worksheets vertically. Vertically means on top of each other. So I'm copying the rows from sheet two at the bottom of sheet one. That is stack sheets two's rows below sheet one's rows to form a new worksheet. This process is analogous to concat function in pandas. The concat function takes a list of data frames and combines them along a particular axis, zero for rows and one for columns. By default, it combines along the rows. So by default, it will combine along rows. That means it will stack them vertically. It maintains the column names and data types across the combined data frame. Okay, so let's apply the concat from week one and week two sales. Now, what does this function do? pd.concat. So this is the way to call the function. It takes the first table and then it takes the second table and then it passes a parameter called ignore index is equal to true. So first we should try this without the parameter and see what output do we get and how is it different with the parameter. So very simple. It just applies the function and calls in the two data set names. The first data set is called week one sales. The second one is called week two sales. And if I call this fun data frame now, I should see that both the data sets are combined. Now there are 500 rows in the data set. Each data set by itself had 100 rows. So if you want to check that, I can rerun this command to 
to show you that okay there are 250 rows here and if I remove the head here it will show me the number of rows here so both data set has two columns and 250 rows so now the combined data set has 500 rows and two columns but one thing you would have noticed now is that the numbering is all wrong it starts from 0 and then it ends at 249 I would expect it to end at 100 so why is that so what pandas is doing is that it's using the original index that was there in the original data set so it starts from 0 goes all the way to 250 and then starts from 0 again and then goes all the way to 249 so that's why the index is not the way we expected it to be so now that is why GPT added an extra parameter called ignore underscore index is equal to true so what it's essentially telling pandas is that don't use the existing index from the tables rather create a new index and now you see it goes from 0 to 499 as expected because now because we passed in this specific parameter it's considering it as a one new brand new index and not relying on the index on the input data frames anymore the next thing i want to walk you through is can we achieve the same result using append method so append method is also achieves the similar task you can achieve the same result using append method the append method is a convenient way to concatenate along rows so this can only be applied applied along rows since we are stacking them vertically over each other append can also do the same job and but if we were stacking them horizontally then append wouldn't work and we would have to use the concat function instead so let's see what does append give us i would expect an exactly the same answer as above and this append also has an ignore index is equal to true parameter so yes it starts from row 0 5379 to 2496 5379 to 4096 so exactly the same output can be achieved using the append function as well in the next lecture we're going to start talking about the merge function which is one of the most powerful functions for combining data frames the next function that i want to talk about is called the merge function so i asked a simple prompt now let's talk about merge function please explain to a non-coder given analogy with excel the merge function in pandas is similar to performing a vlookup or an index match in excel so just like we can pick a key from one data frame and then look it up in another data frame using vlookup or index match we can do the same thing in pandas with merge function it allows you to combine two data frame based on common columns known as the key so there should be at least one column in both your data frames that should be the same for this to work and that column is called the key so if we take a step back and go back to our data set if i want to combine customers with week two sales data my key would be id and customer id because essentially these two mean the same thing it's just different names this is also referring to customer id this as well but if i want to combine week two sales data with food table then I need to combine food ID with food ID here and both of them have the exact same names as well so in this way we can identify what is the key column and then use it as a parameter in the merge function let's say you have two excel sheet worksheets sheet 1 and sheet 2 and you want to bring the data from sheet 2 into sheet 1 based on a column column common column employee ID in excel you would use vlookup or index match to achieve this because I'm going to look up employee ID in one and then look go into the other sheet find the corresponding employee ID and get whatever value I want in my existing sheet so similarly I can use the merge function to combine two data frames based on the common column there are different types of merge options available in Panda such as inner outer left and right which determine how the data frames combine based on the key values and now here's a brief explanation for each inner means only rows with matching keys in both data frames are included in the result outer means all rows from both data sets are included filling with missing values where there are no matches left means all rows from the left data frame are included and rows from the right data frame are included only if there is a match so everything from the left but only the match from the right and then right is opposite to left where everything from the right will be included but only things from the left will be included if there is a match now a better way to understand this is by using 
a Venn diagram. So here you have two functions, two uh, data sets A and B, each one represented by its own circle. So inner join means that you're only looking at the intersection of the two sets. Now, on the other hand, this means that I'm looking only at set A and here I'm only looking at set B. If I move down here, I'm looking at only set A, excluding even anywhere there is an overlap of set A with set B. So only things included here will be what is only in set A minus any interaction of set A and set B. This is the opposite everything in set B minus the interaction of set A and set B. This is the union or which means everything and this is the outer join and this is the outer join minus the intersection. So when you do a left join you're doing something along this line when you're doing a right join you're doing something along these lines. When you do an outer join you're doing this and when you do an inner join you're looking at only the intersection. So these are the four things that it mentioned uh, in, in the ChatGPT chat. Inner, outer, left, right. So now let's start playing around with it. Now let's apply inner join. Inner join meaning I'm only looking at the intersection between the two. On week one and week two sales data, explain the code, explain the output that I will get from the code. Use column customer ID for the join. So what I said here was that I'm going to combine these two data sets. Week one and week two. Now both data sets has two columns, customer ID and food ID. The first thing I want to do is I want to see the intersection based on the customer ID only. So if 537 is available in both data frames, I want to, three, I want to see two rows. 537 with the food ID row for week one and then a food ID row for week two. So let's see what GPT gives us. Before applying the inner join in week one and week two sales, it's important to note that performing an inner join directly on these data frame based on customer ID column may not provide meaningful results as it would only return rows where the same customer made purchases in both weeks. So this is what we're looking for. The same customer made purchases in both weeks. This, not, this may not be a common occurrence and the resulting data frame may be quite small or even empty. So now let's, that's just GPT's hunch trying to help us understand that what are we trying to get with this, but this is exactly what I've been looking for. The same customer made purchases in both weeks. Now let's understand this function as well. So it assigned a new data frame called merge underscore cells in which first it picks up the first data set week one underscore sales and then it applies the merge function and then in brackets first it will provide the second data set. So week one merge to week two what is my key my key is my customer id and suffixes week one and week two are added so that we don't get confused between other columns because there will be a food id column in week one and there will be a food id column in week two so how do you discriminate between the two food id columns because now essentially you'll have two food id columns and one customer id column once the data sets are combined so it's going to add underscore week one and underscore week two after food ID to keep them distinguishable. So let's copy the code and run this and see what do we get. So this is what we got. So now customer ID 537 ordered food ID number nine in week one and five in week two. 155 got nine and three. 155 got 1 and 3. So now you see 155 is repeated. 503 is also repeated. Why is that the case? Let's try and figure out. Okay, let's filter in customer ID is equal to 155 from this data frame. Okay, so this is exactly what I did next. I tried filtering out where there was more than one customer ID being repeated. Okay, so 155 ordered the food twice in week one but once in week two so essentially what's happening here is that there were two rows for customer id equal to 155 in our food id week one why because probably customer id 155 
came to the shop twice or ordered twice. So that's why it created two rows. Now, when we asked it to merge the cell here between week one and week two, in week two, customer 155 only did three, only bought once, which was food ID number three. So now Python got confused that, okay, should I assign this three to nine or should I assign it to one? So it added it in both places. So keep this in mind, always have unit test cases ready to test that your code is working the way you expected and spend some time and explore the data set to understand what it is referring to. So let's see what this function did now. This part of the code, so again the same exercise, first it created a boolean based on the customer ID equals to 155 condition and then passed that boolean through this data frame of merge cells and then assigned it to a new variable called customers. So in the last lecture, we combined week one and week two sales data based on the customer ID column. So this was a, in this way, we were able to extract the data of the customers who ordered in both weeks. Now, I want to identify all those customers who not only ordered in both weeks, but they ordered the same food as well. So I only want the rows where both the food IDs are the same in both weeks. So if you ordered food ID five, let's say it refers to sushi. So then it came back in week two and also ordered sushi. So this will tell me that, okay, these are the customers who are interested in specific products and I should advertise these specific products to them. So that could be my use case for this. So that's what I'm trying to do next. Next, instead of just filtering by customer ID, let's try and filter out by both customer ID and food ID to get an intersection of both to see how many customers ordered in both week and in both week ordered the exact same food. So to do that, I asked GPT, there are two columns in week one and week two, sales data frame, customer ID and food ID. Let's do an inner join based on both columns which essentially means customers who came in both weeks and ordered the same food ID. To perform an inner join on week one and week two sales data frame based on both IDs columns, you can use the following code. And now it essentially kept the exact same code and added food ID here as well. So first it was looking at one column. Now it's going to merge it by both columns. So it's just added food ID here as an extra parameter because now we are merging by two columns instead of one and now you have a list of eight customers only who ordered the same food id in both weeks let's see what gpt says so explanation week one so this part of the code this line uses merge function method on week one sales data frame to perform an inner join with week two sales data frame the on customer and food ID parameter specifies the common columns keys used to join them. The suffixes week one and week two parameter used to append suffixes to overlapping columns name for both data frames to differentiate them in the resulting data frame. Now you would notice that week one and week two are not present here because we are essentially asking Python to extract the same data points from both the weeks. So in both weeks they have the same customer id and in both weeks they have the same food id that's what we're filtering for so that's why we don't see week one and week two in this output and then lastly merge cells which is the starting part is the name of the data frame it assigned to it now let's look at customer number 21 specifically so all i did was i said Let's filter in customer ID is equal to 21. So if you want to filter something through GPT, always remember if you say filter out, it will exclude it. So if you want to view a specific uh, row equivalent to a value, always say filter in. Out would mean that show me everything except that. <laughs> so just a small tip to keep in mind. To filter rows in the merged data set at merged sales data frame where customer ID is 21, you can use the following code. And it did the same thing that it first created a Boolean based on the condition we assigned and then passed that Boolean through the data frame and then stored it as a new variable. And now I can call the data frame 
to see what's in there. So now 21. So this customer came in both weeks twice and ordered number four twice. That's what it means. It came in week one and ordered four and then it came in week one again and then ordered four again and then in week two it came and ordered four and then in week two it came again and ordered four again. So essentially this customer came four times twice in each week and all four times it ordered the same dish which was food ID. So that's what essentially this function tells me. Now in the next lecture we're going to start discussing other forms of join because so far we have worked uh, other forms of merge we have worked with very basic ones. Now let's talk about outer join. Outer join meaning that I want to extract all the data that is available in both the data frames all together in one single data frame. So how do we do that? So that's the next question I asked DTP. Now let's talk about outer join at suffixes and indicator on week one and week two sales data frame. So because we're doing an outer join, there will be multiple columns which might have the same name in the two data frames. So it is important for us to add suffixes here to make sure that we know which column is coming from which data frame. So the first thing it did was it said an outer join in Pandas combine two data frames and include all rows from both data frames. And if there are missing values, it will fill it with NANDs when there are no matches. Here's how to perform an outer join. So now the only thing that changed in this code was that it added an extra feature saying how is equal to outer. So before this wasn't there because by default pandas would default to inner join. So unless you want to specify that your how parameter is not inner, you don't need to write it. Here we wanted to do outer. So that's why it wrote an extra parameter in the same code. So week one with week two, customer ID and food ID columns and how is equal to outer suffixes are week one and week two and indicator is equal to true. What indicator allows us to do is that it tells us which data set is this row coming from. You would understand this better shortly. So see now you have the customer ID and food ID. You have 493 rows because some of the rows are present in both the data sets. So these, those were combined together into a single row. And then it added a new column based on indicator is equal to true, which basically indicates that after the merge, which data set is this row coming from. So this row is coming from the left only. And this one is coming from the right only. What if we want to see the rows that are available in both data sets? So I just copy pasted my code here because GPT was not able to understand what I'm referring to. So I said I ran this command and got the data frame and I copy pasted the code from above that it gave me, which is essentially this code. And I said, now, how do I view only rows which are present in both? So now it said to view only the rows in the merge cell data frame that are present in both week one and week two, you can filter based on underscore merge. So it's asking us, it's telling us that we can use this column that I've added to figure out which one are present in both. And how do we do that? Left only, right only and both. So there are three options available in this column and we want to filter out based on both. So now it created a new data frame called both weeks. It looked at the merged sales underscore outer, which is the data frame that we are working with. And then it passed a Boolean in it saying that underscore merge column should be equal to both. So now if I run this, I will end up with a few lines only because now it's looking for the intersection of the two sets. So these are the only values which occur in both of them. So 578, 5, 9221, 3043. So only a handful of rows where the value is the same in both the data sets. Now over here in the previous command, I ran a basic command to better help you understand what merge, what how the how parameter works on the merge function. So let's read through the example that GPT provided and try and understand better using a very basic case on what how means uh, when you're doing using the merge function. So it says that merge function, uh, the how parameter in the merge function can take four values, inner, outer, left and right. And it determines which row from the input data frames are included in the resulting data frame. So I'm trying to decide which rows from the two data frames I'm going to use in my final data frame and I can give in four values. 
let's use a basic example to demonstrate so we have our first data frame in which we have customer id 1 2 and name alice and bob we have our second data frame where we have customer id 2 3 and age 30 and 25 now just by looking at it i know both both data frames has customer id 2 is available in both of them so i know bob's age is 30 but i don't have that information about alice and i don't know what customer 3's name is and i don't know what alice's age is now let's look at each join type so if we do an inner join that means we're only looking at the intersection so we will have one row of bob because that's the customer id that is present in both the data set so we end up with customer id 2 bob is the name and age is 30. now let's do an outer join if we do an outer join we'll end up with three rows the first customer is alice the second is bob the third we don't know the name for because the name is not available here for the third one and we know the age of alice is unknown because we only know that alice is the name of customer one but not the age bob's age is 30 that's visible for the third one, we know the age is 25, but we don't know what the name is because the name of customer ID 3 is not available. Now let's look at the left join. A left join includes all rows from the left data frame A and only matching rows from the right data frame, data frame B. Non-matching rows from the right data frame are filled with NANs. So now if you're looking at the left join, we're going to start with our first data frame which is data frame a so this is our starting primary data frame and then we'll add a new column and fill in the values from data frame b from wherever they are available so i know just by looking at the data sets that okay for alice i don't have a value so this will be a nan for age and for bob this will be 25 uh, sorry it will be 30 for bob because that's two so that's exactly what we got here. Alice is Nan and Bob is 30. Now let's do a right join, which is the other way around. So now I have these two data sets. I'm doing a right join. So I'm looking at my secondary data set first. So customer and ID and age will remain the same. And I'm adding a new column here for name. So I know my customer two's name is Bob. So here I'll have a new column called Bob and customer three, I don't know the name for. So this will be Nan. So I have one column added with Bob and Nan. And that's exactly what happened. It just switched the order. So we got added a new column saying Bob and Nan here when we did the right join. So that was just a quick walkthrough to help you understand how the how parameter works and how you can use it in different ways uh, when working with multiple data frames. So now that we have worked with inner and outer joins, let's try a few examples of left and right join to figure out how these parameters work with merge. So I gave a very basic command and this time I'm using a different data frame. So I'm saying now let's do a left join on the data frames week underscore one sales and foods. From week underscore one sales, the key column is food ID and in food data frame key column is also food ID. So let's go and check out the data frames first. So this is my week one sale data, which has customer ID and food ID as two columns. And then this is my food data frame where I have food ID, food item and food price. So now I know that, okay, food ID is available in both my foods data frame and my week one sales data frame. So this is the column that I can use to combine the two data frames together for further analysis. And that's exactly what I did here. I said, make food ID the key in week one underscore sales, as well as in the food data frame. So now the GPD did the job. It said week one sales with food info is the new variable. Now it looks at week one sales, merges it with food. And now it added two new variables saying left on and right on. What are these doing? So it's essentially saying that my left is week one underscore sales and my right data frame is foods. So it's saying when you're combining the two data sets using a left join, the key in week one underscore sales is equal to food ID. So that's what it's saying here. Left on is equal to food ID means that my key 
on the week one sales is food id and write on food id means that my key on the second data frame which is foods is also food id how it's a left join because i defined that here let's read gpt's explanation as well this line uses the merge method on the week one sales data frame to perform a left join with foods data frame the left on food id and the right on food id parameter specify the key columns for join in each of the two data frames and how on left parameter sets the join type to left so because we are assigned a left parameter to join in how it's going to take everything from week one and then give me the corresponding values available in week two in that data frame in in foods data frame for that specific week one sales the output will be a data frame containing all rows from week one sales matching rows from foods data frame based on the food id column non-matching rows from the foods data frame would be filled with missing values in the resulting data frame so now let's copy and paste this and see what do we get so now we should get the list of all the sales that were done in week one so 250 rows as expected and so the first two are coming from the first data set then it uses the food id from the second data set and then gets us these three columns as well food item price and food id so now we know that nine refers to donut and the price of donuts is 0.9 and this was bought by customer 537 so in this way we were able to combine the week one sales data with the food id data using food id as my key on both data sets and we did it on the left join so that we can preserve all the rows from the week one sales and get the corresponding food item for them right there in the same data frame so in this lecture next lecture we're going to start talking about visualizations and for visualizations, we're going to use a different library, which is called matplotlib library. It works very well in congestion with uh, pandas because this will allow us access to a lot of other functions that can help us create really visually appealing uh, graphs and scatter plots and lines and bar charts, whatever our use case will be. So for this section, what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to introduce you to a new library which is called Yahoo Finance. Why will I do that? Because Yahoo Finance library was, will allow us to extract data about different stock prices very easily from uh, the Yahoo Finance website. Once we extract that data, we're going to use that data to plot different sort of graphs and then also optimize them. For example, I want to change my X axis labels, Y axis labels. I want to change the color of the line. I want to add a chart title. What, what if I want to add a legend? What if I want to increase, decrease or increase the width or the size of the line that I'm creating? So all those things that you can do in Excel or PowerPoint, um, I'm going to show you how you can do them through matplotlib library by extracting the data from Yahoo Finance. And I'm not, as always, I'm not going to write a single line of code by myself. I'm going to rely on GPT to write the code for me. I'm only going to ask it to give me the right prompts to do that. So let's start with the work and see how powerful matplotlib library can be with GPT in terms of creating visually stunning graphs based on the data analysis that we have done. So once again, we're going to start with a very basic priming prompt saying that you're an expert in Python, specifically in pandas and matplotlib library. You will help me write the code for data analysis for Jupyter Notebook. I will provide you precise instructions on what needs to be done understand the task and write neat concise code with comments accordingly after providing the code you also need to explain what the code does by explaining each line to a beginner and gpt replied saying of course i'd be happy to help please provide the instructions for the task and i will create the code along with the with an explanation for each line now we're going to start coding the first thing that i want to do as i explained in the introductory video that okay we're going to use the yahoo finance library and to extract the data for different stocks and then use that data for visualizations. So the first thing I asked it is that first we need to get data from Yahoo Finance Library. What do I need to do? So similar to what we did, if you remember in one of the first few classes, 
we imported the libraries of pandas and matplotlib using the terminal or the command terminal in our windows and mac so it's asking me to do the same thing i specifically asked it for mac if you're using a windows you can change this prompt to windows and it will provide similar instructions now this is something that we have worked with pip install the only thing that has changed is that instead of pandas we're now working with yahoo finance so the first thing i want to do is actually get this done and get go open my terminal install the yahoo finance library so that i can start working with my code so the first thing i'll do is that i already have a terminal running so i have an open instance of jupyter notebook already that i'm working with so first i need to close it and then install pip for y finance and then start coding so how do we install it if you remember we did it by pressing command or control c and then give it a y for yes and now it's shutting down the kernel once it has shut down now make sure you're in the same environment that you're working with so that you end up so you don't end up installing the library in some other environment so i am in my same python data analysis environment that we have been working with throughout this course so now i can go back and install y finance now what i expect it to do is to give me a message saying that the library is already installed requirement already satisfied but because you don't have it installed this if you follow this this is exactly the same way that you can get it installed on your pc once the library has been installed you can open the jupyter notebook by using the same command that we used before which is jupyter space notebook if you're having issues or if you're not sure what the command is, you can of course ask GPT, I want to open Jupyter Notebook from the terminal. What is the command that I use? And it will give you the command for it. So remember, GPT is, a, is your best friend when it comes to coding now. It will write all the code, debug it for you, and find you all the instances of issues that you're running into. So now a new instance of Jupyter automatically opened in my browser. I want to, and here I've created a new file called Yahoo Finance. Now, let's start coding in the specific notebook for, that we have created for Yahoo Finance. So the next thing I did was, first, when we need to get the data from library, what do I need to do on my Mac? Okay, so I installed PIC. Now it says, once the package installed, you can use it in your Jupyter notebook to fetch the data from Yahoo Finance. For example, let's say you want to get the historical data for Apple. Now, this is the stock ticker for Apple. And this is the ticker it used in the code. If you want to do it for a different company, you can definitely do that. Amazon will be AMZN, Microsoft will be MSFT. And you can ask GPT that, can you please tell me the stock ticker for a specific ticker? If you're still having trouble with it, you can go to Yahoo Finance and look for the ticker names for different um, companies so that it works accordingly so now i just copied the code that it gave me what is the code doing first it imports the y finance library then it uses a specific ticker symbol then get the data on the specified ticker so it goes to y finance dot ticker function and gives in the apple ticker symbol and then it takes the historical data it creates a new data frame called historical data where it gets the history by period start date from x2 from 2020 to 2023 that's what the code is doing here so let's run the code and see what do we get actually i want to remove the print command because the output would be more visually better if i just call in the data frame so here's the data that we got so this is my date starts from 2020 january 2nd ends at 2020 2012. 30 2022 1230 this is my opening price so the first price that we get in the morning this was the highest price for that day this was the lowest price for that day and this was the closing price now as expected these prices are very close to each other 72.4 73.5 72.1 and 73.4 so the high and low is almost 1.5 dollar difference between them max volume tells you how much volume of the stock was traded 
dividend tells you if there were any dividends issued on that day and stock split tells you if there were any stock splits happening on that day for that specific stock. So now that we have imported the library, the next command I gave it was that I copied all the names of the columns from open from date to stock splits and I provided it to GPT and I said these are the columns in the resulting data frame remember that and it understood the job yes I remember the columns in the resulting data frame when you fetch the historical data using Y finance the resulting data frame will have the following columns and it actually wrote an explanation for each one of them the stock split ratio on that date if any for instance this is the explanation it provided for stock splits now in the next lecture we're going to use this data that we have down we have now for the price of apple to actually make a plot out of it in this lecture we're going to start plotting the graphs that we're looking for using the matplotlib function so the next prompt i provided it was that now let's plot a line graph using matplotlib on close so why did i say close because if you see here there are four different types of prices available in this data set I want to use only one of them because I, I use all four they're going to be very close to each other and they will have a huge overlap so I just want to rely on the closing price which is the price as the end of the day you can use any one of them for your analysis if you want I just picked up close for my data right now so now let's plot a line graph using matplotlib and this is the library we're going to use the first thing it asks us is that please install pip install matlib from the terminal again but if you remember when we were working with our first few sections in terminal with anaconda and jupiter and setting them up we actually uh, downloaded installed the matplotlib library already uh, when we installed pandas so this should already be already be there in your environment if you were following the instructions at that time if you weren't and it's not there then you can do the exact same exercise that we did with yahoo finance open the terminal copy the command in the same base environment pip install matlib and that will do the job for you now because it's already installed in mine i'm going to skip this step now here's the code to plot the line graph of the closing prices first it's going to import matplotlib then it extracts the close column from the historical data frame so this is where it goes to the historical data frame and then provides the column name in square brackets and calls it a closing price now use plt.plot function to plot the closing prices so plt.plot is the function that is used to price uh, to plot the graph and the input parameter is the closing prices which is the close price of the apple stock it also added three more things here so it said the title of the graph is this the x label is going to be date and the y axis label is going to be closing price usd and then finally to display the plot it says plot.show so let's copy the function and see the graph that we get so in this very simple way we were able to plot the graph of apple stock price from 2022 to 2023 almost um, without writing a single line of code now there are a lot of things that i can update in this graph and that's what we'll start covering in the next lecture in the last lecture we plotted a very basic simple of the closing price of apple now there are a lot of things that we might want to modify in this graph and that's we want what we want i want to cover in this lecture so for instance you see the x-axis it's overlapping i cannot read the dates properly except the year part which also gets mixed up the closing price is on a factor of 20 on the y-axis i want to reduce that i want to see 0 50 100 and 200 maybe there is no legend in the graph what if i want to add legend what if i want to change the color of the line what if i want to change the background color so what are the different features that are available within matplotlib let's figure those features out first and then let's see how we can use chat gpt to write better version of the code to modify all of these things that you're looking for so first explain me in tabular format different features available in matplotlib library that we can use 
to better visualize this plot of Apple close price. Include most popular first. Few examples are title, color, legends, labels, and ticks. What are ticks? Ticks refers to these markings that you see here on the x axis and y axis. So 60, 80, 100, 120, these are the ticks. So now GPT gave me a table of different features that are available for us to modify and work around with. Here's a table of some popular features available in matplotlib library that can be used to enhance the visualization of the Apple closing price plot. The features are listed in the order of their popularity. So the first feature it talks about is the title. So I can give it a command called plot.title and this is something it used before. Plot.title Apple Inc. Apple Closing Price. So this became the title of the graph that we were working with. So if I want, I can go and change this. For instance, if I want to remove this part, actually I'll just remove this entire thing. Apple Price. So now the title of my graph has changed. The next thing is x-axis plot x labels add a label to the x-axis this is also there in our previous graph called date if i want i can change it to month year and then here where it says date this part should update similarly i can change my y-axis label which is closing price here so let's say i want to get rid of the usd part so now my Y label is only closing price and I've read, gotten ridden of the USD part. The next one it talks about is the line color. So right now as you see the color of the line that it plotted for us is blue. If we want to change the color of the line we can mark it to red and this will change the color of the line in the plot. Supported colors include standard names, hex codes and RGB values if you are familiar with that. If you want to further explore this you can ask GPT what are my options for the line color and it will provide you those details. The next thing it tells you is the legend. So right now our graph has no legend. On the graph it doesn't tell us anything about what the blue line is about. If we want to add a legend we can use this feature to add another box within the graph for the legend and we can actually choose the position of where the legend goes to. For instance it could be at the bottom of the page in the middle or at the top or on the right top corner or left top corner depending on our use case. In the next lecture, we will continue exploring what are the other options available that we can play around with to better visualize our graphs. Continuing with the features for matplotlib library, the next one we have is grid. Now adds a grid to the plot. So what does this mean? So for instance, right now, our background is all white with blank on it, right? If we want, we can add a grid on it of vertical or horizontal lines or both of them. And we can actually choose the number of lines vertically and horizontally that we want to add to make it a very small square grid or a much larger square grid, depending on the use case that we have. The next one is X axis ticks. So customizes the tick on the X axis. Tick underscore position is the list of positions and tick underscore labels is the label is the list of labels for the text. So first, for instance, we look at this. Now, this is the way we can solve the overlap. So first of all, we can decide the positions of the text, how far they should be from each other. And secondly, we can decide what should the label be of these texts. And based on the data that we are working with, we can totally modify this and make the text more suitable and more visually appealing. And we will work with this in the next prompt. I'm just trying to give you a basic idea of what these things mean before we start writing the code on it. Similarly, like we said for X axis, we can change the text for Y axis. Line style. Change the line style of the plot and other options to include R dotted, dash dotted or solid. So right now, this is a solid line. If we want, we can change it to different types of lines Again, if you want to further dive into detail and fig figure out what are the line styles available, you can ask GPT and it will provide you different line styles that are built into matplotlib library. The next thing I want to talk about is marker style. Add markers to the plot. Other mark marker styles include 
point cross square. So let's say I want to mark the highest price and the lowest price in the graph. How do I do that? I can do that with the marker style and I can define which type of marker do I want to use? Do I want to cross it? Do I want to add a square around it? If I want to add a circle around it. Line width. We can also change the width of the line that we have plotted. Figure size changes the size of the plot. Width and height are the desired dimensions in inches. Subplots. Create a grid of subplots with specified number of rows and columns. And it also gave me a link to the official matplotlib doc documentation. So here you have the entire documentation and different features available. I would suggest when you have time, go through this. And if there is something that you, you think is very powerful and you want to utilize that, you can copy paste that content into GPT for it to learn and ask the prompts from there that, okay, given based on the information I provided you, can you apply this function on my data set? And it would do that for you. So in the next prompt, we're going to actually start applying these features which apply to our chart and see how visually appealing our graph gets and how much better information we can communicate through our graphs by matplotlib library. In the next prompt, what I did was I asked GPT, now can you apply all these features on the Apple plot? Apple, remember AAPL is the ticker for Apple. So I'm referring to the plot that we have made of the closing prices of Apple at least apply those that make sense. If you need more info, for instance, tick labels for X axis, you can ask me. So I told GPT now from the list of the table of the features that you've provided me, apply them on the graph that we have created and use your common sense, apply those that apply, actually makes sense. And if you have any questions for me, you can of course ask me and then I can provide you more details based on what you asked me. So it didn't ask me any questions. It directly went forward and applied the plots. One interesting thing that it did was it used the NumPy library for the first time now. So if you remember in our first section when you're working with the terminal with pandas and matplotlib, we also installed NumPy library. So you already have this installed if you're following the instructions then. If not, you can go to the terminal and get it now. But now it's using NumPy library specifically. Why is it doing that? Let's try and understand the code first. So the first thing it does is it imports the NumPy library as NP to help with array manipulation for tick positions. So now in pandas, we were working with lists, series, and data frames. Matplotlib takes into as input arrays. What is an array? Array is a list of values. So if we want to manipulate an array in a specific way, for instance, let's say I want to sort it by highest to lowest or by a specific date from increasing to decreasing dates or ascending order then Python would need NumPy library to be able to manipulate those arrays. And that would be a much faster way too. So that's why it first downloaded the NumPy library to be able to manipulate the arrays. Then it created a new figure with a custom size using fixed size width and length. So what does the figure means? This is the figure, the square image that it created. Imagine for a second that the graph doesn't exist inside, just the white square, that's the image it's referring to. And it's here. If you want, we want, we can change the size. So right now it's sort of a rectangle. If I do 10 by 10, it will become a square. So it entirely depends on us. What size do we want to define for it? Plot the closing prices with a blue solid line. Markers are circles and a custom line width of 1.5. Okay. So it will plot a blue solid line. Each point will be marked by a circle and the custom line and the width length would be 1.5. This is the next thing it did. The color is blue, the marker is circle, the line style is dash, the line width is 1.5 and the label is closing prices. Define the x-axis tick positions as the first day of each year. Okay, so since we have three years of data, I'm expecting three points now. And the tick label as the years themselves. And it assigned the three tick labels as the years. Where did it do that? For tick position for year in years. How did it get the tick positions? So it used, created a new call, uh, variable called years. And what it's doing here is it's calling the NumPy library to arrange closing prices by their index of minimum year to maximum year. So the first one is minimum year. The last point is maximum year. 
and there is an increment of one year in the middle so let's say our data is from 2020 to 2023 our first point becomes 2020 our last point becomes 2023 and then it will add one label at every plus one year so 2020 2021 2022 and then lastly 2023 and then based on that it assigned the tick positions set the x-axis tick using plot.x ticks tick positions and tick labels customize the y-axis with a step of 50 using np dot range and plot dot y ticks so now what it's doing is right now there is a difference of 20 between the two points what it did was it started making it into multiples of 50 so my new label will be 50 100 150 200 my x-axis label will be 2020 2021 2022 and 2023 add a legend so because there was no legend in the graph it added a legend and a grid to the plot using plot dot legend and plt dot grid it's true display the plot using plot dot show so now let's copy paste this and see how different the new graph becomes okay so now this is as expected based on the code description it provided us the multiples are now of 5 50 instead of 20 which was previously the case if you want we can change that the labels on the x-axis are yearly now so 2020 2021 2022 and since we don't have much data for 2023 i believe the data ends on uh, 31st december 2020 so it did not create a point for 2023 it added a legend here saying apple closing prices plus each point on the graph is now marked by a circle and different different points on the graph are being joined by a line which you can show here see here it also added a grid there was no grid before it was all white it added a grid of squares and if you want we can manipulate the size of the grid as well So in this way, we can modify the existing graph to a much more visually, visually appealing one. And we will continue doing that in the next lecture where I will ask it to make specific changes to the graphs that it has created. For instance, to make the color of the background purple, to change the line color to something else, to change the x-axis labels to monthly, I would say, because yearly is a lot of gap and see how Python uh, interprets those commands and provides us with the relevant code. So now I'm going to ask GPT, can you mark the maximum minimum price on the graph by a circle around that point? Now, what would that point actually be? That point will actually be here and somewhere here. So let's see what code GPT gives us and how can we use that? So 1 to 7, same as before, and basically it's referring to the previous prompt. And now in 8, what it's doing is find the index and values for the maximum minimum value, closing price using id max function. This is a function we are aware of and we have used before, which basically finds the maximum and minimum value on a specific column and then notes down the index value corresponding to that. And then when this is called, we can call the index of that specific value and plot the respective value on the graph. And then lastly, it plots the circle around the maximum minimum closing prices through plot.scatter. The S parameter sets the size of the circles, edge colors set the circle border color, face color is none, make the circle transparent, and line width set the width of the circle border. 10 to 18 are also same as before. The updated plot has circles around the maximum minimum closing prices highlighting those points on the graph. So let's copy this now and run it. So now what I expect is that versus this graph, I should see two circles on my graph now. And that's exactly what GPT did. Here it marked the minimum point and here it marked the maximum point. Now I can further modify this and ask it, can you give me maximum minimum points for each year and make them different colors? Or I can say, can you give me the points that are above a certain threshold or below a certain threshold? 
what I want to do next is that I want to show how easy it is to manipulate the data and build a new graph from scratch using GPT. So here what we were doing was we were plotting the closing prices, right? Instead of plotting the closing prices, what if I want to plot the percentage return of prices? So what essentially means is that for each point, GPT will calculate the percentage in price versus the previous day and will plot that percentage change onto the graph. So instead of having a plot of 100 of prices between let's say 50 to let's say 180, we're going to have Y axis as percentage change on a daily basis. So we'll see one, two, four, five, seven, eight, ten. 10, around these values of the percentage changes that are happening. So that's the prompt that I gave it next. Can we convert this to percentage change in price? And that simple prompt, GPT was able to understand it and give me the code for it. And basically what it did was it started with the percentage change variable where it took the closing price and calculated the percentage change and multiplied by 100 because percentage change will give you a value in decimals. And that's the only difference that it did. Otherwise, 2 to 18 remained the same. So let's copy this and paste this here and see how that changes our graph. So now it's a completely different plot. It's telling us what was the percentage change on a given day. And it's all jumbled up together. If I want, I can change the size of it. Or if I want, I can use lesser points. So let's say on the flow that we decide to can we make it percentage change by month? And it understood the job and it wrote the code for it. Let's first see what the code does. So resample the closing prices by month using the resample function with M meaning monthly frequency. So that's the first thing it did. Instead of calculating the daily percentage change, now it's calculating the monthly percentage change. And take the last value of each month using the last function. Calculate the percentage change in monthly closing prices using the percentage change function and multiply by 100 to get the percentage. 3 to 18, same as before, but the plot now shows the monthly percentage change in after closing price. So now I'll copy the code and I'll run it. And here you see I have essentially run the code again and now it looks much more visually appealing. So now I know that in February, the percentage change was minus 12%. In March 2020, the percentage change was minus 7%. And in April, I believe, the percentage change was around 14%. Now I can further manipulate this data. It's giving us everything on a decimal value of 0.77. I can modify this scale to starting with minus 15 all the way to 20 two or 25 percent because that's where the range of the values are so that's something you can work around with i would highly advise you that you use this uh, yahoo finance as an exercise gather the data of different stocks or different companies you're interested in and start working around with it to figure out what are the different ways you can manipulate the data and plot it and uh, work with different features offered by the matplotlib library so in this lecture, let's look at a different type of a plot. So, so far we were working with a line and plotting the dots on the graph, but now let's try and plot a histogram instead. And working with the same example, I'm going to modify my code. So this time what I'm asking GPT is, is that first create a group of percentage ranges from mine less than 10% to between 10 to 0%, 0 to 10%, and then greater than 10%. So all my values of percentage changes that I see here, so we have from 2020 January to 2022 11, around 35 points on our graph right now. Each dot refers to one point. Now I want to see bucket these points into specific ranges. So let's say greater than 10% will be all the points that fall below here. So a couple of these points, a less than, minus 10 percent sorry and then if i look at greater than 10 percent then that's a line somewhere here and all these points are greater than 10 percent changes and similarly i can further divide the points from minus 10 to 10 percent in 0 to minus 10 percent and 0 to 10 percent so that's the first command i gave to gpt that can you please group them by their percentage change 
in a new group. Then calculate the count of each bucket. So let's say I'm looking at greater than 10%, which is somewhere here. So one, two, three, four, maybe this one, five, six. So there are around seven or eight points where months where the change in Apple stock price was greater than 10%. So that's the second thing I said, calculate the count of each bucket. And lastly, I said plot a histogram where with X axis as the group. So these are the groups that I'm referring to less than 10% to greater than 10% and Y axis is the frequency of that group. So let's say greater than 10% change happens seven times. So the height of this bar should correspond to a Y value of seven. So now let's copy this and run the code and see what do we get. So GPT was so smart that it exactly understood the task that I was asking for. There are four times the Apple stock price went to less than 10% greater than between minus 10 to 0% 13 times, 0 to 10% is 10 times, and then greater than 10% is only eight times. So now I know just by looking at it that most of the time, my price range is between minus 10 to 10%. There is also a chance, a high probability that it can increase by greater than 10%. And there are only four instances out of total 35 where it was less than minus 10%. So without even understanding the code or what it wrote, we know exactly what it did. But let's spend some time and understand what it did. So the first thing it did was it defined the bins. And here is it defining the bins. If you remember, this is something we covered in the previous sections as well, where we defined the brains when we wanted to divide our result into specific group ranges. From negative infinity to minus 10, 0, 10, and positive infinity because it had to give a starting value before minus 10 it gave it a negative infinity value and it gave a positive infinity value as your last point after 10 percent group the monthly percentage changes into specific buckets using pd dot cut so it used the pd dot cut function to group all the percentage changes within this ranges that we have come up with calculate the count of each bucket using value underscore count function a function we are very well aware of and sort the result by the index. Create a new figure and set the size to a specific size, set the background color to purple, place the histogram, plot the histogram using plot, set the title and labels, customize the x-axis, customize the y-axis, and display the histogram. Now, what I want to do is, let's change the background color to black and change each bar's color to a different color. I want my graph to be visually stunning. So do what you think best so that when I add it to my PowerPoint presentation, it grabs the attention of the user and engages the user. Ignore my spelling mistakes. GPT is smart enough to understand it. So that's why I don't focus too much on it. But since I'll be providing you all these files, I guess it's better if I update it. So let's see now how it interprets our instructions and writes the code. So in the last lecture, I added a prompt saying that let's change the background color to black, change each bar's color to a different color. I want my graph to be visually stunning. So do what you think is best so that when I add it to my PowerPoint presentation, it grabs the attention of the user and engages the user. So I provided some more context to GPT so it can better understand the job and it comes up with ideas on its own to better modify and make my graph visually appealing. And I further provided context by saying that I'll be adding it to my PowerPoint presentation. So make sure it grabs the attention of the user. So now it wrote the code and gave told us what the code does. So it says one to seven stays the same. In one to seven, it was essentially gathering the data and figuring it out how to best present it. Then it defines distinct colors for each bar using a list of color names. 
It plots the histogram with the specified colors, white edge color, custom bar width, and a custom transparency. 10 to 18, same as before, but custom font sizes and colors for titles, labels, and text. So it changed the bar height, a bar width, and its presentation. Plus, it added custom font sizes and colors for title, labels, and text. It also added grid lines because it thought that it would be more visually appealing. And then finally, it wrote a command for plotting it. So let's copy this and run this function and see what it gets us. So now, although it was able to do that, we lost a lot of things. There are no labels here, which we saw in the previous graph. So I'll have to go back and update my prompt. You dropped the labels of both axis legend and title add them back so gpt is still writing the code but it was able to understand the job and it said apologies for the confusion i'll add the labels legends title back to the histogram here's the updated code now keep in mind gpt will always miss things this is one of the reasons for building the course that remember that it's it's a helper tool that really which is really powerful in understanding your job and giving you the code that you want but it will always make mistakes you will have to update the prompts and that's what prompt engineering is all about you don't have to write the code but you need to be able to understand the underlying language of python and different library features to be able to modify the code that gpt is writing for you so let's copy the new code that it provided us and write it back essentially what it did was it would have added plot title, x label and y label somewhere here. It also did a few things on the text to make sure the ticks are added back. Okay, so now these things are there but they're not visible probably because of the color. That's the problem we're having. So I went back to my previous prompt where I said that okay write me, you drop the labels of both access, legend and title, add them back. So it ran the code, but I still didn't get what I wanted. So I further provided it more information. I said, they're still not visible. Is this a coloring issue? Keep in mind the text that you're adding for labels, ticks and title cannot be white. Ticks are my X and Y axis points that are being marked on the graph. Labels are my X and Y axis labels and title is my graph title. I apologize for the misunderstanding. I'll change the text color for label, ticks and title to a more visible color. Here's the updated code and it updated the code for me i copied it and now the graph looks much better but it picked a very light color which is not that visually appealing and the legend color is still black that's why it's not picking it up fine so what i'm going to do next is i'm going to change the background color to white again and i'm going to ask it to update the colors everywhere so basically it's using this color here cyan that's why the size is not that's why it doesn't look uh, appealing so let's go back and ask it can you make the background color white and change the color of all titles labels ticks etc to black also let's add one more thing reduce the width of each bar to half of what it is right now and let's see will this create a more visually appealing graph for us so while gpt writes the code we can also change these things here because we understand the basics of coding now we know what's happening what if i just change this color to let's say red what will change so this is the y tick position now this become red okay so where else does it say cyan here this is the x label i can make it red too and then the white label let's make it black and where is my x label so let's see what things have changed okay so now let's find the x ticks and change them too x label red y label black x ticks so it should be here so let's make this red too so in this way, I was manually able to modify this. 
let's find the title of the graph next so that we can update the title too so here it goes plot figure black these are the colors of my bars axis is this h color is white plot title so the title line should have a color in there let's make this black i have to keep it small so if i run this now now my title is black now what is one color that we haven't modified so far which is wrong is the color here of the legend so the legend color face color is black and the edge color is white let's change this and see what does this do first so i think this is the one that's causing the issue because we are showing black on a black background so what if i make this white okay that completes the job for me i changed the background color to white so my frequency is visible now if i want i can play it with around with it the other way as well i can make this black and i can keep this okay so this was the original position we started with so what if i change this because is the color of the edge color okay so this is the background uh the shape edge color which is white but what do we want the color to be inside so this is should be white i did the right thing the first time so in this way without actually writing the entire code again we have developed that basic understanding to be able to do these changes by ourselves as we move along actually black would look more appealing here and here and if you want let's say i don't want to see a blue i want to see a gray here so i can go back and change this to for instance use distinct colors for each bar okay so let's change blue to let's say green so now this became green so a lot of different ways you can actually modify the data now that you have developed that understanding and gpt has written the code for you you can also start manipulating things based on what you want if i want i can change the labels here too for instance says i can type less than and here i can type greater than let's keep this capital too so now the labels have been changed to less than and greater than so a lot of different ways that we can manipulate the graph now that we have developed a basic understanding of it our code has loaded in the meantime can you make the background color white and change the color of all title label text to black also reduce the width of each bar to half of what it is right now so that's the code it provided us 22 is one change it did change the weight of each bar to half of its current size and the rest remained the same and now you see looks a lot more visually appealing after reducing the size on a white background now one thing that is wrong here is the label the label is showing us the frequency of red color only whereas there are four colors so i might as well reduce the label from here of the red color and that would make my graph more accurate and that is it for this section we have created a histogram with bars representing the count of the number of times a specific percentage change occurred by dividing them into a specific range So in this last lecture of the visualization section, I wanted to show you one more type of chart that you can create using GPT and Jupyter. So now I said, can we show the same information in form of a pie chart instead of a histogram? So what it did was it calculated the same function, but now it's going to use a different form, which is plot.py function so that it shows us the information in the form of a pie chart. So here you see, you see, we the information is shown in terms of histogram so it's, it's a good way of understanding what is the count of each one but if we want to look at the same information in percentage form then this is a better format so now you see 30 percent is when it's between 0 to 10 percent 37 percent between minus 10 to 0 percent greater than 10 percent 22 percent of the time and less than minus 10 percent is only 11.4 percent and this also looks a very visually appealing chart and it was able to understand and grasp the information and plot it accordingly. Uh, that's it for the visualization section. 
in the next section we're going to start talking about how to what are the different ways of importing and exporting data into Jupyter Notebook using the pandas library and we'll see what are the options available for us to work with now in this last section of the course called importing and exporting data I want to walk you through some of the most powerful techniques and ways that you can import data into the data into a data frame in Jupyter and then export it back into different formats so what are the different ways we can do this so far in the course we learned that we can import the data from CSV and we did that multiple times when we were working with for instance the fortune uh, 1000 companies data when we were working with the restaurant sales data we imported it through a CSV file and there was a pd dot read underscore CSV function that we were utilizing now there are a lot of other different ways we can do this if you were following the visualization section you learned about a feature uh, a specific library called Yahoo Finance which stores all the data for financial data for different companies and we extracted the stock data from Apple so so far in the course even before we start this section you know two things first you know how to import data from a CSV second you know how to get financial data from the Yahoo Finance library now to build up on that I want to show you a couple of more hacks for instance if I want to import data from a Wikipedia table so for instance if you see on the screen here this is the page for list of S&P 500 companies and this Wikipedia page has a table and this table contains a lot of information about the 500 companies which are in the S&P what if I want to use this link URL to get this data from the Wikipedia table onto my Jupyter how do I do that so that's one of the ways we can explore it secondly what if my data was stored in an Excel file instead of a CSV file how would my PD read function change in that sense and lastly we will also talk about exporting our data so for instance we exported um, we learned how to export our data in the form of CSV in the form of Excel file and in the form of text file if that's required so that's what this section is about learning and understanding different ways of importing and exporting data we will also see what if we have five or six different files in one folder for if you remember when we were working with the restaurant sales data we had week one sales week two sales food ID CSV customer ID CSV and customer satisfaction CSV so there were five files we wrote five lines of code to import it now is there a smarter way to do that can I basically tell Python go into the specific folder and create a data frame for each file that is available in that folder how would that work so that's what this section is about understanding different ways of importing and exporting data and from the next lecture we're going to start working on it so again as I'm starting a new tab I'm going to write the same basic priming from you're an expert in Python specifically in pandas and matplotlib library you will help me write the code for data analysis for Jupyter notebook I will provide you precise instructions on what needs to be done understand the task and write neat concise code with comments accordingly after providing the code you also need to explain what the code does by explaining each line to a beginner so it said okay sure now I can help you out with that so then I went to the specific link copied it and provided it as a prompt let's import the data table table available on this Wikipedia page using pandas and that's what it say, did so it assigned a new variable to this link called it URL and it did pd dot read underscore HTML so if you remember so far we were doing underscore CSV now we did HTML and it said header is on zero, row zero because the first line is the header so let's copy the code and run it copy paste here and I'm going to remove the print command to make it more visually appealing and here you go we have imported the data from that specific URL that we were looking at and exactly the same way I can confirm by going back to the URL that okay the first row is MMM industrials 1957 Minnesota MMM industrials 1957 Minnesota now if I want I can play around with this data even more do a lot of analysis I can group by GICS sector count the number of countries in each or I can look at the location sector and count the companies based on that or I can divide founded 
in a range of said was it founded before 1950 1950 to 2000 or after 2000 and make a pie chart or a histogram out of that so there are a lot of different ways we can start working with this data so I, in this section i just wanted to show you that this is also another way of importing the data from a specific url so in the last lecture we imported the data from a specific url available for the wiki table the next thing i did was i gave the column names to gpt so that it understood that these are the column names no output needed for, from you so you said okay i got it these are the columns the next thing I, I want to show you is how to export this data into an excel file so i wrote a very simple command you can do this on any data frame that you have we have this data frame ready now what i'm saying is can you help me export this into an Excel file? And it uses a very simple basic function, df.2 underscore Excel. So first we would read underscore something. That's what we were doing, read underscore CSV, read underscore Excel, read underscore HTML. And now it's using two underscore something. So two CSV, two Excel, two HTML, whatever the way we want to go about. So now if I copy this code and I paste it here, what it's going to do, I don't expect an output here because essentially what this code is doing is outputting the data, exporting the data into an Excel file. So if I go back to my main folder, I should see a new file here called SNP 500, XLSS. So this is an Excel file that it just created for me. If it, this was a CSV, it would be ending with .csv, which you would see for other files. But here I specifically asked to create an Excel file. So that's what the program did for me. One thing to note here is that it added a command for index is equal to fall, false and it did that because the index is equal to fault argument tells pandas not to include the row index in the exported file. So if you view here this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, this is an index that Python assigned to this data set, right? We don't want that in our output data because this holds no significance to us. So that's why it excluded it. If you want to include it, you can call it true. Or for instance, let's say you, you, you were using your symbol as the index. So therefore, then it holds a lot of significance, right? Because that's the actual symbol of the company you're referring to. So in that case, you could have made it true. And when it exported the data, it would have included the index as well. The next thing I want to quickly show you is how would you convert or export this data in a CSV format instead of an Excel format that we did before. So it's going to use the exact same command and instead of a CSV uh, instead of an Excel now it's going to say to CSV so if I copy this and I paste it here and run this command again I won't see an output but if I go back to my data frames I should see a new file created here called SNP 500.csv and you would notice here that it not overwrite this file because the file type is the different for both of them what if I want to convert it what if I want to export it as a txt file which is a text file then we can do to csv separator so it added a separator so that it can it is able to identify where a column ends and new column begins and it kept the index as false so now if you want to further understand this the separator argument tells pandas to use the tab character as the delimiter between the columns if you want you can change it to comma 2 and then it will be the exact same format as a csv file so now i should see a new dot text file here in my folder and now you see i have an excel file i have a csv file and i have a dot text file so those are the three ways we usually want to export our data based on our requirements so i have done it using all those three of them So the next prompt I gave it was create five different data frames and make sure there are no spaces in the name of the DFs. Otherwise, Python won't understand when I call a specific DF for further analysis. So now what it did was it wrote a separate line for each one of the data frames and call it DF 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which technically does the job for us, but then it would be difficult for me to remember that which one is from week one sales and week two sales essentially basically df1 is week one sales and df5 is week two sales but this naming convention is not good enough for me for further analysis so i went back and i said include the original csv file name in data frame name 
names but replace the spaces with underscore so now what it did was it created a new function and it said if the file name contains a space replace it by an underscore so now if i run this code i will get what i was looking for all the five data frames will be imported and at the same time wherever there was a space it changed it to underscore now this dash might sound odd to you so if you want you can give it a command further that if there is a dash replace it by nothing or by an underscore and it will understand and do the job but at least now i know that okay this is my week one sales data and this is my week two sales data so making it much easier for me to understand how the code is being processed so this was a very powerful way of importing uh, more than one file at the same time using python and jupyter and this was done with the import os library import os library you would probably have it because this is one of the first things we imported along with pandas but if you don't then you can go to the terminal and then install using pip this specific library as well if you're having issues you can ask of course ask gp to do this now this piece of code where it took me a couple of prompts to get what i want was run in 3.5 if i run this code in 4 it's going to do the job in one prompt and i won't have to do it for in 3 so that's another example to show you that sure 3.5 will do the job but 4 is way better when it comes to critical reasoning so it will do the job much better and that brings us to the end of this section where we covered how to import data from various sources including urls including different libraries such as yahoo finance from excel files and so on and then how to export data from into csv files into text files and excel files and we finally covered how to import a more than one file using one set of code by giving it one prompt of a specific folder path and location you can also export multiple files at the same time let's say after your analysis you ended up with three different data frames you can export all three data frames at the same time by writing a similar prompt as well in this lecture we're going to start working with a new data set and this data set is specifically on e-commerce purchases what is the data the data has a couple of different columns available such as the address slot the time of the purchase browser info company credit card details security provider email job id so it has a lot of data about the order purchases from an e-commerce store so let's start working with this data set i have downloaded this data set onto my pc you can also do that the link is provided and then i go to chat gpt and i start coding so the first thing i said was i have a data set saved at this location on my mac and i provided the location where the data set was stored and i said and this is the name of the data set and the name of the data set is e-commerce underscore purchases because this is the name i used to save the data set let's import the data into our jupyter notebook so the first thing it said was pip install pandas we have already done that in the part of the course so we don't need to do that again so i'll directly go to the code i copy the code what is it doing import pandas as pd it defines a file path name and then gives that file path name that i provided into the pd read underscore csv function and then prints the header of the data set so now if i go to jupyter here is my import as pd function i actually don't need it because i've already done it here define the file path over here i removed the user's saad ahmed part and started it directly from the desktop because that's how jupyter will read it and then the same pd.read underscore csv function with the file path as the input variable here and then df.head if i run this i get the basics of my data set now let's view all the columns in the data set we know the command but let's ask gpt to give it to us let's view all the columns in the df so from now on i'll call the data set df because that's the name that we have defined here as data frame so it says print df.columns so i just did df.columns which is the same thing as print in jupyter and here are all the columns that i have 
Now, what do I want to do with data res, this data set? So here I've listed down a list of questions, basically what we want to explore in this data set. So let's start going through them one by one. And what I'll do is I'll copy this into chat GPT. GPT will give me the code and I'll run it in Jupyter. So let's start the first one, starting from very basic, very easy steps. Let's display the top 10 rows of the data set. Now, while it's writing, I know it's going to be head and in brackets 10 because that's how I decide the number of rows that I want to view. So let's copy this. I paste it here. And here are my top 10 rows for the data set. If I remove the print command, it was going to be more visually pleasing format. What's next? The next thing we want to do is we want to see the last 10 rows. So this is going to be tail brackets 10 brackets close. Because here it makes me view the first 10 rows with tail I can view the last 10 rows. So now I'll copy this, paste it here. And that's my tail of the data set. What do I want to do next? Check data type of each column. Okay. So now what we want to do is check out how many of the columns are strings, how many are integers, how many are floats, and then we can play around accordingly and change the data types. So let's do df dot d types next. So this tells me an object would refer to a string, integer refers to a decimal number, sorry, integer refers to a whole number, whereas float refers to a decimal number. So most of these are objects, why address, slot, AM or PM, browser info, company, credit card, expiry date, security code, provider, email, job, IP address, language, purchase price. Okay, so I know what are the data types that I have and if I want to change something, I can do it now uh, using the as type function if that's the way I want to go forward with. The next thing, check null values in the data set. So now let's see if there are any null values in our data set and how do we deal with that? So check null values in the data set. To check null values in the data set, you can use is null function. Is null will tell me how many data, if a specific value is true and false using a Boolean. And then I can sum up all the true cases by using dot sum. So that's what it did. Df dot is null will tell me whether it's a null value or not using a boolean of true and false and then dot sum will sum up all the true cases so now i know that okay there are no null values in my data set because it gives me a zero value for all the columns so i'm good i don't need to do any cleansing on my data what's next how many rows and how many columns are there in the data set okay Probably this could be done with size or describe or shape. Okay, so it's going to go with shape, get the number of rows and columns in the data set, rows comma columns is equal to df dot shape. And then it writes a print command to tell us, okay, these are the number of rows and columns. Let's copy paste this. And we have 10,000 rows and 14 columns, 14 columns. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it picked up all the 14 columns and there are 1000 rows. If you look at the tail of the data, so this is our function when we call df.tail and it ends at four nines. And because the indexing in Python starts with zero, so that means there are 10,000 rows in my data set. What's next? The next thing we want to do is we want to check the highest and the lowest purchase prices. Before I run this command, I need to tell GPT what are the columns in my data set so that it knows which column is prices and then it can do the max and min on that specific column. So I'll go back to Jupyter. I will give, give these columns to GPT and I will write a command saying these are the columns in my data set. Please remember them as we do further analysis. 
thank you for providing the column names and the data types i'll keep this in mind as we continue with the analysis and it wrote a summary of it basically rewrote all the columns and their data, data types for its own purposes so now we can go back and tell it to tell us the highest and lowest price and gpt would know that i'm referring to the price column where is the price column purchase price which is a decimal which could hold a decimal value so now it's going to use min and max function to figure out the purchase prices so highest purchase price is equal to it goes into the data frame goes specifically into the purchase price column and finds the max value and then it finds the min value and then it prints the two values as an output So let's run this code. So see it finds DF purchase price. So it goes into this column, the last column here, and then finds the max value. And then it prints it here. Highest purchase price is that value, which is 99.99. And the lowest one is zero. Now let's figure out what is the average price of our transactions. So let's say, what is the average purchase price to find the average purchase price in this data set you can use the mean function on the purchase price column here's the code and now it just change the max and min function with the mean function the average price is fifty dollars what do we want to do next how many people have French as their language? Okay, so let's first figure out, is there a language column in our data set? So let's look at data set and let's see if there is a language column here. Language column is the second last column and now these are the values in this column, but they are in different format. So let's see how GPT interprets this command for us so now French will be referred to as fr so essentially what we're doing is we're going into the language column and figuring out in how many columns is the value equal to fr count the number of people who have French FR as their language you can use the value underscore count function or sum with the conditional statement on the language column here's the code so now it goes French underscore speakers it goes into the language column and it takes the count of the number of rows which has FR as their final value and then it sums them up there are 1097 people who have french language okay job title contains engineer okay so now let's see where are the engineers where is the occupation browser address slot am browser info company credit card email job so now we're searching for in the job column what my concern is right now is that what if an engineer is written in capital letters and one of them is written in small letters python is case sensitive so if i tell it to pick up all the engineers with a capital e there is a chance it will miss the small engineer so what if i want my command to be this so there are two ways i can do this either i can provide both of them or a better way would be make sure it's not case sensitive. So now GPT will write the code making sure that we don't only pick up when E is capital. Any word in engineer could be capital and the code will be optimized for that and it will pick up based on the characters and not their cases. Ignoring case sensitivity, you can use string.contains function with the case insensitive regular expression. So it's going to use dot string function to figure out how many times in the job column engineer exists. And then it assigns the case sensitive function to false 
to make sure that if an engineer is written in small that's picked up as well so let's copy this actually i will ask gpt please explain the code you have written i know it will work i understand what it's doing but i want to make sure that we understand exactly what gpt is doing here the df job this part of the code selects the job column okay string dot contains this is a panda string method we discovered it in the course and we went through it used to check if a given substring engineer is in in this case is present in the string elements of a series the job column in our case okay this is the substring we're searching for in job titles okay case is equal to false this is the optional parameter on this string dot contains method which when set to false make the search case insensitive so therefore i don't need to worry about catch lock regress is equal to false this is another optional parameter in string dot contains method by setting it to false we specify that we are not using a regular expression for the search pattern instead we are searching for a single string pattern engineer by default it is set to true which means that the search pattern is treated as a regular expression sum will sum up all the instances of true finally we take the count now if there is anything in this that you're not sure about that you want to learn further for instance this regress feature is new i don't know what regular let's say you don't know what regular expression means we can just copy this and then ask gpt to further explain this explain this part to me what does a regular expression means here Regular expression are powerful to search, map, and manipulate data. They are essentially a sequence of characters that define a search pattern in the context of strings. The search can can be specified as a regular expression to provide more complex and flexible searches. In this code, regress because we are only looking for a simple string pattern called this, and not using any special regress features. So these regress uh, regular uh, regress feature will be useful when you are searching for let's say specific numbers within the string. Then this comes into play this is one of the things we discovered when we were working with uh, the udemy data set and we had 12 hour duration in one of our columns as the duration of the course that's when it applied regress is equal to true so now back to the code let's copy this and i'll play this here to see what is the number of engineers so there are 984 engineers and 1000 were French speaking overall find the email of the person with the following IP address okay so now we're searching for a specific value in the data set in the IP address column so far we were looking for filtering the data based on specific conditions for instance how many are French speakers okay we found there are 109 French speakers but now what we're saying is okay i want to know the exact row that refers to this ip address now this could be more than one two but my expectation is that probably there's going to be one row with this ip address this ip address would have made one purchase to find the email of the person with the specific id ip address you can use a boolean mask to filter the data frame and then select the email column here's the code so first thing it does is it searches in the ip address column using the lock function and finds where IP address is equal to the specific value. And once it does that, it saves, it searches for the email, the respective email in that row, and then prints out that email. So let's copy this and paste this here. Is Amy Miller at models harrisoncom So it went through the IP address column figure out where is the IP address equal to the specific value and then picked up the email address from there and stored it as the final variable here and then this is just a print expression where it says email of the person with IP address this is and it calls the variable that it defined in the first code what's next how many people have MasterCard as their credit card provider and made a purchase above $50 okay now we're doing conditioning or filtering based on two columns so first we need to figure out MasterCard where would the MasterCard be so which column are we referring to when we're talking about MasterCards browser info company credit card CC expiry CC provider so this is the provider so here somewhere 
in C credit card provider, there is a, there are values called MasterCard. So that's the first thing we're trying to do. What's the second thing we're trying to do? Made a purchase above $50. So the second thing we want to make sure is that our purchase price is $50. So we're going to first search in our credit card provider column and figure out all those rows where this is equal to MasterCard. And then we'll further filter out those rows where the purchase price is greater than $50. So let's see what code GPT gives us for this. To count the number of people who have MasterCard as their credit card provider and made a purchase above 50, you can use conditional statement with the sum function. Here's the code. So first it goes into a data frame for credit card provider is equal to MasterCard and and it uses an, an and condition because we're looking where both the things are true. It has to be a MasterCard plus it has to be greater than 50. So when both the conditions are met, we will count those rows and then sum them up. So let's copy the code. And here you go, number of people with MasterCard as their CC, as their credit card provider and made a purchase above 50 is 405. I can play around here and check how many are. So less than 50 are 411 and greater than 50 are 405. So around 800 people with MasterCard. What do we want to do next? Find the email of the person with the following credit card number. Okay. So now we're going to search for a specific credit card and the credit card details are in this column. So it's going to search in the credit card column and figure out where does the number matches exactly with this number. So let's skip this to GPT and get the code for it. So to find the email of the person with the specified credit card number, you can use the Boolean mask to filter the data frame and select the email column. So exactly the same thing. It assigns that number to a variable. It calls that number through LOC on credit card column and then saves the email value of it and prints it out. And bbberry at right.net is the name of the person who holds this credit card. Then what we want to do is how many people purchase during AM and how many purchase during PM. And that would not be difficult for us to do because here is a column in this data set called AM or PM. So we don't have to filter out the times column and exactly figure out whether it was during the morning or evening time. Rather, we have a separate column already available in the data set, which makes our job much easier. So let's copy the code and print it here and let's see what do we get. To count the number of people who made purchases during AM and PM, you can use the value underscore count function or the AM or PM column. And it did the exact same thing. It counted the number of AMs and the PMs and it's going to output both. Okay, it's giving me an error because I copied the code before it was completely written by GPT. So now 4932. So Time of the day does not make a huge difference, more or less the same amount of people. It's a 50-50 mix between the number of people who bought in AM versus the number of people who bought in the PM. How many people have a credit card that expires in 2020? So now what do we need to do? We need to figure out if there is a column which helps us figure out the expiry date of the credit card. And this is the expiry date of the credit card. Now this might be tricky because this column has month and year. So we might need to extract the year first out of this column to see what that year is and then search that year to figure out when is the expiry date and if it matches with our condition of 2020. So, but before I give more prompts, I want to see how GPT interprets it because it doesn't know the way the data has been stored in that specific column. Although it does know that the data in this specific column is stored in a specific type. So if you look at the data type, 
we're looking at which column we're looking at the cc exp date cc expiry date column which is this column and this is stored as a string so let's see how gpt figures this out and if it doesn't figure it out right we can modify the prompt and ask give it more information on how to do it to count the number of people whose credit card expires in 2020 you can use the string dot contains function with a regular expression on the cc expiry date column okay expiring in 2020 string contains slash 20 so gpt was smart enough to know that uh, the expiry date column will be shown in this way so it picked up that okay there will be a month and after month there will be a slash so you need to figure out how many times 20 appears after the slash and count those so gpt was smart enough to do that and i did not have to create a new column or provided more instructions let's see if it picks up correctly and yes it did and we got a number of 988 which is the number of cards expiring in a specific year now we can change this to 24 and see if the answer changes so yes this works perfectly fine and the last question we're going to answer is what are the top five most popular email providers so now there is an email column in the data set we want to figure out what are the most popular email providers and there are a couple of different options here so what is gpt going to do it's probably going to write a similar function as it did for the expiry date it's going to figure out where the at occurs and then take out whatever is after the at and then make a count of all the times all the different values it gets for after the at the rate character in this data set so let's see how it exactly goes what are the top five most popular email providers for example this 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 it it's going to use string dot extract function to extract the email domain followed by value underscore count function to count the occurrences of each domain and finally the head function to get the top five results so first it's going to search the email column and extract anything that comes after the at in this column and then make a count of it So it goes into the email column, finds out whatever is after the at, and then find the, num the count of the times that specific value occurs in the data set. It stores as email providers, and now we want to see the top five ones. So that's what it will show me next. I want to break this down and run this first because I think GPT might make a mistake here. Actually, let's run this first and then see what the answer is, and then I can check it. So now it says Hotmail is 1638 yahoo is 1616 gmail is 1605 so it looks pretty accurate let's see if we break this down how would the function change and let's call this separately to see what is gpt doing here okay so when it created this string it created it it sorted it from the highest value to the lowest value my fear was that what if weight-gardener.com was the first value and hotmail was somewhere in the middle so then if you call df.head on this function it won't be sorted accurately so i can still ask gpt to explain me how is this function sorted out is this function sorted by count if yes how yes the value underscore found from here returns the sorted series okay so this is what happened so value underscore count when you call this function it will always create a sorted series by default that's why my fare was wrong it is going to give you the top five when you call this function because value underscore count is already storing the values based on their frequency of occurrence and that's what it's explaining here what this code does if you want to get into more details into string dot extract this is a panda string method that extracts a part of the text based on a regular expression pattern in this case so the pattern is at comma slash s plus which matches any non white space character and that come after the symbol at so basically it's going to find anything that comes after that and make sure that it's not non-white space so there is something there and the parenthesis 
captures the matched non white space characters which represent the email domain. So, in this way, we were able to manipulate the data set and figure out exactly what we were looking for, something that could have taken a lot more time for us in Excel versus what we did now. The last thing that I want to do is I want to see what happens if I pass all of them together. Okay, I want you to write me a script that gets me the answer to all the following questions on the data set. Okay, let's switch to 3.5 and I it will be able to do the job too. And now we just wrote code at an expansion really fast pace from 1 to 15 it has answered all the questions let's just copy this and run it and see where it takes us incomplete print sorry I copied it okay so GPT did not write the entire code the above code is incomplete for line for question 15 so I guess it ran out of space GPT does that and you have to write continue so now we have 15 so I'm just going to take 15 and replace 15 here by the new code it gave me and now let's see what do we get so we have all our answers here the top 10 rows of the data set are these these were the bottom 10 rows I guess yeah the last 10 rows of the data set, this is our answer to question two. And then these are the data types for all the columns. These are the record of the null values. The number of rows and columns are 10,000 by 14. Highest price is 99, lowest price is zero. Average price is around 50, 1097 French speaking. Engineers are 984. Amy Miller at moralist-harrison is the IP address, is the email associated with this IP address. People with MasterCard provider and made a purchase above 50 or 405. Email of the person with credit card number. This is BBBerry. Berry at right.net. There's a 50 50 mix of AM versus PM transactions. The number of credit cards expiring in 2022 is 988. And these are my top five emails that are being used for purchases. So this is the power of GPT. It wrote, it went through all the answers right away and gave me the code that I was looking for. It understood the task really well, exactly the way I wanted it to. So this is what I wanted to show you in this project. Um, I knew that it can answer all the 15 questions in one go, but I did intentionally broke it down one by one to explain you what's happening. And this is what prompt engineering is about. Instead of writing code, you need to understand the data set and come up with a list of questions that you want GPT to answer for you. And once you have that list of questions, specific questions that you can push into GPT and get the code out, that's all you need to do now. So hopefully this was useful for you and I'll see you in the next project. Welcome to the next project and in this project we'll explore a data set of San Francisco salaries. Let's quickly review the data set to see what is available in this data set. So if I go to details, I can see the columns here and it contains ID, employee name, job title, base pay, overtime, other pay, benefits, total pay, and the year of that salary. So this is the data set we're going to work with and we're trying to figure out different things such as how has the pay changed for different roles over time and so on and so forth. So let's start and I will start by first asking GPT to load the data set from a specific location. So let's start with the priming prompt stating that you are an expert in Python, specifically in pandas and matplotlib library. We are going to work with a data set of SF salaries, the exact name of the data set is 
let me get the exact name salaries in square brackets and it is located in the following location on my Mac and the location is desktop slash projects let me quickly check yes projects let me write dot csv here as well close brackets please import the data set in jupyter notebook so now i go to my jupyter notebook i'll create a new notebook for python 3 kernel i will name this notebook sf underscore actually no caps underscore salaries rename and now let's start working on this specific data set so i copy pasted the code i don't think i need this and i have my data set loaded now let's check out the columns quickly without an s probably okay so the data set is called salaries underscore df i assumed it's going to call it and an s here okay id employee name job title base pay overtime other pay benefits total pay total pay benefits year notes agency and so on and so forth so these are all the columns i see there are a lot of nan values and a lot of different columns we might have to get rid of them or we might get rid of some of the columns let's try and figure these things out so let's look at the list of questions that we have for this specific data set to work with display the top 10 rows of the data set we did that before too. check the last 10 rows of the data set find the shape of our data set get information about our data set like total number of rows total number of columns data types of each column and memory requirement <coughs> sorry let me just run the first four prompts together and get the basic analysis of the data that we're working with let's copy the code now we know what gpt is doing and we have a basic idea so we don't need to go over the code <coughs> so now it says file not found at no such file or directory okay so we don't want you to read it again we already have it saved okay so first thing it gave me the top 10 rows actually i'm just going to make it this same thing here because it's visually better that way <coughs> so the data set shape is okay it missed those commands because there were multiple print here so i have to include them so these are my top 10 rows okay these are my bottom 10 rows it goes up to fourteen thousand. actually one two three hundred one hundred and forty eight thousand six hundred and fifty three rows so 654 total rows in the data set because it starts with a zero data shape okay so this is the number of rows and there are 13 columns in the data set now let's look at the column type so id is integer employees up to benefits are all object total pay is float total pay benefits is float here is integer notes is float agency and status are this okay so now i'm going to feed this data into gpt so that gp under understands what are the different types of uh, data types of different columns please understand this and remember it for further analysis okay done let's move forward check null values in the data set so it's going to use is null dot sum so this data set actually has some null values so base pay has 600 null values a lot 36,000 in benefits these three columns I don't really need them 
because they don't give me any specific information that I'm looking for. We can further check this out by looking at the columns here. So agency column only has San Francisco in it in all rows and the status and notes column are mostly blank for the most part in the data set. So I am going to remove these three columns for further analysis. So let's go back. Let's tell GPT remove these three columns from my data set. Remove these three columns from the data frame. They are not required for further analysis. So now it's going to drop these three columns from our final data set. So it's going to use the df.draw function and apply it on these three columns and access is equal to one. So now let's see our resulting data frame once again to make sure everything is right. Why is it giving me an error? It's saying not found in access. Okay, because it ran the same command again. They're already been removed. So, okay, so if I go back and run the code from beginning, then everything will be okay. And then if I call the data set, now you see those three columns have been removed. Okay, what do we do next? So we have done this much so far. Now drop ID notes and agency columns. We did this, we dropped these three columns get overall statistics of my data frame. Let's see how GPT uses the describe function probably to describe the data set. So now it's saying df.describe. Okay, so the count of ID, this is the count of each one. This is the mean value. So mean salary is 74,000. Mean num benefits are 93,000 that's a lot of total total pay and benefit total pay benefit so basically what the first thing you need to understand is that describe column will only take into account the columns which are either integer or float and it will not apply anything to the objects the columns which have strings in them so for instance job title column is not here because it's a string it's an object so gpt uh, so the code is not providing any descriptive statistics on this column statistics only apply to the number columns so now our total pay is so our mean pay is around 74000 total pay with benefits is 93000 and our mean year is 2012 so the data set from a couple of different years so the average that comes out to be for the years is around 2012 it tells us about the standard deviation minimum value and different percentiles and the maximum salary that we have in the data set is 150,000 almost. No, sorry, this is ID. So this is the maximum salary. It's almost half a million with and without benefits. Okay, so we have the basic statistics on our data set now. Now let's do some basic tasks such as figuring out, find the occurrence of the employee name. So let's figure out what are the top five employee names in the data set. So let's see if it knows which column to go to. It went to the column. So it's so what GPT is doing is it's building up on the same script. It keeps copying the same script. And then from here is what I asked for. So now I can give it another, a modify my prompt and say, uh, only write this code that I can run in the next Jupyter cell. And Hopefully this will help GPT understand. It still didn't understood that part. So I'm going to copy this. I don't want you to write this part of the code again. Let's see if this does a better job. Okay, so now I've finally gotten rid of this 
script for it that it was keep continuously copy pasting in further prompts and this is i guess one of the differences between 3 and 3.5 and 4 4 is a lot better in critical reasoning so it understands the job way better than 4 than 3.5 so these are Kevin Lee, Stephen Lee, William Wong, Richard Lee, John Chan. So these are the counts of the five most popular names in the San Francisco data set. Now let's find the number of unique job titles in the data set. And let's see if we can use that for further analysis. This is going to be an interesting one. Okay, so now GPT forgot again and it started again from the beginning. So keep these things in mind as you're working with it. It's just a tool to help you out. It won't get the job done right every time. So make sure you understand what it's doing. Okay, so there are number of unique job titles are 2159. Okay, so there are like 21, 2150. Total number of job titles that contain captain. Okay, sure. That's an easy one. We can run this too. And let's see how many are captains. So I just need the last two rows. The rest of it has already been there. 400 have the job title captain in their name. Interesting. Let's go back, display all the employees in the fire department, find the max minimum and average pay. You understand these concepts pretty well now. So you would be able to run these by your own. I'm going to skip them for now. Replace not provided in the employee name column to NAN. Okay. So let's first find out how many count of not provided in employee name column. Let's see how many employee names are actually missing first before we start replacing them, right? So that's what I'm doing here. So now I'll copy this part of the code and paste it here. So there are four columns four rows in which the name of the employee is not provided okay now gpt made a big mistake here the column that it's going through is benefits instead of employee name so here we said count of not provided in employee name column it said you asked of the count of not provided in the employee name column but i think you might have meant to ask for not provided in the some other columns in the employee name column is unlikely to have such values. Assuming that you meant to ask for the count of not provided in a different column, you can use value underscore counts and he wrote the function on benefit. So it completely changed the task that we were asking for. So now let's change it. Let's go and figure out if employee name column actually exists if we are right in our approach. So if we double check, there is a column called employee name. So we are right. So let's tweak this prompt. And let's say count of not provided. In column equal to. When column equal to not provided. So now it's doing it on base. So first it did the same thing using benefits column. And then now it's doing the same thing using the base pay column. So GPT is pretty confident that this data set, the column employee name does not contain any not provided values. That's why it keeps doing that. That's its thinking behind it. What I'll do is I'll manually update the benefits column to employee name here in the code to get what we're looking for. So yeah, employee name has zero values of not provided that's true so gpt that's why gpt did what it was doing i guess okay now what do we want to do next let's figure out here so drop the rows that have five missing values i am going to slightly change it um, to let's find out the rows where we have missing values for employee name job title total pay and year why these columns so the next step that I'm going to do is try and figure out how the total pay has changed over years for different job titles. 
So we'll figure out what are the top five job titles in this data set and then plot a data series of their total pay against time. So what was the pay for let's say general manager, metropolitan transit and authority in 2011, 2010, whatever the point sets we have and see if we can plot them. So given that's my idea, I want to make sure my job title column, my total pay and my year column at least are don't have missing values and I've added employee name on top of it too. So now I gave it the prompt saying find rows with missing values in employee name, job title, total pay and year columns and it wrote the code for me. So let's copy this and let's go run this. So this is where I ran it. No, no, I haven't run it yet. Okay. So the, now it's giving me the columns, find the rows with missing values in these four columns. So it gave me the rows, but that's not what we're looking for. What we want is, I want count of rows that are null based on the above conditions. Be specific, just write relevant code, not the whole script. So I'm trying to get away with it again, and I don't want it to write this part of the code over and over again. So I can directly copy it. That's why I tried giving it the same instruction again, and this time, 3.5 was able to understand what I'm saying and I want the count of rows that are null based on the above condition. So what are the above conditions? These four columns employee name, job title, total pay and year should not be empty. So let's copy this part of the code and run, run it and now I, we will get a number of rows. So there are two rows where this is the case. Delete those two rows. Again, it's writing the whole script, but number was after dropping one eight four six five two. So now it's six five two. It was six five four. The count of total number of rows I can check on any column. It's going to be six five four, and now it's six five two. So we have dropped two rows from the data set because there was two here. Okay, now let's check. Now let's drop rows where job title or year or total pay are empty. So now I'm saying I want to drop all the rows with their, either one of these conditions are true. First with that all four of them needs to be true. Now I specified these three because these are the three columns that I'm going to use to make my plots. If there are missing values in these that will destroy my results. So I want to make sure if a total pay is missing or a year for the total pay is missing or a specific job title is empty, I want these rows to be removed. I don't want to use them for my visualization purposes. So sure, you can drop these rows, columns, missing values from the data frame by drop in a method with the subset parameter. So now it gave it a subset of these three and this code will drop the missing values in these three or and make the important point to note here is that this is or and not and to make sure that we're not removing where all three are empty, but either one of them are empty. So now we're left with 184652 same number of rows so that means there are no rows with empty values here here or here okay now what do we want to do next now let's start plotting things now before we do that let's figure out what are the top five job titles so that we can plot them what are the top five job titles in the data set so top underscore job underscore titles is value underscore counts on job title dot head okay transit operator spatial nurse registered nurse public svc eight public works police officer three Okay, so let's just try plotting these first before we go into other job titles. Okay, now let's one of the job title you provided is of transit operator. Let's start with this. 
transit operator can you plot a time series of the total pay for this job title using total pay and year column so now i'm saying like pick transit operator and for this using the columns of total pay in here can you plot a time series so time on the horizontal axis and total pay on the vertical axis so where does our code starts so here first it creates the variable filter the data frame to include transit operator job title then here it converts the total pay column to a numeric type to make sure it can be used as for visualization group the data frame by year and sum the total pay column for each year so now it creates a group by for each year and the total pay dot sum okay so now this is making a mistake here plot the time series why is this a mistake because now let's say there are 10 people who have the same job title it's summing up the jobs uh, their total pay and then displaying it as one value for that year what we want to see is we want to see the average salary for that specific job for that specific year instead of the sum so someone was paying seven so if let's say there were two people one person was paid 70 and the other person was paid let's say 80 so 70 plus 80 now gpt will show 150 for that value but that's not what we want to see we want to see a value of 75 because that 75 is the average pay for that profession so let's up modify our prompt of average total pay for this job title using total pay near columns <laughs> so again it created the transit operator data frame first and then now instead of sum it's using mean so if i go back here you will see the first function here was sum and now it has changed it to mean for some uh, it now it's going to take the yearly average of total pay and then it plots it no plt is defined and that is because actually let's cast gpt so that you know how to debug it when you run into these errors so it's saying this because the library is missing it looks like there is a name error race for plt this occurs when the plt module has not been imported it's because this line is missing in our code to resolve this error you need to import matplotlib here is the modified code so it wrote the same code again probably we missed it because we were just copying the new code and not the old one so if i add this line back my code will work and it plotted the salary okay now this is too jumbled up i can't see anything that's happening let's look at the data set for a second to understand how this column is so this is one year okay give me a count of year column okay so there are only one two three four values why is it jumbling up so much and creating decimals okay so this is a visualization question i guess now so first let's ask it to let's print this data frame let me do it here okay so 2014 was 6 1 Three sixty-seven and then 65 65 67 and 2014 it dropped and here it's saying 66 67 and then 2014 it dropped to 613 okay it's also because of the scale so this is all in 60,000 right so that's why it looks odd it's not a significant drop it just went from 65,000 to 62,000 let's make 
the graph visually appealing adjust y label y and x label x and y ticks and title and legend so i'm just going to copy the new code which is for the plot and replace the existing code for the plot which is where plot a time series comment starts so now it add a legend for average total pay average total pay year 20 so now you see it is a much more improved graph versus the previous one where the x-axis was hardly visible and that's because of it i told it to update the labels and the ticks and ticks are these values that show up on each axis so now you can see it went from 63,000 to almost 68 and then back to 62. Okay. Can we add the top five job titles on the graph? So I asked it for the top five job titles on the graph now and it updated the code. How did it update the code? Let's ask GPT. This code will first find the five job titles in salary.df data frame by using value underscore counts method on the job title column. Okay, so it's saying job title column value salary underscore df, and then it goes through deleting these three top job titles. So it goes into salary underscore df based on the job title column, find value underscore counts and header and five. So this data frame now with header five is the top five job titles. Now it goes through each one and finds their salaries. I guess next we filter the salaries data frame from the top five job titles using Boolean indexing and store the results in top jobs DF. Okay, so now it figures out if if anything in the total data frame corresponds to that job title. And the Boolean answer is yes on checking of the two columns in each data frame. It gives a true, and if it's a true, it gets saved into a new data frame called top jobs underscore DF. We then group top jobs underscore df. Let's see where this happens first. Top jobs underscore df. So here you go. So now what it's doing is it's going to salary underscore df and filtering out everything when this boolean is true. And what is this boolean? It's checking if top job title is in where in job title column of salary df. If the answer of this is true, then give me the corresponding set of values from the salaries underscore df data frame which is the big data set with all the data and when this happens store it into a new data frame called top jobs underscore df so now this data frame will have all the robes based on the top jobs from our previous variable what does it do next where we then group top jobs underscore df and translate operator df data frames by year Calculate the average total pay for each using the mean method. Okay, so now if for some reason it went through and calculated the transit operator DF separately for this job title based on the previous instructions, I guess, that we have provided, and then it calculates the top job averages average pay, and it does that by grouping by year and job title and then finding the mean of the total pay column, and then does the same thing separately for the transit operator average pay because that prob probably because of the previous prompt we don't really need this and then it goes through a for loop to add the different lines on the plot one for each job title and that's what it probably does here finally plot a time series of the average total pay for transit operator job title and top five job titles by year using the plot method we use for the loop to plot the average total pay for each job title. We also customize X and Y axis labels and titles. Adjust the tick labels and add a legend to the plot. This code will create a plot of the average total pay for the transit operator job title and the five top job titles. Okay. So let's copy everything from here. And run it in the next cell. And now it's saying notes agency not found in next apps. Okay, so I don't need to add this because we've already done this. So that's why it's giving an error that these columns does not exist. How do I delete them? Because here we were asking it to delete them by using this drop command. 
okay so we have this now this legend is on the chart that doesn't look really nice but one two three four five okay so now we see that what is purple police officer pay slightly decreased the green is not really visible legend should be outside the graph We use the lock parameter to set the location of the legend to the center left of the plot and the PV box anchored parameter to move the legend outside the plot to the right. Specifies the coordinates of the legend's box anchor point relative to the plot where 0, 0 is the left corner, 1, 1 is the upper right corner and the font size parameter is set to OK. So let's try add this line for the legend and see what it does. I am not really sure about what this function is of BVX anchor within matplotlib but i can play around with it just because i have a basic idea okay so it took it outside what happens if i do one it goes up and if i do zero this would go down okay so let's keep it in the middle like gpt suggested we should do okay now let's find all columns where job title contains the word software engineer case insensitive okay so now it's going to go through job title and find where the string contains software engineer and case is insensitive so we don't know what that will be and then it gives me the title of the jobs that are software engineer it's empty empty data frame okay how about engineer only actually let's do data I need to update this to data as well. It's columns where job title contains the word data. Three columns only. Okay. Um, I don't want columns. Want columns. Just the count. So let's copy this again. zero that part we know i'm going to remove this two and this two i just want to see the number zero okay what about engineers four seven five one okay let's use the word engineer instead and add it to the plot make sure to adjust y label and ticks accordingly because now what if engineer salary is way higher or way lower than the other ones i want it to be mindful of y-axis and make sure it's adjusted accordingly okay this code will create a new data frame engineer df that contains only the rows for salaries underscore df where the job title column contains word engineer case insensitive and then same process and adds one more okay so where does it do that starts doing that here so let me just copy all of it and paste it here so now this is only plotting engineer we don't want to do that well let's just check what the salary is this is one two three four five six yeah so it's hundred thousand hundred thousand is somewhere here engineers get paid less than purple and green police officer and registered nurse that's pretty interesting add engineer add engineer to the same graph of top five
I'm going to copy all of it from here. Actually, let's just copy code, paste it here, and let me remove the top three rows. Agency again, same issue. I don't need this code, I can remove this. Okay, so now for engineer, we have some pay available from before 2012 as well, which is not marked. 2011 data point is here because this graph was not optimized to create 2011, that's why it skipped it. We can adjust this if we want. So now you see engineer is somewhere here uh, below registered nurse and police officer. The rest are below the engineer. So in this way, I in this lecture, I just wanted to show you how to play around with the data set using chat GPT and make exploratory analysis on the data. I intentionally recorded this live while doing it, uh, running the prompt so that if I run into errors and if I'm debugging, I can show you that process to one how I figure out um, if GPT is right or if I run into errors, how do I best correct them. It's important to have a basic understanding of what GPT is doing. You would have noticed that for, for the most part, whenever I'm copying code from GPT, I try and skim through the explanation that it provided for the code. So to make sure that the logic that I need to be written is exactly what I'm looking for. The code it can tweak around with and use different syntax, but the logic part I always try and make sure. Just like it made a mistake in giving us the wrong column, if we didn't read it right, we would have skipped it. So please make sure as you're working along, or you're working on your own projects, you always understand what it's trying to do. Ask it a couple of further prompts uh, to help you explain it more. You can say that, explain it to me like a five-year-old if, if it's really difficult concept and you're, you can't grasp it, so that it knows what you're talking about and it starts explaining it to you. Once you understand this, then copying code is very easy and you will be able to validate yourself by running small tests here and there. So hope you enjoyed this. See you in the next project. Congratulations, you have made it to the end of the course. I understand going through an eight hour course specifically related to coding requires a lot of effort and commitment. And you have shown that by going through this entire course. Um, if you have any questions or is there something in the course that you don't understand, feel free to message me and I will try my best to take out town to help you out and answer any questions you have. Secondly, uh, if you will see in this resource section that I've added another resource of 2000 plus prompts, which are mostly related to code, uh, to text and image generation. But I thought it will be a nice resource to add, which I have in my other course. So you'll find that guide on 2000 prompts attached here as a PDF. If that is something you're interested in, just something bonus that you might be might like. Lastly, if you enjoyed this course, if you like this course, uh, if it was helpful for you, I would really appreciate if you can write me a review and rate my course. That would really help me understand if there was missing in, missing in the course that I need to add or if this proved to be beneficial and I need to create more similar courses as I move forward in my journey as a Udemy instructor. So once again, congratulations on ending the course and thank you so much for giving me so much of your time and attention on taking my course. If you have any suggestions or improvement, I'm always open for and flexible for improving the course. If you want some specific projects you want me to cover, shoot me a message. I will try my best to accommodate your request. Thank you.